The raiders continued to struggle desperately to escape as they left the tunnel behind and pushed on through the rain toward Catusa and Ringgold. They were low on fuel with the Texas close behind. We were hot on them, Murphy would recall, and though destruction of any bridges now seemed impossible, they had not given up hope of saving themselves. After all, they were now within thirty curving railroad miles of Chattanooga, even closer as the crow flies, and they expected that General Mitchell was drawing close to the mountain city with his division as well. They did not know that, whatever now happened in their duel with the locomotive behind them, their ultimate failure was now assured. For the young lad, Ed Henderson, bending over the telegraph key at Dalton, had managed to get Fuller's message through to Chattanooga just before the Yankees cut the wires. The telegraph read, Dalton, Georgia, 12 April, 1862, to General Danville Ledbetter, commander at Chattanooga. My train was captured this a.m. at Big Shanty, evidently by Federal soldiers in disguise. They are making rapidly for Chattanooga, possibly with the idea of burning the railroad bridges in their rear. If I do not capture them in the meantime, see that they do not pass Chattanooga. William A. Fuller. For Brigadier General Ledbetter, this jarring missive, sent by some Georgia ticket-taker he had never heard of, who seemed to be issuing orders, no less, was yet another piece of bad news in what had been a terrible past couple of days. The apostate northerner had enjoyed a relatively uneventful winter in comfortable quarters in Chattanooga, and the East Tennessee insurgency had been for the most part quiet, chastened, he believed, by his enforcement of hard-handed justice in the region and his diligent safeguarding of the railroads. He spent January and February happily laying out fortifications and defenses, improving railroad security and interrogating the occasional prisoner, with the war seemingly far away to the north and the west. On February 28, 1862, he had been promoted to brigadier general, continuing a rapid advance up the military ladder. On the November night, when David Fry and his men burned the East Tennessee bridges, Ledbetter was still an undistinguished major. Just three and a half months later, his prospects seemed to shine as bright as the newly pinned gold stars that adorned his collar. Then came spring, and with it crisis seemed to be blooming in all directions. Chattanooga had been in a panic since early the day before, April 11th, when word came from the West that a large Union force under General Mitchell had taken Huntsville in a surprise advance and were now coming east along the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. The junction town was in an uproar, citizens fleeing their homes while the officers of the overmatched Confederate forces tried to keep their composure as they scrambled to organize a defense and begged the powers that be for reinforcements. And now this, a threat from the South as well. The news was heralded over town, quick as thought, according to a newspaper correspondent, that the Yanks had possession of the road, that all the bridges between here and Dalton were burned that Cleveland, Tennessee had fallen into the hands of the enemy, and that they were in a few miles of Chattanooga. Bedlam ensued in the mountain city. Tongue planted in cheek, the reporter continued, there was no flag of truce sent out, no bacon burned, nor any precipitous stampeding, but nothing else was wanting to make the scene sublimely ridiculous. Some men cursed, others laughed. Some grew pale, others discovered themselves subject to an infinitude of bodily distempers. Some became quite attentive to their sick families, while others, being slightly under the influence of spirits more ardent than their own, gallantly seized defensive weapons and assisted upon marching against the foe. General Ledbetter, who was himself regularly accused of everything from drunkenness to cowardice, and who would be saddled with charges of both in the Atlanta papers before the month was out, immediately dispatched a company of soldiers under the temporary command of a major butler to meet the approaching Yankees. The Moccasin Rangers, as they were called, hastily assembled at the depot, loaded up on four or five platform cars, and sallied forth down the W&A to meet the advancing Blue Horde. The local cavalry was denied a part in the chase, perhaps due to the foul weather, the papers would also report, rather mockingly, that a cavalry company was also ordered out, but upon arriving at a small creek a few miles from town, which looked a little muddy, they were ordered back and exhorted to resign whatever glory might be won in the coming conflict to the infantry which had just departed in the train. Eleven miles south of Chattanooga, 
In a shallow cut past the station at Chickamauga, the Confederate soldiers disembarked from their flat cars, tore up the iron rails, and took a position on the banks on each side of the track. They sent a flagman ahead and hunkered down in the rain to wait, hoping to bag the entire platoon of Yankees and their train along with them. Pittenger would later attribute both extensive preparations and evil intentions to Ledbetter's gray blocking force. He imagined them felling trees across the track and preparing artillery emplacements to meet the approaching raiders, claiming their orders were for them to make a general massacre, not to spare a single man. This unsupported charge hardly seems true given the ultimate outcome, but in any event the railroad ahead of the northbound raiders was now hopelessly blocked. The stolen train would never make it to the Market Street crossing in Chattanooga. Our situation was becoming more unpleasant every moment, Alf Wilson later wrote, with a considerable degree of understatement. The general's thinning smoke did indeed tell the tale. The raiders were by now almost out of wood to feed the furnace. The water in the tank was low, the oil cans all but empty, the engineers, firemen, and brakemen all battling exhaustion. Passing the little station at Tunnel Hill with their pursuers in plain sight behind them, the boxcar riders found they had no more cross ties to throw out onto the track behind them. Front center in the cab, the needle on the steam gauge was falling rapidly. Desperate to rally their flagging engine, the raiders now stuffed anything remotely combustible into the firebox, along with the last scraps and splinters of wood. The oil cans went in, as did Andrews's hat and saddlebags, along with a number of pages of unidentified and presumably secret papers of some sort. Still hopeful that one of the small bridges up ahead could be ignited, Andrews ordered that the last boxcar be set afire, but the rain by now was falling in buckets, and there was little more than bark and splinters in the tender. The rain blew in the open end of the car, and it took careful nursing and a number of coals from the firebox to get a flame going at all. The car itself would not catch, and the would-be fire, smoldering and sputtering on the floorboards, ultimately served only to smoke the sixteen Federal soldiers out of the box car and up onto the tender, which by now had plenty of room to accommodate them. The train, no longer careening along at breakneck speed, limped four miles to and past the town of Catoosa, and then managed another four miles hence to Ringgold, a mountain crossroads just beyond where the road curled to the west through the thousand-foot-wide gap between Taylor's Ridge and White Oak Mountain. But it was increasingly clear that time was running out. The general was failing, chuffing ever slower despite her minimal load of an almost empty tender and a single freight car that carried no freight. She was shaken loose in every joint, at least she seemed so. The brass on her journals and boxes was melted by the heat, her great steel tires almost red-hot, while she smoked and sizzled at every joint, Alf Wilson remembered. I could liken her condition to nothing else than the last struggles of a faithful horse whose heartless master has driven and lashed him until he is gasping for breath and literally dying in the harness. Andrews then called a council of war. If a hasty discussion among a civilian and three privates could qualify as such, among the four men on the engine— Knight, Brown, Wilson, and himself, and discussed the course they should follow. They quickly concluded that the action that would give them best chance of survival was to separate, flee into the countryside, and head for the Federal lines, each man on his own. To try to escape as a group, or to fight it out at this late stage, seemed mere folly. With the great number of rebel troops in the front and in our rear, and in fact on all sides of us, as Wilson put it, the twenty Yankees at this point would have been far from formidable as an organized military unit. Exhausted, waterlogged, lacking any military leader, trapped front and rear in rugged territory and armed with only pocket pistols, Andrews instructed the entire party, scatter in small parties and escape the best way you can. Bill Pittenger would later criticize this decision. Andrew's presence of mind for a time seemed to desert him, he said, but this was to be sure more a result of the young corporal's fear of abandonment than an objective consideration of the circumstances. The old Ringgold depot still stands today. Its original fourteen-inch stacked sandstone walls shored up here and there by limestone blocks. The station was constructed in 1849 
and has been in continuous use on the road since May 9, 1850, the day the first train ran over the entire length of the W and A. Though the building suffered considerable damage from artillery fire from Major General Joseph Hooker's guns at the Battle of Ringgold in November 1863, a stern General U.S. Grant would confer with Hooker just behind the depot the morning of the battle. The general rattled past the long, low roof of the depot and pulled around a broad curve before encountering a relentless upgrade, the woods again thickening on either side as the town disappeared behind. The wheezing engine slowed perceptibly as it came into the straightaway and started up the hill. Her five-foot drivers spun slower and slower until it was clear that there was no way she would ever reach the crest. Andrews gave his final command. "'Jump off and scatter!' he cried. "'Every man for himself!' Notwithstanding the spies earlier, alleged, promised to Pittenger that the raiders would come through in a body or die together, when the moment arrived, the twenty men leapt off the train in ones and twos and skedaddled in all directions. They swung off one by one from the steps of the general and from the car, in the midst of foes, their plans thwarted, efforts failed, and dangers just begun, a reporter later wrote of the scene. The sight of the thieves dropping off of the ragged, smoking train ahead would create an indelible memory for Anthony Murphy, who would write decades later, The impression left on my mind then is such that I imagine I can now see them as they flee for safety, not knowing which way to go. Knight and Brown, the engineers, were the last two men off, the latter pulling the reverse lever in hopes of driving the engine back down the hill and colliding it into the Texas, which was following cautiously some two or three hundred yards behind. This final attempt at railroad havoc came to naught. The lethargic general lacked the steam to undertake such a rush even downhill. Peter Bracken, who had been keeping a respectable distance as the locomotive ahead lost momentum plainly on its last legs, simply reversed his engine too, that is, started it gently forward, since he had been driving backward all along, and gave room for the dying general to come to an uneventful halt behind him. The determined conductor William Fuller immediately jumped from the Texas and sprinted off into the woods after the raiders, rusty shotgun in hand. We had saved the bridges and preserved the railroad, recaptured our engine, and now I wanted the raiders, he recalled. Minutes later, the Catoosa arrived, carrying Captain Whitsitt's squad of Confederate soldiers who likewise disappeared into the trees. As it happened, Whitsitt's infantrymen ultimately contributed little to the manhunt. They soon found themselves stalled by a high ridge nearby and then sidetracked altogether as one soldier accidentally discharged his musket, wounding one of his comrades. As the foreman of machine power for the state road, Murphy, for now, was more interested in checking on the stolen engine. He trotted a few steps up the hill and swung aboard the general. There was no wood in the engine's furnace and none in the tender behind, though there was still some water in the tank. On the footboard, Murphy found the switch keys Andrews had taken from Kingston fifty-eight miles and several hours ago. The makeshift red flag hung damp and limp on its staff up front on the pilot. Apart from that, there was nothing unusual, nothing damaged or broken, Despite being pushed to her mechanical limits, the hissing locomotive seemed to be all right, as Murphy put it, completely unharmed except for a single truck brass that had overheated for want of oil. Those damned Yankees, one among the railroaders reportedly said, they can run an engine as good as any of us. The two shining locomotives had come to a stop a short distance apart, standing in the drizzle in a dense thicket of pine and cedar trees. In his report made to the road's superintendent in the days that followed, Murphy would record the spot as about a half-mile beyond milepost 116, some two miles north of Ringgold. A granite marker stands at the site today. James Andrews and his men had run the general nearly 89 miles from Big Shanty. Bill Fuller, Anthony Murphy, Peter Bracken, and the crew of the Texas had chased her down over the past 48 miles, every inch of it running backward. The Western and Atlantic railroaders coupled the Texas to the General and, running forward now, began to tow her back down the line toward Ringgold. It was shortly after one o'clock in the afternoon, a little more than six hours after the theft at Big Shanty. The great locomotive chase was over. The raiders' sorry luck that day was even worse than they knew. 
Andrews's one-day postponement of the raid had put the action over to Saturday, and that meant it was muster day in the nearby town of Ringgold and other communities across the state. Throughout the countryside of Cherokee, Georgia, men and boys left their farms and homesteads and hiked in the morning mist to the nearest villages and towns, often with wives, children, or siblings tagging along to visit the general store or to hear the latest gossip or news of the war. Dozens of would-be recruits headed to town to enlist, while home guardsmen met on village greens and courthouse squares to stumble their way through the unfamiliar manual of drill. Some plodded in on damp, sullen horses, most of these short-legged sorrels built for hauling and plowing, not for cavalry charges. Most men carried whatever sort of firearm they owned. All of these homespun rebels, men and boys, young and old, had one thing in common. They wanted to shoot some Yankees. Word soon arrived in Ringgold from the engineer of one of the strangely shortened trains that had just passed by that some Yankee fugitive spies were on the loose, scattered in the woods just to the north of town. One can imagine this exciting news was greeted with whatever early form of the rebel yell may have existed in the North Georgia mountains at that time. Then was organized the most stupendous manhunt that ever took place in the South, Pittenger later reported, probably fairly accurately. The showers did nothing to extinguish the alarming news, which spread through the countryside like a wind-blown brush fire. The dirt roads and footpaths were soon filled with men on horseback and afoot, and the forest soon rang with the yelping of dogs and the whoops and yells of the locals. Crossroads, rivers, and ferries were guarded by homespun cavalry made from scratch. Rumors of sinister plots and huge rewards swept through the populace. Not everyone was sure who they were looking for or why, but that seemed to matter very little to the men beating the bushes and straining at the leashes of their barking hounds. The only partially known object of the expedition imparted a tone of romantic exaggeration to it, Pittenger wrote, and made the people doubly anxious to solve the mystery. Jump off and scatter, Andrews had said, and scatter they did, disappearing in small groups into the dense thicket of pine trees east and west of the railroad. The boys lit out like a flock of quail, Knight remembered. Daniel Allen Dorsey, William Bensinger, Robert Buffum and George Wilson sprinted into the woods to the right of the failing engine, heading off at a rapid rate in a direction they thought to be northeast. Poor Buffum was forced to relinquish two of his prized possessions at the outset. First, he had not had time to retrieve his whiskey bottle, heretofore a constant companion, from the smoking boxcar, and second, he soon shed his fine gray Confederate overcoat. Throwing his arms back and literally running out of it, as his friend Dorsey would recall, as the four scuffed their way through the sodden carpet of pine straw and wet leaves, they encountered a number of women and children who had fled their homes in alarm at the exaggerated reports of an enemy invasion. The frightened locals hid in the woods and screamed to the passing raiders, Run for God's sake! The country's alive with Yankees! The dim afternoon soon faded into darkness, and the quartet fled without direction. We simply wandered, Dorsey admitted. The train engineers Knight and Brown, along with John Scott, Elihu Mason, and William Reddick, ran exactly the opposite way, to the southwest toward the middle branch of Chickamauga Creek. They soon reached the stream, which they would understandably recall as a river, bank full from the days of rain. Looking left and right for a place to cross, they saw no ford more favorable than where they stood. So they plunged in, holding their revolvers over their heads to keep their powder dry and expecting a shot any minute from the rear. They made it across, no worse for wear and not that much wetter than they had been already, and hid themselves in the brush just on the opposite bank. A breathless, bumbling posse soon came up on the opposite side, but were distracted by the sight of other fugitives from the Federal Party farther up the river, and they headed off that way instead. We lay where we first hid till dark, Knight remembered, and to say it was dark would not express it. Other groups of raiders plunged elsewhere through the rugged terrain, their clothes soon soaked from the rain and their faces striped by low-slung green branches. William Campbell, Samuel Slavens, and Perry Shadrach, none of whom were built for speed, may have been the first raiders captured despite being among the first men off the train. Tired, heavy and laden with wet clothes and boots, 
The three fled more like ducks than quail and were soon chased down by a group of men and dogs a short distance from the railroad tracks. The three Yankees at first tried giving the time-tested Kentucky story, though they were caught too close to the train for the tale to have any plausibility. Some would later suggest that the trio were spotted even as they jumped from the train and tracked down from that point. Thinking they might fare better as prisoners of war rather than civilian spies, the three then abandoned the cover story, identified themselves as Union soldiers, and gave their regiments, Campbell falsely claiming to be a member of Shadrach's Company K of the Second Ohio. The Flemingsburg alibi was thereby instantly transformed from a cover story into a brand that would serve to identify the raiders as they were captured. Not the slightest blame can be attached to these captives for revealing themselves, Pittenger wrote, but unfortunately they first told the old Kentucky story which had already served us so well that we forgot that it might wear out. After that, whenever a man was found hailing from Kentucky's Fleming County, he was set down as one of us and no denial would even be listened to. Campbell, Shadrach, and Slavins were placed in irons and chained together before being taken in the midst of a howling mob to Ringgold and then on to Dalton. Their companions were making better progress, though most, if not all, of the fleeing Yankees had no idea which way they were headed. Fast and blindly we traveled, not knowing where we were or what direction we took, Jacob Parrott remembered. The eighteen-year-old private found himself paired up with his friend Samuel Robertson, and the two young soldiers climbed a ridge and hid under a log until the next morning. Heading down the valley, hoping to find their way northward, the two foolishly made their way back to the railroad tracks, where they soon encountered a patrol of local citizens. We told the Flemingsburg Kentucky story, and they nodded at each other wisely, Parrot recalled. The two were taken to Ringgold for interrogation, which started out as merely harsh but soon turned brutal. Parrot was by appearance the younger and softer of the two, Nearly five foot ten, he weighed just one hundred forty pounds and was nattily dressed in a coat, vest, white broad-brimmed hat, and black bow tie. I was counted a dude of the party, he proudly said years later, though to the Georgia mountain men his attire may have suggested a northern big city fragility they thought they could easily crack. Whatever the reason, Parrot would be the only raider singled out by the rebel authorities for rough treatment. What followed is best described in Parrot's own words— given under oath in a deposition at the Judge Advocate General's office in Washington the following March. Question. Will you state the circumstances of your capture and the treatment you received? Answer. There was a man named Robinson of our party who was captured with me. We took to the woods after we left the train, and after a time we came out of the woods. When we came out on the railroad, there were four citizens there who saw us and took us. We were taken to Ringgold, where a company of Confederate soldiers was stationed. When we got into the hands of an officer, one of them took me out and questioned me, but I would not tell them anything. An officer and four soldiers took me out and stripped me and bent me over a stone and whipped me. They stood by me with two pistols and said if I resisted they would blow me through. I was whipped by an officer, a lieutenant, who was with the party and who had on the uniform. He gave me over one hundred lashes with a raw hide. He stopped three different times during the whipping, let me up, and asked me if I would tell, and when I refused to do so he would put me down and whip me again. He wanted me to tell who the engineer of the party was and all about the expedition, but I would not do it. I did not tell him anything about it. The engineer was one of our soldiers who was finally captured with the rest. Question. Were other persons present when you were flogged? Answer. Yes, sir. There was a crowd there. It was right by the side of the railroad, and the people there wanted to hang me. They got a rope and would have hung me, but for a colonel who came up. Question. Did you have a trial of any sort? Answer. No, sir. Question. Your companion was with you at the time? Answer. Yes, sir. Question. Why was he not whipped? Answer. I do not know. He told the regiment that he and I belonged to. I suppose, as I was the youngest, they thought that they could make me tell the most, but I would not tell them anything, not even the regiment I belonged to. Parrott's testimony squares with the accounts of his fellow Ohioans. Finally, it is said, Robertson sickened at the sight of his comrade's punishment, and seeing his back all gashed and bleeding, told his persecutors that they were United States soldiers, and that they were in the raid, Dorsey wrote. This put a stop to the whipping. 
Nothing in the past of the illiterate farm boy from Kenton, Ohio, would have suggested any native toughness or iron resolve, but to his enduring credit, Parrot was unbreakable under vicious flogging and threats of death by way of mob violence or pistol shot. The wounds he suffered from his lashing would cause him great pain during the incarceration still to come. Dorsey would describe Parrot's back as fearfully cut up and would remember pulling long scabs off of it himself at Parrot's own request. When asked if he intended to die there among strangers without letting them know who he was, Dorsey recalled, he said he intended, just before he was actually killed, when he thought the end was near, to tell them his name and where he belonged and let them do their worst. Parrot would carry the honor and the scars from his flogging for the rest of his life. I still bear the marks today, he reported in an article more than forty years later. Back down at Big Shanty, the two oversleepers, Martin Hawkins and John Reed Porter, nearly succeeded in talking themselves out of their predicament, as their comrades were racing up the W&A aboard the General, Hawkins and Porter had hiked through the drizzle up the six-mile road from Marietta and reported for enlistment at Camp MacDonald. A Confederate colonel, after a cursory interview, directed the two men to report to the commanding officer of the 9th Georgia Battalion. Being short-handed, one of the battalion's companies was hastily assembled and a vote taken as to whether or not the two strangers should be accepted into the ranks. The vote was unanimous in our favor, Porter recalled, and we, after giving fictitious names, were assigned to a certain mess for our suppers. After eating, the two Ohioans enthralled their new Confederate companions with stories of the cruelties then being inflicted by Yankee hirelings back home in Kentucky. Everything went all right with us, Porter wrote, until in some manner it leaked out among the rebels that the Yankee raiders, by mistake or accident, had left two of their party at Marietta. Suspicion immediately fell on the new enlistees, whose arrival did seem rather curious, come to think of it, given the commotion over across the way by Lacey's Hotel and the railroad tracks that morning. Hawkins and Porter were sent to headquarters and taken into a room, one at a time, for questioning. Porter identified himself as John Reed and soon found himself at odds with the presiding officer, a rebel colonel, he proceeded in his order of examination as best suited him, and I answered as best suited myself, just the reverse of what they desired, Porter recalled. The six officers became increasingly menacing and abusive as the interrogation continued. On various occasions during nearly four years of army life, I experienced some pretty close calls and run the gauntlet frequently, Porter later said, but this was a little the closest corner I ever got into. Mr. Reed, you stand there thrice damned, the colonel said in concluding the interview, announcing a guilty verdict, if not an ultimate sentence. You may make your peace with your God, but you never can with Jeff Davis, and we ought to hang you without further ceremony. The two men passed an uneasy night, first under guard at Big Shanty, and then in jail cell back down at Marietta, where they were taken by train. News of the captured spies soon spread through the town, and in a short time an infuriated mob gathered around the jail and demanded our release that they might wreak out their vengeance upon us, otherwise they would burn the jail, Porter recalled. The guard was increased and the night passed quietly, though it seemed to Hawkins and Porter that the morning would never come. Shortly after dawn on Sunday the would-be raiders were taken to the depot, handcuffed and padlocked together by way of a trace chain around their necks. This time... They succeeded in catching the morning train departing for Chattanooga. Bill Pittenger likewise came close to escaping by way of a bit of smooth talking and a stated intention to enlist. He had jumped from the left side of the still-moving train at Andrews's direction, tumbling along the railroad bed and coming up unheard except for some scratches from the tangled briars that inconveniently lined the road at that point. Riding himself and making for the tree line just to the west, he found himself in the exact situation he feared the most, on the run, by himself, in the enemy's country. I confess for a moment my heart sank within me, he later wrote. He soon came to a swollen stream, probably the Chickamauga, and fought his way through the current to the other side, where a hundred-foot ridge rose in a near-vertical wall. He climbed the steep hill hand over hand and collapsed at the top to rest and take stock. The former schoolteacher and newspaper correspondent was alone and exhausted. He had not eaten since the stop at Dalton the night before. 
His spectacles were streaked with water, the lenses fogged, and the landscape was a blur of greens and browns. The overcast sky blotted the sun completely, and he realized that he did not know whether he was fifteen miles or fifty from Chattanooga. And if all this was not disheartening enough, he soon heard in the distance the baying of a pack of hounds. Pittenger hardly knew what he should do or which way to go, but idleness was plainly no longer an option, so he headed off into the forest in a direction he believed was perpendicular to the railroad. He traveled for some time, descending a wild, solitary valley and crossing a road. Much to his relief, the sound of the dogs growing fainter as the day slipped into evening. Pittenger had never much believed the old saw that persons who are lost in the woods tend to travel in a circle, but he soon found himself again crossing a road back at the same spot he had left an hour before. Frustrated but undaunted, he struck out over a hill only to wind his way back to the road a third time. Not long after, he was back on the banks of what he was sure was the same river he had crossed before. Pittenger considered himself an educated and resourceful man despite his limited vision, but in these circumstances he was overmatched. I was perplexed beyond measure, he admitted. The nearsighted corporal continued his wandering throughout the night, hoping to cross the Tennessee River a few miles south of Chattanooga. On two occasions he was able to inquire of local citizens as to his location. An old man gardening next to a rude hut said he was eight miles from the mountain city, while some horsemen on the road later told him he was only three miles away. But even if the information was accurate, he was too confused to judge which way to go from there. He roamed, backtracked, took random turns, and later admitted following one road almost regardless of where it should lead. The night sky was completely black and devoid of stars. Never did I bend a more anxious eye to that darkened firmament than in my solitary wanderings over the Georgia hills that night, Pittenger wrote a year later, in a somewhat melodramatic account of his ordeal, but all in vain. No north star appeared to point with beam of hope to the land of the free. Clad in lightweight clothing and shivering from the torrential downpour, he stumbled on with teeth chattering through much of the night before collapsing in fitful, dream-troubled sleep next to a roadside log. An equally gray Sunday morning soon dawned, but Pittenger found the Sabbath lacked the blessed calmness and peace that accompany it in my own sweet Ohio. Hiding in the woods, he saw people making their way to church, and had a strange longing to go with them, if only to make his way out of the wilderness. He wandered throughout the morning just before being stopped for questioning, just outside of the town of Lafayette, Georgia. As it turned out, he was more than twenty-two miles from Ringgold, and headed in exactly the wrong direction. Hoping to head northwest and cross the Tennessee past Chattanooga, he had instead journeyed to the south-southwest and ended up almost thirty crow-flight miles from the banks of the river. But Pittenger, more so than some of his peers, was a bright young man and a good talker, and he put his persuasive skills to use. Altering the usual story somewhat, he claimed to be from Kentucky and had come south to Chattanooga, hoping to enlist and fight against the tyranny of the abolitionists and Lincolnites. Upon arriving there, he said, he was disgusted with the few poorly armed conscripts in the city, and continued south, hoping now to swing through Alabama and join the renowned 1st Georgia Regiment near Corinth with General Beauregard. The apparent leader of the posse, a little conceited man who had the epaulets of a lieutenant but whom they called Major, declared himself satisfied and proposed that they let him go then and there. Another man, however, sitting on a horse nearby with the brim of his hat pulled down low against the still-falling rain, said in a thick mountain drawl, "'Well, yes, perhaps we'd as well take him back to town, and if all's right, maybe we can help him on to Corinth.' Brought to the nearby town, Pittenger answered a number of other questions, from his home county, Fleming, to the county seat, Flemingsburg, to the surrounding counties which he made up out of whole cloth, he then gave a detailed and often entirely fictional narrative of his journey southward, inventing families he had stayed with and describing in detail the country he had supposedly passed through over the past few days. I still had faint hope that they might be induced to release me and allow me to continue my journey, Pittenger maintained, but just as his questioners were deliberating over my case and could only agree that it needed further investigation, a rider clattered into town on a lathered horse 
fresh from Ringgold with news of the capture of the Yankee bridge burners. They had first pretended to be citizens of Kentucky from Fleming County, he said, but then confessed that they were Ohio soldiers ordered to burn the bridges on the state road. This produced a marked change in their conduct toward me. Pittenger somewhat dryly recalled, he was searched, his penknife and other articles taken from him, and locked in the county jail. Five of the raiders, including their leader, came very close to making a clean getaway. Alf Wilson and Mark Wood, who would now and on later occasions prove themselves to be extremely resourceful fugitives, hid for a time in a brush pile just a few hundred yards from the railroad, apparently surrounded on every side. Several times parties after us passed so close to our hiding place that I could have reached out and touched their legs, Wilson wrote, thinking that the pounding of his heart could have been heard twenty yards away had the searchers not made so much noise themselves. They were all yelling, swearing, and shooting, he recalled, and on the style of dogs chasing a rabbit in tall weeds, all jumping and looking high, while the game was close to the ground. The two Ohioans stayed there, buried in the heap of limbs and brush, all Saturday night, through the daylight hours on Sunday, and well into Sunday night, crawling out of their hiding place in the rain-soaked darkness. Wilson and Wood were so stiff that they had to vigorously rub their arms and legs in order to get moving. They decided to take an opposite course from most of their comrades, thinking the pursuit and suspicion may be less vigilant in that direction, and therefore struck off into the mountains to the northeast. Their goal was to reach the Tennessee River to the east of Chattanooga, and their reasoning was simple. A man traveling in the rough, wooded country, particularly at night, would surely find it hard to keep his direction, as Pittenger and others would demonstrate by their aimless wanderings in the North Georgia mountains. Wilson figured if they could reach the Tennessee, they could travel downstream under cover of darkness, and always know they were heading westward toward General Mitchell and the 3rd Division in northern Alabama, Strengthened somewhat by a meal of buttermilk and cornbread begged from a country farmhouse, the pair made a toilsome journey over the next two days and nights, arriving on Wednesday afternoon at the town of Cleveland, Tennessee, about twenty rugged miles north-northeast of Ringgold. Deciding that they sure could use a map, Wilson walked boldly into the town, found a bookseller, and bought himself a school atlas. Returning to the woods, the men tore out the pages they needed and continued on their way. Fortunately, Wilson and Wood were now well into the East Tennessee Hills, solid Union country, and they could now hope for help along the way. They found supper at the home of a husband and wife, good Union folks, who warned them to watch out for local cavalry under the command of a man named Snow. Sure enough, they soon encountered the elderly home guardsman, who subjected them to vigorous interrogation and what Wilson called the most fiery lecture on the subject of northern rights and southern wrongs we had ever heard, before returning their pistols to them and letting them go on their way. Following this close call, the two returned to the home of the Unionist couple, where they were hidden and fed through the Easter weekend. On Monday morning, April 20th, the two men were guided to a nearby creek where they found an unattended canoe. Climbing into the boat, the Englishman would, no doubt delighted by this change to a naval excursion, they made their way to the Tennessee and paddled downstream in the broad, winding river. They worked their way down the river, traveling intermittently over the next two days and nights, passing Friars Island, Chattanooga, and Moccasins Point without being seen. Along the way they paid three Confederate dollars to a local man who guided them through the treacherous rapids known to the locals as the Suck. Late Wednesday night, Alf Wilson and Mark Wood arrived at Bridgeport, Alabama, floating under the railroad bridge and wondering whether they had made it to safety. The next morning they abandoned their canoe and struck out on foot, soon hearing from some retreating rebels that the Yankees were at Stevenson just four miles away. Arriving in town, they were startled to find it occupied not by friendly bluecoats, but swarming with Confederates. The two men were asked their business in the town and soon found themselves detained, accused by one of the locals of being one of the rascals that was here with the Federal cavalry. There was little comfort in the fact that this was untrue, and Wilson began secretly destroying his little map, tearing it into small pieces, and chewing up much of it. The pair was taken to Bridgeport, where they were searched and questioned further, when at last, a full twelve days after they abandoned the general, their luck ran out. 
for one among the crowd seemed to recognize Wilson, who had, of course, been in full view on the engine and tender throughout the engine chase. I could have killed him without compunction if I had possessed the power, Wilson recalled, for in the next breath he said, I know those fellows, I saw them on the train. As for James Andrews, he had left the faltering engine with the others and joined up with his now frequent companions, Marion Ross and John Wallam. The three men struck out westward, crossing West Chickamauga Creek at Daffron's Ford, south of Graysville, and traveling all night through the woods. Andrews was one of the few men among the party who had a compass, and he planned to drive due west. His course would run parallel to, and just south of, the Tennessee state line, across Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain toward Bridgeport, where he supposed the 3rd Division of the Union Army of the Ohio would be by now. The secret agent and the two Federal soldiers crossed Missionary Ridge at Rossville Gap late Sunday afternoon, and spent the night near the foot of the long ridge of Lookout Mountain at the house of a Union man named Merrick Earps. A posse was assembled early Monday morning and soon caught the trail of the three men with the reluctant help of a local physician, Dr. Thomas Y. Parks, who traveled widely to visit patients and knew the backwoods roads and footpaths of the country. Starting out from McCullough's Mill, the group split up as they made their way across the broad north-south ridge of Lookout Mountain, ten men making their way down the Wauhatchie Trail, while a handful of others headed down a blind path pointed out by the doctor. Crossing Lookout Creek at Powell's Ford and inquiring at the home of Mrs. Powell in the valley nearby, the men learned that they were no more than a half hour behind the three suspects, and they spurred their horses into a gallop. They soon came to a meadow and saw the three men disappearing in the distance into a thicket of hawthorn, and they dove pell-mell into the underbrush. John Wallam hid behind an oak tree and sprang out with his revolver cocked, but seeing the armed horseman he quickly thought better of it. There's no sense having two dead men here in the woods, he said, and handed over his weapon. Wallam adamantly maintained that he was down from Kentucky and on his way to join the Confederate Army, but the tired story was of no use by now. Andrews and Ross were rounded up in the woods just ahead, the former claiming rather blithely that they were in fact rebel soldiers and producing with a flourish a Confederate passport he had used back in his smuggling days. Dr. Parks was no fool, however, and he made his accusation plain. I know who you fellows are, he said. You're some of the party that stole the engine at Big Shanty, Georgia, ran it up as far as Ringgold, then left it. You're not looking for the Confederate Army. Andrews replied, in a voice cool and steady as if speaking to his best friend, and said, Well, my friend, I am surprised at your information. You're right about it. I see there is no use trying to deceive you. He gave his name and Ross's, and made clear that they were surrendering as prisoners of war, and that they expected to be treated as such. They went along peaceably to join Wallam and the others, though there was a moment of fright for all concerned when Andrews, reaching in his pocket to let down the hammer on his cocked pistol, accidentally discharged the weapon. The doctor was relieved at the otherwise uneventful capture, certain that the three Yankees would have chosen to fight it out had they known the true numbers, only five, and armaments, a rifle, a shotgun, and a butcher knife, of their civilian captors. All of them were grit to the backbone, Parks said, but they supposed it was a hopeless fight. Andrews, Knight, and Wallam were captured just above the hamlet of New England, Georgia, only a dozen or so cross-country miles from the Federal lines near Bridgeport, a single night's journey, in Dr. Parks's estimation. The three men were swung up on horses behind their captors, and taken back to the northeast, crossing the series of ridges toward Chattanooga. About ten miles from the city they were turned over to a company of Confederate cavalry under the command of Lieutenant James Edwards, who took them to General Ledbetter's headquarters for interrogation. Andrews gave his compass to the lieutenant as a souvenir of the occasion, though the young officer later dutifully turned it over to Ledbetter and never saw it again. William Fuller's dogged continuation of his own personal pursuit of the raiders from the railroad to the North Georgia woods, though admirable, ultimately came up empty. He started off with Fleming Cox and Alonzo Martin, heading at a full run into the trees to the west of the road, and he soon found himself alone in the brush-choked wilderness. About two miles from the railroad he came upon a farmer plowing his field. The conductor quickly had the man unhitch his plow horse and dispatched him to nearby Graysville to raise the alarm, later claiming, implausibly, that 
Three bridges were saved by the intelligence he bore. He ran another three miles, uphill and downhill, mostly uphill, he said, fighting through underbrush, fields of wheat and miry ground he would recall being as sticky as dough. At one point he spotted a handful of the raiders at the far side of a muddy field, and he detoured to put several contingents of local horsemen on the trail. He continued searching for the fugitives until darkness fell. I ran on and on, he said. I was, or under ordinary circumstances, would have been broken down. I had not eaten anything since the day before. I had not drunk any water. I was bleeding at the nose, mouth, and ears. Though his recollection seems to be seasoned heavily with melodrama, there is no doubt that the railroader had come to the end of a long, exhausting day. Fuller came at last upon a backwoods farmhouse, whose inhabitants, two men and two women, were wild with excitement from the news they had heard, and more than a little suspicious of a stranger showing up on their porch in the thickening dusk. Fuller showed some papers to establish his bona fides with the railroad, and gave the names of some folks he knew in Ringgold, which satisfied the frightened ladies as to his identity. After a welcome drink from a bucket of cold water, the young conductor, stiff and sore and too tired to take another step, asked to be taken back to Ringgold. The two men lifted him up onto an old mule, the only mount they had to offer. Slumped over on a quilt draped across the mule's back, Fuller plodded back toward Ringgold, like the virgin bound for Bethlehem. Arriving at the stone depot at Ringgold at about half-past nine that night, Fuller hobbled into the agent's office and laid down to wait for the next train south to Atlanta. His day was over, but his role in the unfolding drama was not. Even as the detail of soldiers sent south under his charge were pursued, imprisoned, whipped, and interrogated in North Georgia and Tennessee, General Ormsby Mitchell was receiving the acclaim and appreciation to which he believed he was entitled. The crowning grace came on Tuesday, April 15th, three days after the Andrews raid in the form of a wire from Washington. War Department, Washington, April 15th, 1862. Sir, I have the honor to propose for your approbation the name of Brigadier General Ormsby M. Mitchell of the United States Volunteers, to be Major General by Brevet of Volunteers, to date from April 11, 1862, for gallantry and meritorious conduct in the capture of Huntsville, Alabama, and for the capture of Decatur and Stevenson Junction, I am, sir, with great respect, your obedient servant, Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War. The men in Mitchell's division regarded his promotion to Major General as a validation of their actions and a well-deserved honor for old stars. No other man with so few troops has ventured so far into the enemy's country and accomplished so much, Colonel John Beatty wrote in his diary. Battles, if they result favorably, are great helps to the cause, but the general who by a bold dash accomplishes equally important results without loss of life is entitled to as great praise certainly as he who fights and wins a victory, and both the soldiers of the 3rd Division and their general regarded this success as just the beginning. Mitchell's ambition, energy, and experience all seemed to prepare him for great things. For him, we may almost believe, there was a horoscope, an admirer later wrote, and that all the planets were conjoined in its composition. But triumph receded and frustration returned for old stars in late April. So recently clamoring to advance, he now found himself cast in the role of the overmatched commander, pleading for reinforcements and struggling to hold what he now held. I deem the line I occupy one of vast importance, and a heavier force is required for its defense and protection, he wrote to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton on April 17th. His division, undersized to begin with, was now dispersed across Middle Tennessee and northern Alabama, guarding hundreds of miles of railroad and occupying Shelbyville, Fayetteville, Huntsville, Florence, Decatur, Tuscumbia, Belfont, and a number of other villages and towns. His men, trains, and supplies were regularly attacked by rebel cavalry or what he called straggling bands of mounted men, partly citizens, an annoyance that culminated in early May with the embarrassing capture of his aide and son, Edwin. There was little in the way of help to be had. General Buell, idling the weeks away with General Halleck near Corinth, gave Old Stars no assistance beyond offering suggestions for what position he should occupy if and when he was forced to fall back. Halleck's view of the situation was simple. 
Capturing the important junction at Corinth was the immediate priority in the Department of the Mississippi, and Mitchell was on his own. There would be no reinforcements provided by Buell or Halleck, the latter having rejected out of hand a similar request for reinforcements from Nashville. We are now at the enemy's throat and cannot release our great grip to pare his toenails, he wrote. By late April, Mitchell's requests for assistance had deteriorated into abject whining in his reports to the War Department. It is utterly impossible for me, with so small a force, to safely protect and defend so extended a line, he complained to Stanton on April 24th. I have now held my position for two weeks. The deep responsibility resting upon me, added to the fact that I am compelled to be in motion day and night, is too much for my physical health, he concluded. But for the fact that I have sixteen engines and cars in proportion, it would be madness to hold my position a single day. As for the fate of the mission he had sent into North Georgia, old stars made no mention of the affair to Washington, to Buell, or to anyone else for that matter. This was no time to dwell on failures. He was busy these days, emphasizing his successes and seeking to build upon them. A later hearsay report would suggest that the general told his son and future biographer F. A. Mitchell his belief that all the raiders had been hung. In late April, under orders from Buell, Mitchell's troops burned the long bridge over the Tennessee River at Stevenson. No one in the Union command seemed to give any thought to the raiders, or to threatening Chattanooga, for that matter. In the end, despite the difficulties imposed on the searchers by foul weather and rough terrain, not a single one of the Yankee raiders escaped. Dorsey, Bensinger, Buffum, and George Wilson, as it turned out, simply wandered, indeed, finding that they had backtracked in the dense woods just as the wayward Pittenger had. They were rounded up by a local posse only nine miles from Ringgold, even though they had been on the move for almost twenty-four hours. About noon on Sunday they found themselves surrounded by an excited crowd of fifty, Bensinger says eighty, Dorsey recalled, with those about barking orders to surrender, surrender, damn you. George Wilson wisely steered clear of the Flemingsburg, Kentucky story, and spun a tale about having come down from Virginia in pursuit of fugitive slaves, but their captors were unimpressed. Buffum, gutsy as ever, pointed out that they had had nothing to eat for two days and asked for a good square meal before we go over the river. Much to their surprise, the four men were taken to a nearby house and served a fine dinner, intermingled with numerous questions and not a little sport and hilarity, much of it at our expense. A chief topic was the issue of reward money. One hundred dollars had apparently been offered by William Fuller for the capture of the party, and the Yankee prisoners joined their southern hosts in debating how the money should be spent, arguing that widows and needy families of soldiers should have it. Arriving in Ringgold, the four soldiers were searched again, their money and any trinkets taken from them, and then sent by rail south to Marietta, spending some thirty-six terrifying hours in a basement jail, as dark as dark could be. Though their fears were doused somewhat by a bottle of whiskey generously supplied by their captors, we had a reminder of the old-fashioned Methodist hell, of which we had heard so much in our childhood, Satan and his chains included, Dorsey remembered. Then it was back up the line to Chattanooga, where they would join their comrades in more permanent quarters. They were marched from the station, handcuffed and led by trace chains around their necks, through a jeering crowd of locals who had come to the depot to see the show. "'Will them hounds hunt?' one among the mob laughed, while others assured the captives, "'You all'll make nice ornaments at the end of a rope.' The raiders had a standard and defiant response to this taunting. "'Hang and be damned,' they said. "'Our fellows will hang twenty of you for every one you hang of this party.' For their part, Knight, Brown, Scott, Mason, and Reddick had turned hard to the west from Chickamauga Creek, and tried as best they could to head toward Bridgeport, making poor headway under cover of darkness over the next six nights. The following day Mason and Scott were flushed out by a dog and nabbed by rebel pickets, while Knight, Brown, and Reddick managed to sneak away and spend the night in a nearby cave. The three risked breakfast at a log cabin early the next morning, but the old man there sent his son down the road on a sorrel horse to alert the local cavalry. Our jig was up. Knight recalled, and like the others they were taken to Chattanooga for questioning before General Ledbetter. The southern newspapers proudly reported the capture of the Yankee spies, or bridge-burners, or engine-thieves, as they would come to be called. 
Next morning, a few stragglers who had deserted the stolen train were caught in the swamps brought to town and are now in jail, one article said. Thus ended the invasion of Georgia. The Daily Intelligencer soon identified the leader. A man named Andrews, the paper said, who was found with several thousand dollars on his person and was said to have once lived in Atlanta. The city's other daily newspaper, the Southern Confederacy, would later report the disturbing news that the spy has often been in our reading room during his peregrinations in the Confederate States. He is an unmitigated Yankee scoundrel, but reckless and daring, the intelligencer said. He, we learn, confesses nothing. Part 3 Consequences Chapter 11 Court Martial Chattanooga and Knoxville the Engine Thieves. Twenty-three of these villains have now been captured. They are now undergoing trial before a court-martial in Chattanooga. We know not what progress is being made. We hear that one of the scoundrels proposed to turn state's evidence against the balance if he can thereby save his neck. Atlanta, Southern Confederacy. April 23, 1862. The jailer in Chattanooga was a geezer named Swims, and he was by all accounts a cruel and despicable old man. If you can form an idea of the personal appearance of old Satan the devil, you can describe old Swims, Wilson Brown wrote decades later. Swims was sixty-two years old, but could just as well have been ninety. His wiry form gnarled and stooped like a storm-bent willow. He had a withered, weathered face, bushy brows and thick white hair that would have been snowy had it been clean. A scraggly mustache of sparse, wispy strands hung down over his lip, complemented, if you could call it that, by a smattering of white stubble on his chin that reminded one raider of porcupine quills sticking in a dog's nose. He wore a coarse, homespun suit Brown would describe as more holy than righteous and well saturated with grease, and addressed his unfortunate guests in a screeching voice somewhere between the bray of a jackass and the howl of a coyote. Recently promoted to the office of jailer from his prior vocation of public drayman, Swims passed the time by drinking and tormenting his charges, tilting back in a wooden chair to sleep off the effects of copious amounts of whiskey. His sloth and greed were matched, if not exceeded, by a deep and abiding hatred of Negroes and Yankees. It was said that the old man had a Christian name, but nobody cared enough about him to remember it. If the jailer was the stuff of nightmares, so was the jail itself. A plain picture of the Chattanooga prison into which the members of the railroad party were thrust cannot be given in all its detail without shocking the sensitive reader, Pittenger wrote. The two-story brick structure was embedded in a muddy slope at the northwest corner of Fifth and Lookout Streets, mostly hidden from view by a tall wooden fence that surrounded the rock-strewn yard. A local journalist would describe the building as a queer freak of architecture, which one curious Chattanooga resident would later measure as being some thirty-seven feet long and twenty-three feet wide with brick walls, barred windows, and a peaked, shingled roof. A rickety exterior staircase on the east side led to the entry on the second floor, which contained a holding cell and meager sleeping quarters for the jailer. One end of the lower floor housed a crude kitchen, while the other end, most of it underground, was used for harsh and hopeless confinement. An iron-banded trap door in the floor of the upstairs cell led to the dark, putrid dungeon below, its two square windows, one nearly buried in the hillside and the other up under the staircase, covered with thick iron lattice that blotted out light and stifled any whisper of fresh air. Locals called it the Negro Jail, as in pre-war days it had held mostly recaptured slaves, though the inmates housed there usually called it the Hole. We added a little to that after a while, William Knight later wrote, and named it Hell Hole. At least one Southern official shared this assessment of the place. Colonel H. L. Claiborne, the provost marshal of Chattanooga, reportedly told General Ledbetter that it would be mercy to those men to take them out and blow their brains out rather than keep them in that hole. 
The raiders were reunited there in the black basement of Swims's jail as they were captured, though not before several were taken before General Ledbetter for interrogation, including James Andrews himself. Bill Pittenger was among the first to be ushered into the general's presence, and he would later have nothing but contempt for the rebel officer. They said he was a northern man, the Ohio corporal wrote, but if so, it is very little credit to my section, for he was one of the most contemptible individuals I ever knew. He was a perfect sot, who was reputed to have just two states of body. These were dead drunk and gentlemanly drunk. Ledbetter made his headquarters on the second floor of the fine Crutchfield House Hotel just across from the railroad station. There Pittenger was brought before the Gray Commander, and sure enough he was gentlemanly drunk. A lengthy interrogation ensued, and if Pittenger's account can be believed, Ledbetter was even more gullible than he was intoxicated. Pittenger told him that General Mitchell had grand designs indeed, taking Chattanooga and Atlanta and then driving for the coast with 60,000 or 70,000 men available for the campaign. This was abject, transparent puffery. Southern newspapers were already reporting, quite accurately, that Mitchell only had between 7,000 and 10,000 men in northern Alabama. It is unlikely that Ledbetter, an accomplished engineer and an intelligent officer who had graduated third in his class at West Point, put much stock in this false and far-fetched tale, though Pittenger certainly claimed that he did. Ledbetter seemed profoundly impressed, the former schoolteacher recalled, and said that he had no idea that Mitchell had so many men at his disposal. As for the raid itself, Pittenger gave his name, company, and regiment, but refused to identify the purpose of the mission or the engineer on the train. Ledbetter was undisturbed. He shrugged and said, Well, I know all about it. Your leader's name is Andrews. What sort of man is he? Astonished that the rebel officer knew the identity of their leader, Pittenger smugly replied that he could only tell him one thing, and that was that Andrews was a man whom you will never catch. Ledbetter smiled broadly at this and directed that Pittenger be taken on over to the hole. He found waiting in the hall outside his comrades Marion Ross, John Wallam, and an ironed and shackled James Andrews. William Knight had a similar experience. Brought to the hotel, he found General Ledbetter seated in a chair wearing an old-fashioned Dutch knit cap. Somewhat bemused and far from intimidated, Knight thought his inquisitor looked more like a lager beer sign than like a general. Knight told Ledbetter that he was from Kentucky and had been making his way to Chandler Springs, Alabama. Asked what he planned to do there, the irreverent engineer replied that if he liked the place he thought he just might buy it. Not at all amused, Ledbetter fired questions at night for half an hour and closely examined the wear on his boots, which were considerably scuffed from his days in the rocky North Georgia terrain. Alf Wilson was subjected to a similar close visual inspection. He claimed that Ledbetter identified him and Mark Wood as Yankees by removing their hats and pointing to their pale complexions as a telltale sign of the round, short-brimmed regulation caps worn by Federal infantry. Knight was then shown the door, and he too was shocked to find Andrews standing out in the corridor. The engineer managed to keep his composure, he later said, but I think if I had been struck with seven kinds of lightning, I would not have felt any more streaked than I did just at that moment. Andrews, of course, had identified himself to Dr. Parks upon his capture, which was just as well. The Kentuckian was widely known from his contraband business in this part of Tennessee, and would have been recognized soon enough in any event. A thorough search before General Ledbetter revealed a large amount of Confederate money, which, along with his imposing demeanor and his ivory-handled Colt pistol, branded the civilian spy in the minds of the Confederates as the leader of the raid. Following his audience with Ledbetter, Andrews was taken along with Ross and Wallum to the jail, where old Swims greeted them at the gate, jangling his keys. The three were taken into the upstairs cell, where Swims was told to put them in the hole. Unlocking the trap door, the jailer cried, Look out below! and slid a ladder down into the gap. The pale, upturned faces of the captives below were barely visible, and a hot, putrid stench rose from the blackness. Andrews, who had faced a myriad of perils in the past, and would later meet the hangman without flinching, balked for once at the sight of the dungeon below. 
That is no place to put a man, he protested. Let us stay up here for a while. Swims replied, It is the best we can do now, but we'll do better after a while, and the three men were forced down the ladder. The Andrews raiders would spend nearly three weeks trapped in Swims's hole and would hold frightful memories of the ordeal for the rest of their lives. Wilson and Wood were the last two to be brought in, and Alf would recall the sepulchral voices and specter-like forms that greeted them from the gloom below as they descended into the suffocating enclosure. The basement cell was dark and of unlucky dimensions, measuring thirteen feet square and thirteen feet high, and it held nearly two dozen men, several East Tennessee Unionists, and a runaway slave by the name of Alec had been incarcerated there, though they were displaced upstairs one by one as the more notorious engine thieves arrived. The raiders were kept handcuffed and chained together in pairs by the neck. The heavy chains locked with padlocks one of the upstairs prisoners would describe as being larger than a man's hand and weighing nearly two pounds. There was little ventilation, and the daytime heat was oppressive even then in late April. The place reeked of sweat and offal and was swarming with vermin. Not only rats and mice, but other things, smaller and worse, as one raider put it, a particular problem since the handcuffs and trace chains made swatting and scratching difficult and ineffective. There was not enough room for everyone to lie down to sleep comfortably. They wedged side by side in two rows of ten, like rumpled, bent cigars in the foulest of humidors, with a pair of leftover men sleeping long ways at the end between the buckets provided in one corner for water and in the other for their slops. The water bucket was rarely filled, and the other rarely emptied. The prisoners were fed just twice a day, a pitiful offering of spoiled pickled beef or pork, a few crumbling morsels of cornbread, and watery cane-seed coffee. Swims delivered these crumbs by way of a hook at the end of a tattered rope, which in its swaying and dangling gave the raiders an uneasy sense of foreboding. Yet the inmates greeted the delivery of their paltry meals with a degree of expectation only one who has been truly hungry can appreciate. We sat or stood around looking up to old swims like so many young birds in their nest reaching up to the parent bird to grab the worm she brings in her bill, mouths open, all eager and ready to catch it. Best man forward, first come, first served, every fellow for himself, and the devil take the hindmost, Dorsey remembered. It quickly became obvious that this unseemly free-for-all scramble for rations would not do, and agreed-upon authority was needed to fairly distribute the bounty, such as it was. The captives soon established a government, electing Andrews president, with the full power to appoint assistance and run things right. Even with the rations shared evenly, feeding themselves was hard scrabbling, as they had no utensils and most had their hands palm to palm in irons, with few if any connecting links. Knight, for one, tried to repel the specter of hunger by making light of the situation. His only wish, he said, was that the rebels would give him one good square meal before hanging him, so that his body would be heavy enough to break his neck. Despite the hunger and hardship, the men did not despair and kept themselves busy as best they could. A very erroneous impression would be given the reader if he imagined that we spent our time here in nothing but hopelessly bemoaning our misery, Pittenger wrote. They passed the time mostly in conversation, the first few days being largely taken up with relating their respective adventures on the run after fleeing the general. They spent the long hours thereafter telling stories, or discussing the progress of the war, or the issues of the day. Only two of the Federal soldiers, Pittenger and Buffum, were out-and-out -out abolitionists, as they put it, and they soon found they could gain the upper hand in any argument over the question of slavery by appealing to the inhumanity and cruelty of their current circumstances. The raiders talked of hometowns, family, friends, and even future plans, and they grew closer together. No one in the party was permitted to lose his spirit, had we been confined in solitude, the dread and foreboding would have been more terrible, Pittenger recalled, but we made a league against fear and fretting. Dorsey echoed this sentiment. We were a jolly crew in a bad boat, he said. At times the aimless discussion gave way to drama, particularly for Robert Buffum, who quoted Shakespeare in his daily life, even when the circumstances called for a tragedy, as they plainly did now. A favorite in those dark days was the ghost's speech from the first act of Hamlet, 
which the little dark-bearded Massachusetts private would deliver in the dim light with a booming voice, his inflection and gestures recalled by his comrades years later, but that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres, thy knotted and combined locks to part and each particular hair to stand on end like quills upon the fretful porpentine. But this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, oh, list! Though one might suspect that some among the prisoners sought divine assistance, there was in fact little prayer or conversation of a religious character in those first days. That came later, one soldier said, but there was a good deal of language at the other extreme. If profanity would explode anything, that old dungeon would have blown into a million atoms within the first twenty-four hours after we got into it, Dorsey recalled. I never heard anything like it before nor since, he said, and this was a man who had spent nearly a year in the army. He later found, to his surprise, upon emerging from the darkness to a more civilized enclosure, that a few of his comrades, Ross, Porter, Slavins, and Pittenger, did not use profane language at all, though he maintained, perhaps by way of excuse, that hole was enough to make a preacher swear. Rather than simply curse their bad fortune, the engineer William Knight, in particular, made special efforts to improve their lot. Had he been in a prison camp in the next century, Knight may well have been known as the Scrounger. Not only had he managed to hide a substantial sum of money, gold coins no less, from his captors, but he had also secreted his trusty jackknife, the one he had used to cut the bell rope on the general back at Big Shanty, which was handy for now, but would soon become vital. After a few days, he managed to whittle wooden scraps and bones from the rancid meat they were given into serviceable picks for the padlocks. Using Knight's ingenious skeleton keys, the captives were able to free their hands and unhitch from each other, their wrists chafed and swollen and their arms and necks red with rust by now from the cuffs and collars. Knight also was able to make regular purchases of tobacco in large plugs of Old Navy from swims or the guards, a true luxury and this success inspired him to try his hand at supplementing their rations as well. They inquired of the jailer whether they could buy food, and, finding no objection, so long as they had the money, engaged in a lengthy debate over what they should purchase, finally setting on an inexpensive but tasty and filling menu of wheat bread and molasses. They handed up a few coins and eagerly awaited a royal breakfast next day, but they were disappointed. In the morning, the heartless old warden lowered down their usual fare of spoiled pork and cornbread. In response to the angry complaints from below, Swims stuck his head in the hole and, in his slowest and most provoking tones, said, Boys, I lost that money. The hell you did, Knight roared. You damned old scoundrel, you spent it for whiskey. You're drunk now. A protest to the officer of the guard was summarily denied. He simply laughed and said that if they trusted Swims with their money, they would have to take their chances. From that point forward, the raiders bypassed the old man and appealed directly to the captain on duty for any business matters. Easing the pain of captivity was all well and good, but the raiders also thought and talked about how they might end it. They considered at length how they might escape, and the plans for escaping were as numerous as the inmates, Dorsey recalled. Yet the prospects for a successful jailbreak seemed grim indeed. The brick walls of the jail were reinforced here in the hall with oak timbers. The iron in the windows was immovable. The trap door above was kept locked and was well out of reach in any event. Outside, an escapee would have to get past armed Confederate guards, a locked gate, and the high fence, the reward being a swim across the fast-moving current of the Tennessee River, and a cross-country trek over harsh terrain to the west and north toward the Union lines. Some among the captives were injured or sick. All were ill-fed and weak, and any attempt to run would almost certainly require more strength than they could muster. They would keep looking for opportunities, but for now it seemed they could do little more than bide their time and wait for the inevitable trial to begin. There was no question that there would be a court-martial, of course, even though their admirably daring scheme had been thwarted and no lasting damage was done, 
The twenty-two raiders were spies and saboteurs and would have to answer for it. Justice must be done and lessons given, especially here in East Tennessee, to others who would contemplate similar acts of violence and disloyalty against the South. They were informed that court-martial proceedings would be instituted in short order and spent long hours of anxious discussion as to what they should and should not say and what sort of defense they should present to the charges. George D. Wilson and William Pittenger took the lead in outlining their case. Both men felt strongly that any pretense of childlike innocence would be foolish and counterproductive. There were dozens of witnesses who had seen them on the train, and almost all the raiders had already identified themselves by name and regiment. Wilson and Pittenger therefore believed they should embrace their status as United States soldiers and claim the protection of the laws of war. They were enlisted in the service and acting under orders from their superiors, and they must be treated respectfully, as prisoners of war, and not be subjected to the dishonor and the possible capital punishment regularly afforded to traitors and spies. The raid was purely a military expedition, they would argue, and they had not passed a line or outpost of the enemy and could not be said to be lurking in and about their camps, a necessary element to convict on the charge of spying. They agreed that they would not reveal Campbell as a civilian, that no one would identify which man or men of the party served as the engineer on the general, that they would not disclose the earlier failed attempt to destroy the WNA, and that no one would discuss Andrews's service as a spy for the Union. Pittenger would later assert that all had agreed to this plan and even appointed him the spokesman of the party, though others, especially Dorsey, would claim that many among the Ohioans were bitterly opposed to this approach. A confession, however presented, didn't seem to them like much of a plan. There were, of course, a number of problems with the agreed-upon story in any event. They were soldiers, indeed, but had been disguised in civilian clothes. All had volunteered to undertake a secret mission behind the lines, knowing that they would likely be treated as spies if captured. They were, in fact, hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, and though they may not have lurked, they certainly commandeered a southern engine in the midst of a Confederate camp. Dorsey would adamantly disagree, later arguing that they had captured the locomotive, not stolen it, and that the boundary of the camp was in fact several rods from the railroad tracks at Big Shanty, though the court-martial surely would have had no patience with such trifling distinctions. Finally, they appeared to be acting under the orders of a civilian smuggler who was not in the army at all, though they planned to disavow his career as a spy and maintain that they all supposed he was a federal officer. At least some of the raiders were far from confident in the legal case. Dorsey and Brown, for example, felt that their only hope was escape, whatever the odds, and they urged Andrews to order and lead an attack on the guards. They would escape or be killed in the attempt. Wilson and Pittenger objected to this, pointing out the slim chance of success, and Andrews followed their counsel, at least for the time being. Andrews would be the first tried and his case would be even more difficult than that of the Union soldiers in his charge. He, too, had been seen aboard the general. He was well known as a smuggler, and unlike the others, he could not claim the protection of enlistment or the honors of war. He had in the past rendered service to the South in the course of his contraband trade, and would no doubt emphasize the fact. Apart from that, there seemed little to hope for, though it was whispered among the raiders that the secret agent had connections on the outside, and that money would be liberally spent to influence the court or effect an escape. Shortly before the court-martial was to begin, William Pittenger was again removed from the hole and taken before an officer. He presumed the president of the upcoming court-martial for additional questioning. The reason for Pittenger being singled out in this fashion remains in dispute. Dorsey would later contend that Pittenger proposed a plan to induce the authorities to call him as a witness, at which time he would testify that the raiders were not spies, but regularly detailed soldiers on a purely military expedition. Another story is that Pittenger feigned sickness in order to be removed so he could talk with the Confederates, probably untrue as a number of the prisoners were injured or ill, and their captors seemed to have little concern over their physical well-being. The most likely explanation is that the bespectacled corporal had simply been the most articulate, the most forthcoming, or both, in prior interviews. Pittenger himself later wrote, I had to pass a more protracted examination than any of the others, 
perhaps because I had told General Ledbetter so many of my inferences about war affairs when first taken before him. Upon his return, he was kept apart from the other raiders, at times left outside in the yard and given a New Testament to read. He would be questioned for the next two or three days, and in the future maintained that he strictly adhered to the plan, suggested by Wilson and him, and agreed upon by the entire party, but the isolation and the apparent preferential treatment Pittenger received planted seeds of resentment and distrust that would grow years later into open accusations of betrayal. Newspapers across the South expressed shock and anger at the theft of the general, seasoned heavily with undisguised admiration at the boldness, the nerve, the outright audacity of the raid. As early as April 15th, the Atlanta newspaper, the Southern Confederacy, had already christened the affair the Great Railroad Chase, its subheads proclaiming it the most extraordinary and astounding adventure of the war, and the most daring undertaking that Yankees ever planned or attempted to execute. The Augusta Daily Chronicle and Sentinels headlines echoed the praise from Atlanta, an audacious act, a bold and daring trick, the paper pronouncing the raid, one of the most reckless pieces of rascality which it has ever been our lot to hear or read of. An early article in the Atlanta Commonwealth called it an extraordinary affair, saying, We have to record today either one of the most daring robberies or maddest pranks that has ever fallen under our notice, certainly one of the most bold and reckless feats of the war. The facts reported in the early accounts of the raid and the subsequent chase were surprisingly accurate. The Daily Intelligencer, for example, obtained the complete reports of William Fuller and Anthony Murphy, which were at that time nearly in full agreement. On April 15th, the Southern Confederacy ran its dramatic 3,800-word account of the glorious chase, giving full particulars that would provide a foundation for the story's enduring legend and a starting point for historians for years to come. And sadly, despite poor Jacob Parrott's brave silence under the whip, it is apparent from the press reports that some among the raiders were talking to the Confederate authorities. The captured scoundrels have made a clean breast of it, the intelligencer said. The press soon described in detail the object of the raid, the name of the leader, the place of origin, Shelbyville, and the size of the party, pegged by one paper as early as Monday, April 14th, as being made up of 22 men, even though most of the party were still scattered in the forest at that time. As such, it appears that Alf Wilson was sadly mistaken when he wrote, I am proud to be able to say that not a man of that faithful band was base enough to betray his comrades, though it is unclear who among the raiders may have talked, or when, or why. There was also outrage among press and populace that such a thing could happen, especially since this was hardly the first time the Southern Railroad bridges had been targeted by Union-loyal marauders. The Memphis Daily Appeal's April 15th headline read simply, More Bridge Burners. Though the state would be ravaged by war two years hence, Georgians had seen little of the conflict firsthand to this point and were frightened to hear news of armed Yankees sneaking and stealing among them. Excitement and suspicion prevailed for weeks, and citizens in hotel lobbies, bar rooms, and railroad depots from Savannah to Knoxville saw in the face of every stranger a saboteur or a spy. In one well-publicized instance of this irrational suspicion, the misdirected anger of a group of Confederate soldiers resulted in violence committed upon an innocent man. On Saturday about noon, as the raiders were stopped just north of Dalton, they had been approached by one Benjamin Flynn, foreman of the works up at Graysville, who had been drinking considerably and was headed back home. He hailed the raiders and asked to hitch a ride northward, but they told him they were running ammunition to General Beauregard. The tipsy foreman waved and hurrahed them onward, calling out, Hurry her up, boys! Unfortunately, a company of soldiers under the command of Colonel Jesse A. Glenn witnessed this encouragement, which was later mistaken for complicity, that night, Flynn was dragged from his home, tied to a tree, and beaten most unmercifully as a Union sympathizer, a sad episode reported with considerable outrage in the Atlanta papers for weeks to come. Though this sort of vigilante action was uncalled for, 
Increased vigilance in guarding the Western and Atlantic certainly was. Let this be a warning to the railroad men and everybody else in the Confederate States. Let an engine never be left alone for a moment. Let additional guards be placed at our bridges, the Southern Confederacy wrote, noting indignantly that it had urged these steps be taken long ago. All agreed that the WNA, the state of Georgia, and the people of the South owed a hefty debt to the railroaders who had chased down the perpetrators. Great credit is due to Messrs. Kane, Fuller, and Murphy for the extraordinary exertions which they made to recapture their stolen cars, one paper wrote, noting that the pursuit was fraught with much danger. If the days following the raid provided ample time for hysteria and self-congratulation, they also began a still-continuing era of regret, recriminations, and endless speculation as to what might have been. Certainly the Federal raiders, cooped up in Swims's brick-and-iron basement in Chattanooga, had plenty of time to reflect on what went wrong. Pittenger would later catalog the main reasons for the failure of the mission, ranking Fuller and Murphy's heroic pursuit a distant fourth behind the one-day delay, the incessant rain, and Andrews's unwillingness to stand and fight. Andrews, with all his courage, never rightly valued fighting men, Pittenger wrote. He preferred accomplishing his objects by stratagem and in secrecy rather than by open force. Pittenger was careful to clarify that he was by no means calling James Andrews a coward. The term might as well be applied to Julius Caesar, he said. Daniel Allen Dorsey speculated that destroying the Yona and the bridge over the Etowah could have been easily done, snuffing out the pursuit before it even got started. It is easy to look back and see our mistakes, he admitted. William Knight simply blamed the weather. We would have been successful, he told audiences years later, had it not been for the excessive rain which was falling almost in torrents. Others would give their own opinions as to what the raiders should have done differently. Better tools, perhaps, or an obstruction at Tunnel Hill, or cutting the wires sooner, an ambush at this point or that. Of course, this sort of empty second-guessing is a simple and safe exercise to conduct after the fact, but at the time Andrews had not known that he would encounter extra trains, or that there were no rebel soldiers at Etowa, or that a relentless pursuit had been behind him from the outset. What the raiders had encountered was not so much the fog of war, but the cold, stark disconnect between certain plans and uncertain realities. Anthony Murphy may have summed it up best in his account of the chase, written in 1893. The conception of great and daring deeds is one thing, and their execution is another, he said. But all concerned, North and South, seemed to agree that the raid was, that is, would have been, a masterstroke for the Union, and that the Confederacy had been spared a grievous blow by its failure. We now understand it all, the Southern Confederacy wrote of the presence of Mitchell's troops in Huntsville. They were to move upon Chattanooga and Knoxville as soon as the bridges were burnt, and press on into Virginia as far as possible, and take all our forces in that state in the rear. It was all the deepest laid scheme and on the grandest scale that ever emanated from the brains of any number of Yankees combined. Fuller agreed, writing years later, that had the raiders succeeded, Mitchell would have taken Chattanooga within five days, all the garrisons from Memphis to Richmond would have been cut off from all help, and the battles of Chickamauga and Chattanooga would not have been fought. Both sides, of course, benefited from this puffing. The raiders were made more heroic by attempting such a daring and valuable mission, and their pursuers made more heroic by foiling it. Knight thought Fuller and Murphy had done nothing less than save the Confederacy. If those bridges could have been burned at that time, it would have cut the Southern Confederacy in two, he later argued. Vehemently, if somewhat inarticulately, it would have shook them from center to circumference. Our army could have taken Chattanooga, they could have went to Knoxville and struck the rebel army in the rear at Cumberland Gap or Richmond or wherever they choose. Pittenger was somewhat defensive about the usefulness of what they had attempted, dedicating an entire chapter of his 1887 book to cataloging what was actually accomplished by the raiders. He argues, rather unconvincingly, that the raid, although unsuccessful in its object, did result in a diversion of manpower to guarding railroads, a more stringent passport system, and a chilling effect on contraband smuggling, 
all of which inured to the benefit of the Union cause. But his ultimate conclusion as to the intangible value of the Andrews raid is worth repeating because it is in some respects probably true. It was especially necessary that in this conflict there should be some unmistakable illustrations of northern daring, for it had been an accepted tradition, to some extent in the north as well as at the south, that in personal bravery, in dash and enthusiasm, the southern soldier far excelled the northern, and up to this time nearly all the daring movements and dashing raids had been displayed on behalf of the South. The idle boast that one southern soldier was worth five Yankees was probably never sincerely made in that extreme form, but there was a firm belief that, man for man, the advantage was on the side of the rebels. Nothing during the whole war did so much to shake this feeling as our raid. It was beating the enemy at his own game. The trial of James Andrews was to be held on the second floor of the old armory building at 4th and Market Streets, one block over and two blocks down the hill from the jail. The prosecution's case would be conducted by two respected Confederate officers, both of them Georgians, from the recently formed 39th Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Colonel Joseph T. McConnell, the commanding officer of the regiment, had represented his nearby home county of Catoosa at the Georgia Convention in January 1861, casting a loud vote in favor of the ordinance calling for the state to secede. His co-counsel, Captain Leander W. Crook, was a prominent lawyer and former Superior Court judge from Murray County and the leader of Company A of the regiment, the Cahutta Rangers. The two Southern officers made clear their intentions to exact swift justice on the Yankee spy, brushing aside any proffered legal defenses or suggestion of mitigating circumstances. For example, Andrews's recent captor, Dr. Thomas Parks, soon developed considerable sympathy for the charismatic defendant, finding him to be a man of prepossessing appearance and impressed by his cool and determined manner and sought to intervene on his behalf. As Captain Crook was a long-time personal friend, Parks pulled him aside just after the trial began. The good doctor told Crook what Andrews had claimed when captured, that he was surrendering as a prisoner of war, that his men were enlisted and in force, and that none could be treated as spies. The young officer rejected this appeal out of hand. Enlisted or not enlisted, he said, they were down there where they ought not have been, and I'll hang every one of them if I can. With this sort of prosecutorial zeal across the room, Andrews desperately needed formidable defense counsel, and he found it. The Honorable Rees B. Brabson was one of the most famous men in Chattanooga, and rightfully so. Born on a farm in Sevier County in 1817, he was named for his great-uncle Rees Bowen, Revolutionary War hero of Kings Mountain and Bunker Hill. His farmhouse birth and rural upbringing were by no means rustic, his father owned a huge acreage and a large number of mills and slaves, and the log cabin where young Reese was born had no less than fourteen rooms, floored with hardwoods, anchored by a living-room fireplace of quarried stone, and finely appointed with mahogany furniture and French china. Gifted even at a young age as an accomplished scholar and an eloquent public speaker, Brabson read law under a relative who was a judge, and in 1851 began his service in the Tennessee General Assembly. It was there in Nashville that he had a public run-in with another prominent Tennessean that would make him famous. As a young state representative, Brabson gave a fiery speech on the floor of the State House, disparaging newspapermen and editors as a class, which was of course promptly and indignantly reported in all the local newspapers, Felix K. Zollicoffer, the editor of the Nashville Republican Banner and Whig, and later an ill-equipped Confederate brigadier general who would be killed at the Battle of Mill Springs, took exception to Brabson's remarks and angrily confronted him outside the St. Cloud Hotel, berating the legislator for spreading falsities and charging that he was not a gentleman. Brabson responded by slapping Zollicoffer full and hard across the face, Never a man for sensible military responses, then or later, Zollicoffer drew his revolver and fired point-blank at the unarmed Brabson, though he somehow missed the bullet lodging in the front door of the hotel. No harm was done except perhaps to the pride and the cheek of the rebuked Whig editor. 
Colonel Brabson conducted himself similarly in all his affairs, self-assured, smart, and bold, refusing to back down even from the most heated confrontation. In 1858, he won a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he would serve until the outbreak of the war, warning his Southern brethren of the danger of walking away from the Union and the constitutional protections it afforded. Though both North and South offered him commissions as an army officer, he chose to sit out the conflict and returned South to Chattanooga. His home was among the most impressive in the city, a red brick mansion standing farther up East Fifth Street at the top of what was known to the locals as Brabson Hill, surrounded by orchards and gardens and tended by a number of slaves. His elegant wife, the former Sarah Keith, was widely known and well regarded for her wit, beauty, and graciousness. Now forty-four years old, Brabson was considered an immense legal talent in the prime of his career, pleasant in his manners, notwithstanding the occasional abuse of an impertinent newspaper editor, and said to be especially strong before a jury. One who had heard him speak thought that if Brabson gave a speech on the American Eagle, he would end up soaring out of sight. Considerable sympathy had been aroused in Chattanooga by the prisoner's general good appearance, and as the first wrath of the populace wore away, their hardihood and recklessness won favor with the people, a local reporter wrote. After a few days, folks began visiting the jail, no longer mocking or jeering the captives, but instead hoping for a glimpse of or a conversation with the famous Yankee desperados. Citizens with Union feeling began to make inquiries about what they could do to help the raiders in their misfortune. Among these well-wishers was Sarah Brabson, whose small kindnesses to the imprisoned soldiers, such as loaning them books from her husband's library, soon offered an opening to seek legal representation. Judge Brabson gladly accepted the engagement and began preparing for the trial, which was to begin immediately. A lawyer from Holly Springs, Mississippi, was appointed to assist the former congressman, though his name is lost to history. The ensuing court-martial would last several days, spread out over almost three weeks, and, unfortunately, not a single line of evidence or testimony remains from the event. Andrews was charged not only with spying but also with treason, based on his prior business with and professed loyalty to the Confederate States. Both charges were considered capital offenses. The star witness was William A. Fuller himself, the hero conductor traveling up from Atlanta to complete his duty by testifying against the Yankee spies. Andrews directed that his Nashville business partner, W.S. Whiteman, be called in his defense to testify as to the Kentuckians' loyalty to and prior support of the Confederacy. Last would be Pittenger, testifying as spokesman for the party, a course that Andrews apparently approved, at least initially. He seemed to think that while it would not help him, for he had little hope of saving himself, yet he thought it might possibly help us in some way, and he would have done anything to help his men, even though it might make it worse for himself, Dorsey wrote. Little is known about the details of Andrews's legal and factual defense. He seems to have sought to make the work that he did appear as small as possible, and his own motive to be only money-making, with resulting benefits to the South far greater than the loss, Pittenger suggested. Accordingly, Judge Brabson planned to emphasize Andrews's career as a contraband smuggler, a friend to the South, who ran the blockade many times to the ultimate profit of the Confederacy. Some would suggest that Andrews maintained that he had been offered the opportunity to trade across the lines without interference for a certain amount each month, so long as he would steal a locomotive and bring it northward. This suggestion that Andrews's mission was nothing more than an effort to obtain an engine for General Mitchell was ridiculous. Locomotives were available by the drove in Kentucky and Middle Tennessee, and Mitchell had captured more than a dozen when he took Huntsville. It was also inconceivable that a Union general would risk the lives of two dozen soldiers and pay a spy thousands of dollars in exchange for a $9,000 engine. News accounts of the trial suggest that Andrews claimed that he had been in the Kentucky State Guard when neutrality was en vogue and had been entrapped into the service of the Yankee government. He had no intention to burn bridges, he maintained. He had committed no violence upon soldiers or civilians, and he had only attempted destructive action when he was pursued. His partner Whiteman was called to affirm that he was for the South, but the plan backfired. 
Whiteman was a loyal Confederate who the year before had advertised in the Nashville papers to offer free lodging to families whose husbands or brothers had left home to serve in the Southern Army. The paper mill owner no doubt believed he was helping the Confederate cause by partnering with Andrews. Instead, the smuggler had double-crossed him, damaged him financially, and attempted to aid the hated Yankees. Andrews was later said to be greatly dissatisfied with the conduct of Mr. Whiteman on the trial, thinking that he received far more injury than good from him. Whiteman's testimony only served to emphasize the nature and scope of his covert activities, and Andrews's capture in the presence of Union soldiers while carrying a Confederate passport further affirmed that he was engaged in Yankee mischief. For his part, Pittenger maintained that he stuck to the supposedly agreed-upon storyline for his testimony, though Dorsey wrote years later of a telling comment when Andrews returned to Swims's jail one afternoon following the day's adjournment. "'Well, Andrews, how did the trial go today?' Ross asked. "'Well, I hardly know,' Andrews replied quietly, nodding at Pittenger. "'But I'm afraid that fellow has swatted me.' Judge Brabson did his best to weave a fine defense from the sorry scraps of evidence and at least was able to do enough to cause hope for the accused and concern on the part of the prosecution. A Chattanooga reporter noted that Andrews's defense was so ably conducted by Judge Brabson that that gentleman was notified he was taking too much interest in the man's case and it might be better for him not to be so much concerned. Andrews's counsel suggested to him that the various interruptions— errors and informalities in the proceedings may serve to void the trial entirely. The trial concluded without any decision being rendered, the court's finding to be withheld from the defendant and the public until approved by the Secretary of War. Andrews was returned to Swims's jail to await the verdict. On the morning of May 1st, nineteen days after the raid, there was a scrape of the key above and a drunken Swims stuck his face in the trap-door opening as he lowered the prisoner's breakfast. He reported in a squeaky, querulous voice that Mitchell had advanced to Bridgeport and was now threatening Chattanooga. The raiders soon extracted from Swims what little he knew about the affair. They were experts by now in drawing the old man into conversation, if only to induce him to leave the trap-door open for a while. A short while later they could hear the faint booming of cannon in the distance and they were soon ordered up and out of the jail. The chained prisoners, weakened from hunger and stiff from confinement, staggered down the stairs and into the yard like drunks at closing time, but the feeling of liberty, however fleeting, and the taste of fresh air was sweet indeed. Squinting in the brightness, they were marched to the depot under heavy guard and loaded on passenger coaches for the ride south. Up front, the train was pulled by the engine, General which had been returned promptly to regular service after its recent kidnapping, no worse for wear. The Ohioans noticed some changes along the way. A passport system had been put into effect to confirm the legitimacy and loyalty of travelers on the road, and large bodies of soldiers were now deployed to guard public property, government stores, railroad bridges, and other important points. We had done some good after all, Dorsey thought, but it was a hard way to serve the Lord, or our country either though there was a grain of comfort in the thought. Word spread down the road that General Mitchell's raiders were traveling on this particular train, and people crowded on the depot platforms and peered in the windows to catch a glimpse of the shackled train thieves. Northern people can scarcely believe how much curiosity Southern people had to see a Yankee, more especially a Yankee soldier, Alf Wilson wrote. Some of the Southerners actually seemed to feel a superstitious belief about the Yankees, they imagined them to be some dreadful ogres or incarnate devils who would steal a nigger as quick as a hawk would a chicken, who would burn houses, ravish women, and steal gold watches, but wouldn't fight. He concluded with satisfaction, I have no doubt that many of them saw more Yankees than they cared to before the end of the rebellion. The Southern Confederacy reported their arrival in Atlanta, describing the captive soldiers as sharp, intelligent-looking men, no hard-looking cases like Yankee prisoners and East Tennessee Tories usually are. The raiders' spirits had brightened considerably, and not just because of the fresh air and change of scenery. Everywhere there were rumors of Yankee advances and prisoner exchanges in the works. A friend in the crowd slipped them a newspaper reporting the capture of New Orleans by United States forces. Glorious news indeed. 
With Mitchell about to take Chattanooga and General McClellan rumored to be threatening Richmond with an overwhelming force, the war surely would be over in a matter of weeks. The prisoners were taken on to Madison, a lovely community of mansions and oak-shaded streets later made famous as the town Sherman refused to burn, though this had more to do with the presence and persuasiveness of Sherman's friend, the former U.S. Senator Joshua Hill, than it did with the undeniable beauty and charm of the place. Madison was some sixty-seven miles east of Atlanta on the Georgia Railroad and presumably safe, at least for now, from any advancing Blue Army. Arriving there on May 2nd, the raiders were placed in the dreary confines of the Morgan County Jail, a small stone building that at first blush seemed little better than Swims's Hotel. Here at Madison was a memorable example of flared tempers among two of the chainmates. John Reed Porter, who had been chained with Daniel Allen Dorsey for nearly three weeks now, jerked Dorsey's neck for what the latter would call some fancied grievance. Dorsey, as might be expected, paid it back in kind with interest, as he put it, and thus it went, jerk, 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 back and forth, until each flew at the other and grabbed his chain around the neck and tried to choke his chainmate, both men hampered by handcuffs and making a clumsy, comic episode of the quarrel. The other boys set up such a laugh at our folly that we cooled down and became better friends than before, Dorsey recalled. The raiders' foray to Madison lasted only three days. Nothing came of Mitchell's advance on Chattanooga, which turned out to be just an effort to secure his eastward flank and protect his supply line at Stevenson, and the raiders soon entrained for the return trip northward. The ride was in boxcars this time, but the guards did their best to render our condition more endurable, as one raider put it. After all, most of them had ridden in a boxcar before. They dreaded their arrival back at Swims's jail, a place they had hoped they would never see again. But the provost marshal, Colonel Claiborne, and their new commander of the guard, Captain James Law of the 43rd Georgia, by all accounts a reasonable and kind-hearted officer, directed that they be allowed to stay in the upper room. This unfortunately displaced the East Tennessee Unionists back to the dungeon, a sad necessity the raiders justified to themselves by noting that there were only fourteen of the Tennesseans, so the hell hole would at least be less crowded. The ensuing days spent in the upstairs cell were not so very unpleasant, as one raider put it, though the rations remained hideous and their overall outlook was still rather grim. The light and air from the three large, if barred, windows in the upper room made the confinement much more tolerable and bred a number of new activities to pass the time. Foremost among these was singing. A number of the men in the party were excellent singers. Andrews and Ross had fine voices as well as formal musical training, and Mark Wood and John Porter were said to be fair assistants as well. The evening song service, held each night around twilight, soon drew the attention and admiration of the guards and a number of the locals who crowded into the prison yard to hear the caged Yankees sing. Patriotic airs, army songs, and hymns were a regular part of the repertoire, though ballads and odes to sweethearts and home made up the bulk of the program. They opened with Do They Miss Me at Home, often followed by Nettie Moore or The Prairie Queen. Sergeant Major Ross's favorite, strangely enough, was Kissing Through the Bars. "'Twas in a grove I met my love, one soft and balmy night. I owned my flame, she did the same, and trembled with delight." When at her gate we parted late, I blessed my lucky stars, and stole a kiss to seal our bliss between the wicket bars. Then there was riding on the rail, whizzing through the mountain, buzzing o'er the veil, bless me, this is pleasant, a riding on a rail, which Andrew sang with evident glee. The Englishman Mark Wood was particularly fond of A Life on the Ocean Wave, which seemed to rouse his naturally jolly spirits to their highest pitch. Andrews's favorite was the melancholy carrier dove, which he sang in a high crystalline tenor. Fly away to my native land, sweet dove, fly away to my native land, and bear these lines to my lady love that I've traced with a feeble hand. She marvels much at my long delay, a rumor of death she has heard or she thinks, perhaps, that I falsely stray, then fly to her bower, sweet bird. Oh, fly to her bower, and say the chain of the tyrant is o'er me now, 
that I never shall mount my steed again with helmet upon my brow. No friend to my lattice a solace brings, except when your voice is heard. When you beat the bars with your snowy wings, then fly to her bower, sweet bird. I shall miss thy visit at dawn, sweet dove, I shall miss thy visit at eve. But bring me a line from my lady love, and then I shall cease to grieve. I can bear in a dungeon to waste away youth, I can fall by a conqueror's sword. But I cannot endure should she doubt my truth, then fly to her bower, sweet bird. These songs, and many others like them, passed the time, entertained the crowds, and lifted the spirits of the chained soldiers. But the song of songs was the old star-spangled banner, Dorsey recalled. We took good care to make that ring in the ear of friends, and we knew we had some friends, though they didn't dare let themselves be known, and foes, at least once nearly every day during our entire imprisonment. If we were to be executed together, we intended to sing the star-spangled banner on the scaffold and sometimes practiced it with that object in view. Other pastimes developed as well. Reading and card-playing were now more practicable, thanks to plentiful daylight and books and cards donated by visitors or loaned by the guards. Some among the party, including the future Reverend Pittenger, frowned upon card-playing, but those who engaged in the practice figured they had as much right to do as they pleased in the jail as anyone else. The raiders shouted to visitors and passers-by. They could see over the fence in two directions now, and crowded at the windows to heckle the guards as they drilled nearby. They conducted elaborate mock trials, with William Campbell serving as judge, his ample size deemed to be more than sufficient to keep order in the court and to dole out punishment, usually in the form of good-natured physical abuse to those found guilty. George Wilson and Bill Pittenger served as counsel for the state and the defense, each making blistering arguments and heaping abuse on the other to the amusement of all. The cases before the court ran the gamut from imaginary sordid crimes and preposterous claims to actual, if usually petty, grievances against one's chainmate. Witnesses providing sworn testimony in these disputes often testified of their adventures the previous night in Cincinnati or Columbus or Toledo or on Wall Street trading stocks, anywhere, of course, but the old Swims Jail in Chattanooga. One day, they had a distinguished visitor in the form of the conductor William Fuller, who had seen Andrews and Pittenger at the leader's recent court-martial, but came now to pay his respects to the group as a whole. Fuller remained outside the door of the cell at first, passing a few words with us in a rather friendly manner, as Dorsey later recalled. But the conductor then seemed to come unhinged, if Dorsey can be believed, and he got off a speech Dorsey would never forget. The trouble with you gentlemen was that you had the wrong man to follow you, he said. I'm the man that followed you, and by God I'm not done following you yet. I'll follow you to the scaffold, God damn you, and see you at the end of a rope. Then I'll cease to follow you, and not till then. Dorsey wrote of this exchange almost apologetically years later, saying, Maybe I ought not to tell this, but it is a part of the history, and that is what I am writing. There is no corroboration for Dorsey's recollection— None of the other raiders ever mentioned this ugly scene. The provost marshal, Colonel Claiborne, soon afforded the imprisoned raiders another indulgence, ordering them brought out into the yard in two shifts for an hour each afternoon. This welcome respite from their cramped quarters afforded the prisoners not only sunlight and exercise, but a greater opportunity to make conversation with guards and locals and gather information— some neighbors, including a freeman blacksmith named William Lewis, sent food to supplement their rations. Others brought small gifts or news of the war. Ross, the only Freemason among the party, made contact with some fellow Masons and received small favors and pieces of intelligence from time to time. Now that a few weeks had passed and the shock of the raid had subsided, the raiders perceived a rising tide of sympathy among the populace that gave them greater hope of surviving their ordeal. There was increasing talk of a prisoner exchange, especially after the capture by rebel cavalry of General Mitchell's son. The raiders also continued their plans for a possible escape, focusing on two scenarios. The first, proposed by Pittenger, involved releasing their irons and simply rushing the guards when the cell was opened for a meal to be delivered. The formidable statures of Campbell, Ross, and Slavins made a hand-to-hand -hand fight in close quarters an appealing option, 
and it certainly had the advantage of simplicity, but even if successful, the raiders would then have to contend with as many as thirty armed guards outside the jail. The second proposal, suggested by Andrews, was for the slippery John Wallum to hide under the jailer's bed in the outer room as they returned from the yard, from whence he could sneak out, overpower old swims, and release the others. They could then make the rush to the gate as a group under cover of darkness. Although some among the party continued to put their faith in their legal defense or a possible exchange, the raiders set a date to try Andrews's plan. During the afternoon of the appointed day, however, an order was received to transport twelve of the raiders to Knoxville for trial. The reason for this change of venue is uncertain. Some theorized that the Confederates wanted to divide the large party to make them easier to guard. Others thought that the authorities believed that the group had engendered too much sympathy there in Chattanooga, and thus should be tried elsewhere. One historian would suggest that Chattanooga had an insufficient number of officers available to serve on a court-martial at the time. George Wilson, who had been ill and allowed to remain in the yard for a longer period, was the first to receive the news, and he was given the privilege of selecting the twelve men to go. Hopeful that the trial might serve to establish their bona fides as prisoners of war and render them eligible for exchange, Wilson selected his comrades from the Second Ohio, Bill Pittenger, Marion Ross, and Perry Shadrach, along with friends and former traveling companions from other regiments, William Campbell, John Scott, Samuel Slavens, Samuel Robertson, Robert Buffum, Elihu Mason, Wilson Brown, and William Knight. When the announcement was made that we must be separated, our spirits ran low, for we all knew that the chances for escape were materially lessened, Dorsey wrote. This fact, with the uncertainty of our ever meeting again, caused a gloom to fall over us. The parting was painful, especially on Andrew's account, as all felt his days were numbered, though he had had no notice of the fact as yet. It had been several weeks since his trial, and still no word of a verdict, but the same guards that talked of sympathy and exchange to the Ohio soldiers offered no such hope for Andrew's. He bore this like a hero as he was, and continued mild and cheerful as ever, Pittenger recalled, though the parting from the Knoxville Twelve had all the markings of a final farewell. Andrews shook the hands of each of the men departing and said, Boys, if I never see you here again, try to meet me on the other side of Jordan. The twelve men departed for Knoxville on the morning of May 31st, a Saturday. That same day, as the remaining ten were in the prison yard for their afternoon airing, Captain Law approached Andrews and handed him an envelope. The Kentuckian received it coolly, placed it in his pocket, and walked for a short while before climbing the steps along with his chainmate, Martin Hawkins. The rest of the party found them in the cell, reading a nicely written document which turned out to be his death warrant. For once there was a death-like pallor upon the face of the man who seemed to have no fear. Dorsey recalled. But the pallor did not last long. Mr. Andrews voluntarily told us of the nature of the document he had received, and as he did so he smiled, but, oh, such a smile. It seemed like the smile of a corpse. The nine soldiers there with Andrews felt anguish, not only for their leader, but for themselves. We all realized the reality that stared at us, as Alf Wilson put it, this didn't simply mean the execution of our chief, it was a forerunner of the fate that awaited every man of us. The order set the date of execution for June 7th, one week hence. James Andrews had seven days to live, unless he could escape. Chapter 12 The Horrors of the Gibbet Atlanta and Knoxville Yesterday evening's train from Chattanooga brought to this place to be executed Andrews, the leader of the engine thieves, under sentence of death, convicted by court-martial of being a spy. He was carried to Peachtree Street Road, accompanied by three clergymen and escorted by a guard. A considerable crowd followed to witness the execution. Atlanta Southern Confederacy, Sunday, June 8, 1862 the nine raiders who remained in Chattanooga set to work almost immediately on an effort to deliver Andrews from confinement and thus from the noose. 
Their earlier plans, rushing the guard in a long odds attempt to win freedom for the entire group by surprise and by force, were abandoned. The focus now on sneaking out a single man with others to follow, if possible. This would by no means be easy, as Andrews had been returned to the basement dungeon below them for extra security. They quickly conceived of a plan for an escape that would be largely vertical. They would bring Andrews up from the dungeon and break through the ceiling of their cell to the attic, where the outer wall of the old jail could hopefully be breached. They had but one asset, Knight's dull penknife, which the engineer, who was one among the recently departed Knoxville Twelve, had thoughtfully left behind with his comrades in case they might need it. Moreover, because their plans would necessarily require forcible opening of the trapdoor and considerable destruction to the ceiling of their cell, the bulk of the work would have to be accomplished in a single night. The Buckeye soldiers started preparing for Andrews's exodus overnight on Saturday, scoring the oak planking up above to ready the boards for a breakthrough. Their preliminary efforts in this regard went undetected through the day on Sunday, and they resumed after sunset by attacking the lock and latch of the trap door. They drowned out the sounds of their labors with loud conversation, laughter, and singing, a difficult thing to credibly sustain for a long period of time. Our singers and noisemakers were about as weary with the monotony of their efforts as the saw-shovers, Alf Wilson recalled. After a time the lock was unseated and the trap swung back, and an improvised rope made of twisted blankets and torn clothes lowered down to their leader. They again turned their attention to the two-inch oak boards of the ceiling high overhead, which had been nearly cut through during the similar noise-making the night before. Three men stood close together to form a scaffold, while a fourth stood on their shoulders and sawed at the planking above until his hand grew tired and the knife was passed to another. It was now after midnight, too late for further singing and noise, and the boards had to be cut through quietly. This was soon accomplished, and Andrews was lifted up to the attic along with John Wallam, who was to help with the exit and follow if he could. The two men set to work in the darkness, using the knife and a bone to make an opening, brick by brick, in the gable at the end of the jail. It was slow going. The bricks had to be loosened carefully, pulled inward, and then set gently down, though sounds of chipping and scraping and bits of mortar were unavoidable. At last, as the faintest light began to appear in the sky to the east, Andrews and Wallam whispered down that they were ready. The blanket rope was passed up and secured to a rafter. Andrews removed his boots, holding them in his teeth by the straps. He then slid out through the hole and disappeared. His exit unfortunately dislodged a loose brick, creating a ruckus outside and alerting one of the rebel sentries who cried, Corporal of the Guard! Corporal of the Guard! Captain! Oh, Captain! Halt! Halt! Andrews dropped to the ground and sprinted for the south fence. The guards got off several shots at the fleeing figure, but Andrews was quickly over the high board fence and gone in the darkness of Fifth Street, losing his hat and his boots in the process. Wallum, who one historian would describe as a thin, wiry, tobacco-chewing scapegrace who would have laughed in the face of Azriel, was entirely undeterred by the hollering guards and whizzing bullets. He slid down just behind Andrews and disappeared over the fence as well. The eight men remaining all agreed that it would be foolish for another to make the attempt, and the officer of the guard who burst into the cell minutes later found them quiet, innocently pretending to sleep. A laughable fiction, not only because of the shouting and the gunfire, but also because the prisoners strangely lacked blankets, and there was an unexplained hole in the ceiling. Old Swims was a tower of rage, Dorsey recalled, irate that the raiders had made merry last night while cutting his jail all to pieces. He hotly blamed the provost guard and the Confederate sentries for the lenient treatment that had been given the raiders of late, and whined that he might have known there was some devilment up the way the damned Yankees were singing hymns. Whatever minimal privileges the raiders had been afforded were now at an end, of course. It is hardly necessary for me to tell the reader that those of us who failed to make good our escape were now put down in the hole, loaded with heavy irons and treated with the greatest rigor and severity, Alf Wilson wrote. But the Ohioans were elated with their success. They congratulated each other in the fetid darkness and breathlessly awaited word of the two fugitives. Andrews and Wallam were separated from the outset, taking disparate routes through the streets as they made for the Tennessee River, racing to beat the coming daylight. 
Wallum cleverly discarded his coat and vest at the river bank and waded into the water before returning to the near bank and secreting himself in a cane break. His pursuers apparently fell for his simple ruse and began searching the other side of the river before concluding that he had been swept away and drowned. At dark, Wallum crept down the bank, found a discarded canoe, and disappeared down the river. The shoeless Andrews started out with similar plans in mind, but his initial success proved to be fleeting. The spy made his way a short distance outside the city, waded along the river bank to throw off the dogs, and then climbed a tree to hide and wait out the daylight hours as Wallum had done. He spent the day wedged uncomfortably in the notch of the tree, watching as trains ran along the nearby railroad and armed men scoured the woods and river banks around him. Fate again had dark clouds in store for James Andrews. As night fell, a rumbling thunderstorm rolled in and a vigorous wind lashed across the broad, dark surface of the river. Andrews descended and resumed his march, moving gingerly along the bank in his bare feet as a hard rain began to fall. Encountering a high bluff that made further travel down the bank impossible, he decided to swim the river. He removed his trousers, rolling them in a bundle and tying them around his neck, and pulled out into the rushing current. The waters were fast and rough in the storm, and a wave swept Andrews under and dislodged his breeches. He finally reached the opposite shore, exhausted and bruised from the rocky bottom of the river, and continued along the bank. He was determined to put as much distance as he could between himself and Chattanooga, but it was hard going in the blackness. He stumbled over rocks and limbs in the dark, briars tearing at his bare legs and feet. By the time dawn broke on Tuesday, word had spread throughout East Tennessee that the notorious spy Andrews had made good his escape. Newspapers reported the shocking news. The escaped train stealers, one headline read, and carried a detailed description of Andrews. Tall, 180 pounds, short black hair, and heavy black beard, his voice is fine, and his general address good. William Fuller, then in Knoxville to testify in the court-martial proceedings being held there, heard the reports and promptly wired the provost-marshal in Chattanooga, June 3rd, Knoxville. Colonel Henry L. Claiborne, is it possible that the infamous Andrews escaped? Is he pursued? If not, offer in my name one hundred dollars reward for his recapture and reincarceration. William A. Fuller. The conductor might have saved himself the trouble, as Andrews would be arrested before the day was out. Nearly spent from his exertions and unable to find an adequate hideout, he approached a small boy in a dugout Tuesday morning near Moccasin Bend. The poor lad was initially paralyzed with fright at seeing the half-naked, bloody, black-bearded skeleton, but soon recovered and agreed to take Andrews across to Williams Island. Over two miles long and consisting of more than four hundred heavily wooded acres, the island divided the river channel just shy of the entrance to the Tennessee River Gorge. The place was owned by and named for Samuel Williams, whose plantation stood just across the river to the east. Williams was a long-time resident of the area and a wealthy store owner and farmer, referred to by some historians as the father of Chattanooga. Like Andrews, the issue of his loyalty was a complicated one. He claimed to be opposed to secession and later would seek compensation for his activities allegedly supporting the Union cause, but he was also known to serve from time to time as a scout for Confederate cavalryman Nathan Bedford Forrest. At any rate, his actions that day would show him to be no friend of the North, or at least no friend of James Andrews. After hiding again for a time, Andrews at last succumbed to his gnawing hunger and came out in the open. Some accounts would have him ultimately discovered in a small boat, others in the branches of a mulberry tree. The boy in the canoe, still shaken by the encounter, had gone straight to Williams's house and informed him of the strange man, who Williams immediately assumed to be one of the escapees. He found Andrews nearby, wearing only his ragged black coat and a once-white shirt, his feet so swollen and bleeding he could barely walk. Andrews immediately admitted that he was an escaped prisoner, said he had nothing to eat since Sunday, and asked for a meal and some clothes. The man looked as if everything he said was so, Williams recalled, his cheekbones stuck out and his face was pinched with hunger. From here there is some disagreement about how the capture proceeded. Williams, perhaps wanting to shore up his case after the fact that he was a Union man, 
claimed that he merely went for food and clothes for the poor fugitive, only to have two visitors, William I. Standifer and a Kentucky doctor by the name of Craig, come upon Andrews and insist on making him their prisoner. On the contrary, the old soldier Captain Standifer, who several weeks before had seen the raiders stepping off the ferry in Chattanooga and thought them a motley-looking set, would later maintain that Williams had been an active and conniving participant in arresting James Andrews, and had in fact been sweeping the island and the river looking for the fugitives since the day before. Whatever the circumstances and conspirators involved in rounding up Andrews, he was taken to Williams's fine colonnaded home, where he was provided with dry clothes and an excellent supper prepared by Mrs. Williams. During his few hours there he talked openly of his recent escape and wanderings, which Williams would recall as one of the most pitiful stories I ever listened to. Williams's two daughters, aged nine and fourteen, were quite taken with the handsome stranger, and would later remember his lacerated feet, his handsome countenance, his soft, eloquent voice, and the haunting despair of his eyes, as he spoke of his adventures and the girl he planned to marry. Andrews had a pleasant voice, Williams recalled, and could talk the best of any man I ever heard. He was the sort of a person who could make you believe everything he said was the truth. He was an uncommon man, and he showed it. The younger William's daughter used a brush to shoo the flies from the table as their mysterious guest finished his meal, and after he hobbled out to rest in a rocking chair on the porch, both girls implored their father not to return him to prison. But return him they did, his captors saddling Andrews on a mule and walking him back to Chattanooga next day. Andrews had made it twelve miles and been free less than thirty-six hours before being snared by Williams and Standifer, though the source of the hearsay is unclear. Tradition holds that Andrews told Williams as they departed, I am grateful to you for your kindness and hospitality, but you have betrayed me. Certainly the newspapers would see it that way. The Chattanooga rebel ran a story some time later relating the sad story of Andrews's misplaced confidence and asked, who doubts that if Andrews had applied to one of Sam Williams' Negroes instead of Sam Williams himself, that the Negro would have divided his last crust with him and helped him to reach the Federal Army. A rumor reached the prisoners at Swims's jail on Wednesday that Andrews had been captured, and a short time after a strong guard and a rabble of citizens arrived with the man himself, leaving blood behind him at every step. Oh, how our hearts and hopes sank down within us beyond the power of expression, Alf Wilson remembered, later vividly describing his despair. I have seen those dear to me by ties of kindred called away never to return. I have seen comrades die on the field, and without warning sufficient to speak a parting farewell. I have seen a comrade, endeared to me by long association and friendship amid dangers, chained to me and perishing slowly day by day, his proud spirit broken by disease and hunger, until fever's fitful delirium robbed him of the sense of pain. All this I have seen and felt, yet God, in his inscrutable ways and infinite mercy, never laid upon me the heavy, chastening hand of sorrow and anguish that I felt when I beheld the brutal guards bringing in poor, ill-fated Andrews, bound hand and foot in heavy chains. I could have prayed that death had spared me those painful moments, the most harrowing of my life. Andrews was placed back in the hole with his comrades, and they were shocked at his appearance, which was nothing sort of ghastly. He was the most wretched, pitiable human being I ever saw, a sight which horrified us all, and even drew words of compassion from some of the prison guards, Wilson recalled. The change was so startling that it hardly seemed possible that it could have taken place in just three days. He was bloody, bruised, and speechless, his face pale, haggard, and emaciated, and his eyes gave forth a wild, despairing, unnatural light. All in all, Wilson thought, he seemed more dead than alive. Despite his weakened condition, the provost guard would be taking no further chances with Mr. Andrews. Later that evening the trapdoor was opened and three men descended. 
First came old Swims carrying a lantern, followed by an officer wearing a sword, and finally William Lewis, the blacksmith who lived nearby, who had so kindly sent lettuce from his garden to the prisoners. He brought with him a hammer, a pair of crude shackles connected with a heavy chain, and a section of iron to serve as an anvil. One historian would describe Lewis, who everyone called Uncle Billy, as one of the most remarkable Negroes in Chattanooga at that time, or any time, and rightly so. Born into slavery in 1813, he had come to Chattanooga as a young man and learned the trade of a blacksmith and iron worker and set out to build a life for himself and his family. After considerable perseverance, he was able to purchase his freedom and that of his wife for $1,000 each. He then established his own smithy, bought tools and materiel, and hired employees and soon purchased his six-year-old son for $400. He next bought freedom for his elderly uncle and aunt, $150 each, then his two brothers, $1,000 each, and finally his sister, $400. He built a handsome two-story home for his growing family, and his blacksmith shop prospered, though he often had to conduct business with a white man serving as his agent. Having so often used his anvil to forge freedom for and improve the lives of others, he was charged tonight with the sad duty of shackling Andrews and ensuring that his life would soon come to an end. No one spoke as Lewis bent to his work. Andrews lay prone on the filthy floor, with no blanket, resting on one elbow to watch the proceedings, Dorsey recalled. Lewis knelt next to Andrews as he hammered the shackles around his swollen ankles by the feeble light of Swims's lantern. The other prisoners sat or stood in their chained pairs, silently watching what Dorsey would call one of the saddest scenes of our lives. When Lewis finished his work, the three men departed, the trap door above closing behind them with a sickening thud, and any remaining hope seemed to depart with them. The next day, a detail of Confederate soldiers began erecting a scaffold near the jail for Saturday's hanging. In Knoxville, 112 miles away up the East Tennessee and Georgia Railroad, the courts martial of the rest of the party were by now under way. The twelve raiders had been taken to the old Knoxville jail, a massive stone edifice then used to hold military prisoners, where they were housed in large iron cages, though there was no crowding and suffocation like they had experienced in Chattanooga. This place was a great improvement on any we had endured, William Pittenger recalled, and we spent the days in comparative pleasure and in a great degree of hope. Also incarcerated at the Knoxville prison were a number of dangerous East Tennessee Unionists, including G. W. Barlow and Peter Pierce, who had suffered a mighty cleaving blow to his skull with the barrel of a gun, leaving a permanent vertical scar, more of a trench, really, in his forehead from nose to hairline. His compatriots affectionately called him forked head or old gun barrel, and he presented the singular combination of great piety and great profanity, singing hymns and cursing the Confederacy with equal zeal, Pittenger remembered. In a neighboring cage, his notoriety earning him a cell of his own, was Captain David Fry, the East Tennessee guerrilla leader, who had at last been apprehended by the Confederates and was awaiting a trial of his own. The Andrews Raiders became acquainted with Fry and the other East Tennesseans by writing notes on the margins of newspapers and passing them back and forth. Afterward, he came to be virtually one of our number, to which position we were the readier to admit him, as he also had been a bridge burner and far more successful than ourselves, Pittenger recalled. Again, the defendants managed to come up with capable and perhaps even prominent defense counsel in the form of a well-respected Knoxville judge, Oliver P. Temple, and his law partner, John Baxter, future U.S. District Judge for the Eastern District. Pittenger deserves credit for securing their services, having opened a dialogue by sending a note to Judge Temple asking if he could borrow a book on evidence upon their arrival. The firm of Temple and Baxter agreed to the engagement for a fee of $150 per case, each defendant giving his note for that sum to be due and payable upon acquittal. This fee arrangement was in some respects illusory. The two lawyers certainly did not expect to be paid, but given the suspicion and persecution that was often heaped on Union-friendly Tennesseans, 
it was thought that their own safety required that their help should appear to be purely professional. The proceedings were convened in the old courthouse, and they were conducted with an air of informality and indifference that would suggest that the outcome was a foregone conclusion. Indeed, at least one Confederate officer posted in Knoxville would later assert that he had refused to serve as a member of what he regarded as a kangaroo court. The table around which the court sat was covered with bottles, newspapers, and novels, and the members occupied themselves during the proceedings in discussing these, Pittenger wrote. All this was very well if the object was, as they assured us, merely to put formally on the record our true character as prisoners of war, but it was most heartless if the trial was in earnest and a matter of life or death. The court considered testimony from only two witnesses, first, the hero, Conductor William Fuller, who testified as to the theft, pursuit, and recapture of the engine, and the raider William Pittenger, who essentially filled in the rest. He would maintain down the years that he had testified only at the request of, and in accordance with the wishes and direction of his comrades, seeking to assist the defense, but if this was the goal, he was far from successful. The impression upon my mind at the time was that the witness was in the interest of the prosecution, and indeed was, Fuller later wrote, but from his statement it was by agreement, and that the testimony he gave in was previously agreed upon by all the prisoners as the theory less dangerous. Fuller went on to recount the evidence. Mr. Pittenger swore to who the prisoners were, that they were United States soldiers, that they, or a part of them, had been detailed, etc., as later stated in his book, while I swore to what they did and when, how and where they did it, that they were dressed as citizens when they came on my train at Marietta, and that they claimed to be refugees from Kentucky, and that they were going from Marietta to Big Shanty, then Camp MacDonald, to join the Confederate Army, etc., and etc. I also swore that the defendants took my train and engine in the midst of a military camp, Confederate camp of instruction, and that when they did so they were dressed as citizens and represented themselves to me as such. This was considered by the Confederate side as a good prima facie case, but they had a good case beyond doubt when the character of all the prisoners was given by Pittenger. The Raiders' counsel, Judge Temple, did not see it that way. In post-war years he defended the character and testimony of Corporal Pittenger, who he said had testified in the case under compulsion and certainly not voluntarily. In other words, Temple later wrote, he did not turn state's evidence, but was put on the stand by the prosecuting attorney, with no promise of pardon to him, and when on the stand he testified to such a state of facts as we desired, and which we thought sufficient to acquit you all. Pittenger argued, as planned, that the Ohio soldiers were detailed on a military expedition by General Mitchell and denied that they were spies. Temple noted that he had consulted with the other prisoners every day during the course of the proceedings, and that none complained of Pittenger's conduct. The problem was not the witness, but the court itself, which Temple described as blinded and predetermined to convict. We believed all the time that you would be convicted, so maddened were the men at the time, he wrote. Fuller, too, was willing to take at face value Pittenger's claim that he had by agreement been nominated the mouthpiece for the whole party of prisoners, concluding that no improper motive could be imputed to him. But I must say that the position assumed by the defense was extremely dangerous, Fuller concluded, and I cannot see how it was hoped to maintain it. The raiders were tried one at a time, one per day, their request for a consolidation of their cases into one proceeding having been denied at the outset, perhaps due to what one historian would call the manifest absurdity of trying a group of a dozen men on charges of secretly lurking and spying. Just as Judge Brabson had for Andrews in Chattanooga, the raiders' attorneys Temple and Baxter put on a spirited defense, their written plea being an able paper, as Pittenger put it, and one worthy of their subsequent fame. There was no question, they said, that these were United States soldiers acting under orders on a military mission, though the charges carefully omitted any mention of train-stealing or bridge-burning or any other action that might give the impression of soldiers on a raid. Temple and Baxter asserted that the entire case came down to a complaint that the defendants had been dressed in civilian clothes instead of their uniforms. This was a common tactic employed by the Confederates themselves, the lawyers argued, 
noting that literally tens of thousands of soldiers in the southern ranks did not have uniforms at all, and that guerrilla bands in homespun clothes regularly attacked federal supply lines and outposts. They pointed in particular to the celebrated exploits of Confederate General John Hunt Morgan, whose men had donned federal uniforms, no less, as part of a raid to destroy northern railroads. Some of these Confederates had been captured and treated as prisoners of war. The defendants in the present case, upon their capture, had freely and plainly told the object of their mission, which was purely military, and as such authorized by the usages of warfare. The exact course of the argument, and the way in which it was refuted and received by the court, is unclear, as no record exists of the court-martial proceedings themselves, but the defense case was, in the words of the U.S. judge advocate who later reviewed the trial, a just and unanswerable presentation, and the raiders entertained high hopes that they would be acquitted of the charge of spying. After the trials of seven of the twelve raiders held in Knoxville had been completed, the court-martial was adjourned because of another military threat to Chattanooga, followed by an approach by Union forces under General George W. Morgan to the gates of Knoxville itself. The first movement stopped the trials. The second rendered our speedy removal necessary, Pittenger recalled. The evidence and arguments of the Knoxville courts-martial would remain unknown for the time being, and the subject of bitter debate in the years to come, but if the course of the trials of William Campbell, Samuel Robertson, Marion Ross, John Scott, Perry Shadrach, Samuel Slavins, and George D. Wilson remains in controversy even today, there was no uncertainty about the outcome, which was duly reported and in time approved by the War Department in Richmond. General Orders, Headquarters Department of East Tennessee, Number 54, Knoxville, June 14, 1862. At a general court-martial held at Knoxville, by virtue of general orders, numbers 21 and 34, department headquarters, April 15th and May 10th, 1862, whereof Lieutenant Colonel J.B. Bibb of the 23rd Regiment Alabama Volunteers was president, was tried. William Campbell, Private, Company K, 2nd Ohio Regiment, on the following charge and specifications to wit, charge, violation of Section 2 of the 101st Article of the Rules and Articles of War, Specification 1, in this that the said William Campbell, Private Company K, not owing allegiance to the Confederate States of America, did, on or about the seventh day of April 1862, leave the Army of the United States, then lying near Shelbyville, Tennessee, and with a company of about twenty other soldiers of the U.S. Army, all dressed in citizens' clothes, repair to Chattanooga, Tennessee, entering covertly within the lines of the Confederate forces at that post, and did thus, on or about the eleventh day of April, 1862, lurk as a spy in and about the encampments of said forces, representing himself as a citizen of Kentucky going to join the Southern Army. Specification 2. And the said William Campbell, Private Company K, 2nd Ohio Regiment, U.S. Army, thus dressed in citizen's clothes and representing himself as a citizen of Kentucky going to join the Southern Army, and did proceed by railroad to Marietta, Georgia, thus covertly passed through the lines of the Confederate forces stationed at Chattanooga, Dalton, and Camp MacDonald, and did thus, on or about the eleventh day of April, 1862, lurk as a spy in and about the said encampments of the Confederate forces at the places stated aforesaid to which charge and specifications the prisoner pled not guilty. The court, after mature deliberation, find the accused as follows, of the first specification of the charge, guilty, of the second specification of the charge, guilty, and guilty of the charge. And the court therefore sentenced the accused, the said William Campbell, Private Company K, 2nd Ohio Regiment, two-thirds of the members concurring therein, as soon as this order shall be made public, to be hung by the neck until he is dead. James Andrews seemed to abandon all hope after his recapture. His usually mild disposition became more mild, and his voice more plaintive, Dorsey remembered. Though strict security was maintained, Andrews was soon afforded various small liberties and privileges, the markings of a doomed man. He was brought into the upper room of the jail, where there was more light and less filth, as one raider put it, 
and allowed to meet with a local minister. He read from a borrowed Bible and spent long hours in silence, apparently in deep meditation, Dorsey thought, over his tragic end, now so near at hand. The raiders respected this quietude. There was no singing, no jokes or arguments among the prisoners, and little conversation in the small dungeon. Andrews was furnished with a pen, paper, and ink, along with a book to press down on so that he could write any final correspondence. He wrote a long letter to his friend D. S. McGavick, describing his misfortune and leaving instructions for the disposition of his affairs back in Flemingsburg. One might think, from these arrangements, that McGavick was a lawyer or a businessman. In fact, he was a bartender at a local tavern. The letter and its enclosures would be filed with the court clerk in Fleming County, Kentucky, and duly probated as Andrews's last will and testament. Dear sir, he began, you will doubtless be surprised to hear from me from this place, and more surprised to hear that I am to be executed on the seventh instant for attempting to run a train of cars from the Western and Atlantic Railroad to Huntsville for the use of General Mitchell. He briefly described the raiders' flight on and from the locomotive, their subsequent capture, and his recent escape and recapture. The sentence seems a hard one for the crime proven against me, he continued, but I suppose the court that tried me thought otherwise. I have now calmly submitted to my fate and have been earnestly preparing to meet my God in peace, and have found that peace of mind and tranquility of soul which even astonishes myself. I have never supposed a man could feel so complete a change under similar circumstances. He asked that McGavick acquaint my friends with my fate, left regards for his landlord and landlady back home with hopes that they would meet in heaven some day, and noted that he had written several letters to Flemingsburg but had received none in return. What the fate of the balance of the party will be I am unable to say, but I hope they will not share the fate of their leader, he wrote. Hoping we may meet in that better country, I bid you a long and last farewell. In a postscript, he left instructions for a large lady's trunk left in the care of the proprietor of the Louisville Hotel to be retrieved and presented to his fiancée, Miss Elizabeth Layton. The raiders were roused early on Saturday, June 7th, the scheduled date for Andrews's execution, and again escorted to the railroad station to board a train headed south. Why this change was so suddenly made in the program I have never been able to discover, Alf Wilson wrote years later. The reason, as it turned out, was that elements of Mitchell's third division at last appeared to be advancing on Chattanooga. Ormsby Mitchell had been trying to hold his own in northern Alabama for the past several weeks, plagued all the while by cavalry raids from without and discipline problems within his own command. Mitchell's position in northern Alabama was at all times precarious, one of his officers later wrote. He covered too much country, lacked concentration, and was constantly in danger of being assailed in detail. Besides, his relations to Buell, his immediate commander, were not cordial. The beleaguered astronomer-general soon found himself accused not only of military incompetence, but also wanton and disgraceful personal conduct, not to mention outright corruption. Foremost among these criticisms was his handling of, and a public rumor that he had acquiesced in, the infamous sack of Athens, Alabama, by soldiers from the 8th Brigade under Colonel John Basil Turchin. I shuts mine eyes for two hours— the czarist officer had announced in the presence of his troops, who proceeded to plunder the town and terrorize its inhabitants on May 2nd, according to the Muscovite custom, as one Union officer put it. Mitchell chastised Turchin over the incident, but refused to punish anyone. He could hardly arraign an entire brigade, he said, and he summarily rejected the aggrieved townspeople's claims for compensation, which totaled what he skeptically called the very large sum of $54,689.80. He reported that he did order a thorough search of the brigade's baggage, and each soldier's knapsack, though not surprisingly, nothing unauthorized was discovered. There has not been found in American history so black a page as that which will bear the record of General Mitchell's campaign in North Alabama. Brigadier General and future President James A. Garfield wrote of the shameful outrages that had occurred in Athens. But the furor that erupted over this ugly incident, which culminated in a month-long court-martial of Turchin, would not be the only attack made on the character and competence of General Mitchell. 
Later that summer, one newspaper accused him of speculating in sales of cotton his troops had seized from southern citizens, though Old Stars promptly refuted the charges by delivering copies of his orders and correspondence over the issue, including his orders from Buell to encourage the trade in cotton and his open correspondence with the Secretary of the Treasury over the practice. In some instances, his soldiers had incorporated confiscated cotton bales in fortifications and in one case even used them to construct an ingenious floating bridge. In addition, Halleck and Buell also complained that Mitchell had foolishly burned bridges over the Tennessee River, though Buell himself had ordered that they be torched. I spared the Tennessee bridges near Stevenson, in the hope I might be permitted to march on Chattanooga or Knoxville, but now am ordered to burn the bridges, Mitchell had written to Chase in late April. I do not comprehend the order, but must obey it as early as I can. These attacks by editors, military rivals, and politicians, although annoying, did not appear to diminish the prominence or the prospects of the Ohio general, at least in his own eyes. Mitchell's star of fame reached the height of its ascendancy on May 10th, when his portrait graced the cover of Harper's Weekly. The accompanying article, which misspelled his name throughout, adding a superfluous L at the end, briefly recounted his brilliant exploits in northern Alabama, and described him as one of our most dashing and splendid generals. No one believed these descriptions more than Mitchell himself. One week later, at a strawberry supper at the home of Union loyal Judge George W. Lane of Huntsville, Old Stars monopolized the conversation, Colonel John Beatty recalled, determined to make all understand that he was the greatest of living soldiers. Despite his continued clashes with his superiors, and the absence of railroad bridges between here and there, Mitchell continued to regard the capture of Chattanooga as a laudable and achievable goal. If the Secretary of War could now bestow sufficient confidence in my ability to execute what I undertake, he wrote his fellow Ohioan Salmon Chase in late April, let him give me another division and authorize my advance upon Chattanooga. That advance such as it was, was finally in progress even as the doomed Andrews pondered the Gospels and drafted his will. At the end of May, Mitchell ordered Brigadier General James Negley, a Pennsylvania horticulturist and future U.S. congressman, to lead an expedition from Fayetteville in Middle Tennessee and push southeast toward Chattanooga, with authority to take the town in case he deems prudent. Brushing aside rebel cavalry along the way through Winchester, Jasper, and Shellmound, Negley arrived at the river opposite Chattanooga on June 7th and commenced a somewhat desultory but nonetheless terrifying artillery bombardment. For three hours that afternoon and six hours on Sunday the 8th, Negley's four-and-a-half-inch parrot guns lobbed shells into the streets of Chattanooga, all through Market Street and over the town and far beyond the Crutchfield House, one soldier wrote. According to another Confederate, the frightful whizzing of the shell as they fell rapidly near the dwelling of some families near the vicinity of the ferry produced the greatest consternation among the women and children who were seen running in every direction from the river to the center of the town in the wildest of terror, while the most heart-rending cries and screams of others in the houses frantically illustrated the horrors of war. The Confederate command in East Tennessee thought the sky was falling, Convinced by a combination of the Federal show of force and some faulty intelligence that the action signaled nothing less than the long-awaited invasion of East Tennessee, Major General E. Kirby Smith got off a panicky wire to Georgia Governor Joseph E. Brown reporting that Chattanooga is threatened by so superior a force that its evacuation seems almost inevitable, and he gave orders to General Ledbetter to retreat in the direction of Knoxville if he could not hold the town. Nothing came of Negley's advance in the end. He lacked pontoons or gunboats, carried few supplies, and had no plans for and presently no intention of actually taking and holding the town. But this did not stop him from proclaiming a triumph. His superior, General Mitchell, did the same, reporting that the expedition to Chattanooga was a complete success, claiming that Negley drove the rebels out of town. The New York Times echoed this dispatch, a headline reporting the complete success of the expedition to East Tennessee. 
but by June 10th, Negley was gone, inflicting negligible damage on the town and leaving the overmatched Confederates in place and for the most part unscathed. Some would later claim that Negley did more harm than good to the Union cause due to depredations committed by his troops on the locals in East Tennessee. Chattanooga remained in Confederate hands and would not be captured by Union forces until Braxton Bragg abandoned the city in the fall of 1863. Some would later glorify Negley's artillery demonstration as the so-called First Battle of Chattanooga, though most histories apply the more realistic and appropriately dismissive title of Negley's Raid. Still, the approach of Union troops ignited another panic in the mountain city, which led to the relocation of Andrews to Atlanta just hours before he was to be hung. We were soon whirling along on that same, to us, accursed railroad, for it brought no pleasant memories to us, Alf Wilson remembered, noting that Andrews was reminded and taunted at every station of his approaching doom. The spy, who was not chained to any other prisoner, asked Wilson to go to the coach's water closet and open the window as high as possible. Wilson and Wood, chained together, shuffled down the aisle to the closet and tried to do just that, but the tiny window was shuttered and would only open about six inches. Andrews received the news with a look of sad disappointment, Wilson recalled. It was his last hope. The sharp cry of the train's whistle startled the raiders, though they had been listening for it, and the engine's bell rang out what seemed to Dorsey like a death knell as they slowed for Atlanta. The train pulled into the car shed at about four o'clock, the sun still standing high in the June sky. The ten prisoners were taken from the station and marched under heavy guard across Peachtree Street, to a three-story building known as the Concert Hall, the still-hobbled Andrews jangling and scraping along in his chains. The clank-clank of the shackles on Andrews' feet as he trudged along on the pavement seemed to sound in my ears yet, Dorsey wrote years later. They climbed the stairs to the second floor and were seated on a row of wooden benches, all except for Mark Wood, who was feeling ill and lay down. The men together sat in silence, not wanting to disturb Andrews as he sat in mute reflection. The quiet was broken as the sheriff, Colonel Oliver H. Jones, clambered up the stairs, dressed in a fine, funereal black suit. He stood in the open door and spoke gently to the Kentuckian, quite as if he were inviting him to dinner. "'Come on now, Mr. Andrews,' he said. Without a word, Andrews stood and firmly shook the hand of each one of his comrades. He then turned and clanked his way out the door and down the steps into the street below, dragging his chains behind him like a Dickensian spook. The nine soldiers watched out the windows as he clumsily pulled himself into an open carriage drawn by two horses. Colonel Jones climbed in beside him, and the carriage, followed by a large detail of mounted soldiers and a motley crowd of citizens, rolled away. That was the last we saw of Andrews, brave, noble, true-hearted Andrews as grand a man as ever gave up his life for the starry flag of the free, Dorsey wrote. Reverend W. J. Scott, the pastor of Wesley Chapel, later the First Methodist Church of Atlanta, was standing in the broad sunlight at the corner of Decatur and Peachtree Streets when a column of soldiers approached and an open carriage containing Colonel Jones and the famous spy James Andrews pulled up next to him. The colonel asked if Reverend Scott would come along and officiate as chaplain at Mr. Andrews's execution. He politely declined. I replied that I disliked to witness an execution of the sword and suggested that he procure some other minister, the pastor recalled. But a direct appeal from the condemned man changed his mind. Andrews looked steadily at Reverend Scott and said quietly, I would be glad to have you go. Feeling that he could not refuse such an earnest request, the preacher climbed in the carriage and sat next to Andrews for the ride to the gallows. It was a beautiful afternoon for an execution. How well do I remember that lovely June day Mrs. Joseph M. Wostoff would write more than forty years later. A young girl at the time, she stood at her front gate and watched the parade pass by, one of hundreds of Atlantans who came out to witness the grim occasion. It was quiet no sound except for the tramp of the soldiers, she remembered. It was one of our first realizations of the extreme horrors of war, and seemingly a feeling of depression or gloom hung over the city, she remembered. 
Though some Southerners had in the past days and hours taunted the Yankee captives and called for them to be hanged, those standing along the road seemed respectful, even reverent, now that the moment was at hand. The procession rolled slowly northward up Peachtree Street, taking Andrews outside of the city, a mile and a half from five points along the north-south ridge that formed the city's spine then and does so now. The carriage was escorted by a file of soldiers on either side and followed by a vast multitude of people of all colors, sexes, and conditions, Reverend Scott remembered. The spy looked worn and haggard after his ordeal of the past few days, and he spoke quietly with the pastor about his history and adventures. Andrews said that he was a native of West Virginia, that his parents were strict Presbyterians who were now living in Missouri. In reply to a question of mine, he said he had no family, although he added, with a slight tremor in his voice, that he was to have been married on the 17th of June, Scott said. He disclaimed all personal enmity to the Southern people, but said that he was a Union man and he regarded the expedition he conducted as a legitimate military expedition. He was willing, however, to abide his fate. Like any good man of the cloth, Scott spoke of eternal salvation and inquired about Andrews's readiness for death. Andrews replied that recently in his great and sore trouble he had tried to seek God. Scott told the prisoner that he would be permitted to make a statement before his execution. Andrews said he would prefer to keep silent and ask that Reverend Scott speak on his behalf. Upon our arrival at the place of execution, we found a very large assemblage eager to witness the horrors of the gibbet, Scott later wrote. The site of the scaffold, which is today a busy downtown street corner, was in those days largely hidden in the dense woods a few yards from a country road. The gallows, a wobbly platform standing on two posts with a simple trap, had been erected at the center of a natural amphitheater. Guards had cordoned off a perimeter about forty feet from the gallows. The assembled crowd whispered and jostled for position behind the rope as young men and boys in the rear shinnied up trees to get a better view. The doomed Kentuckian stumbled down from his conveyance. A nice carriage, Mrs. Wostoff insisted, and no rickety old hack, as has been reported, and was assisted up onto the platform. And well do I remember Andrews as he calmly looked around at the crowd, his pale white face, black hair and long black whiskers, Mrs. Wostoff wrote. A reporter in the crowd thought Andrews seemed to be very penitent, was composed till he came on the scaffold when a slight tremor was perceptible. There was a brief delay as Lieutenant James Barnes of the Provost Guard sent a local boy, 14-year-old H. I. McConnell, scampering over to the nearby home of Mr. A. K. Spago to ask for a cloth to cover the prisoner's face. The lad returned moments later, Mrs. Spago having offered up one of her pillowcases. Andrews declined this rather undignified death mask, asking instead that a simple handkerchief be placed over his eyes. Everything being prepared, after a moment's conference with the prisoner, during which I told him I should not remain to see the execution, I ascended the scaffold to address the multitude, Scott said. There was perfect order, no jeers, no taunts, no unseemly behavior to mar the deep solemnity of the occasion. Reverend Scott spoke as directed on Andrews's behalf, as nearly as possible in his own words, though neither Scott nor any other witness recorded those words for posterity. A word of prayer was had, and Scott leaned in close to Andrews, softly reminding him that in God solely was his help. With that the minister bade the condemned man farewell, stepped down from the scaffold, and walked back to the city, never turning back. It was just as well that he did not stay to see the terrible scene that followed, one so grisly that it would have been darkly comical had it not been the stuff of nightmares. The noose was put in place, and Andrews turned and gave his watch and watch chain to Colonel Jones. The provost marshal gave the signal, and the platform dropped. Andrews fell, and the rope snapped taut, but only for a moment. Then the cord began to stretch, swaying and creaking like an old staircase, and Andrews's dangling feet found the ground below him. He kicked desperately in the dust, gurgling, gasping, straining to save his own life. One of the provost's guardsmen rushed in and shouldered him to the side, pushing him off the ground and choking him once again, while another guard fell on all fours and began clawing at the dirt beneath Andrews's feet. 
The gasps of the assembled witnesses gave way to cries for mercy, and ladies and men alike averted their eyes as the horror continued, Andrews a sickly marionette bobbing and jerking on a single string. James Squires, a W&A railroad man who had scaled a hickory tree to see the show that day, was certain that Andrews's neck had not been broken. Instead, he was merely strangled. His nemesis, William Fuller, was there in the crowd, playing the role of Javert to Andrews's Jean Valjean to the final curtain, seeing the thing through from the pursuit to the trial in Chattanooga to the hanging. Somewhere along the way, Fuller's initial and admirable determination to recover his engine hardened into a desire for vengeance and would, down the years, sour into something dark and unbecoming. On the scaffold, Andrews did not show much strength of character, Fuller would write as an old man, looking back on that day. I have never thought he died bravely. The conductor was the only person among the many witnesses that day who ever said such a thing, and although they were not present, the raider's view of the terrible event was recorded by Daniel Allen Dorsey. Andrews died without a murmur, like the hero that he was, he wrote. Other witnesses recorded the drama as nothing more than a sad end for a young man who must have exercised bad judgment along the way. A man was hung here today, Samuel P. Richards wrote in his diary. His name was Andrews, and he was executed as a spy by military authority. Poor fellow. He ought to have engaged in a better business. As the afternoon light faded, Andrews's body was cut down and placed in a crude wooden coffin, his ankles still cuffed and chained by Uncle Billy's shackles. A burial party carried the box some forty yards down the hill to what one Atlantan would call a ready-made grave, a hole under the roots of a pine tree recently knocked down by a storm. For many days thereafter, curiosity seekers by the dozen came to visit the grave of the notorious locomotive thief. Mrs. Wustoff related the story of one such group of macabre sightseers, one of whom pushed his walking cane down through the still loose soil until it touched the lid of coffin. A peculiar sound followed. The young man threw a fit and had to be carried to his home by his companions, Mrs. Wustoff wrote. After that sensational episode, it was a deserted grave. And an unmarked grave as well, one that would soon be lost, not only in a snarl of blackberry and wild roses, but also among the thousands of graves of war dead, known and unknown, that would soon come to Atlanta. The papers reported the execution matter-of-factly next day. The Southern Confederacy's article, for example, simply noted that, after a feeling prayer and a few seasonable words of counsel from the three ministers present, Andrews was launched into eternity. Thus ended the life of this daring adventurer who, according to his own confession, was playing into the hands of both parties in the war to make gain, always, however, in the confidence of the enemy, but he was convicted of being a spy. No mention was made of the botched hanging. It was the sort of unfortunate accident, a sad and freakish turn of events that is best forgotten. After all, such a scene was unlikely to ever happen again. Word of James J. Andrews's untimely end reached his adopted hometown of Flemingsburg, Kentucky, about 325 crow flight miles due north of Atlanta, within a few days of the execution. The Southern Confederacy's account of the spy being launched into eternity was promptly reprinted in a number of northern newspapers, including the Cincinnati commercial where it was seen by a relative of Andrews's fiancée, Elizabeth Layton. Her family had heard of Andrews's harrowing adventures and had done their best to keep the news of his peril from young Betsy, but now, just one week before the couple was to have been married, they had no choice but to tell her the truth. They handed her the newspaper to read for herself. She did so without making a sound, then turned quietly and left the room. She returned hours later, looking drawn and pale, and those present thought the light had gone out of her eyes. Some weeks later, a large, elegant trunk was delivered from Louisville, just as Andrews had instructed. No one knows what thoughts may have passed through Miss Layton's grieving mind as she stood before the trunk and lifted the lid. The trunk was empty. Elizabeth Layton was never the same after that. 
Once a charming, social young lady, she became morose and withdrawn, and her health rapidly deteriorated. Her family reported that she took little interest in anything. Her mind, they said, was obviously shaken. Within two years, she was dead. Her family insisted ever after that she had died of a broken heart. Chapter 13 Heaven or Cincinnati? Atlanta Boys, tell them at home, if any of you escaped, that I died for my country and did not regret it. Sergeant Major Marion A. Ross, 2nd Ohio Even as Andrews's body was being lowered into its shallow grave, the eight Ohio soldiers who had so recently tried and failed to save his life were taken from the barracks at the concert hall and moved to their new quarters. It was nearly dusk. The dirt streets were crowded with horses and wagons, remnants of the depot traffic and the day's commerce, and the sidewalks were bustling with people heading to and from the trains or on their way out to enjoy the warm Saturday evening. Mark Wood was sick with fever and kept holding up the bedraggled column, pleading for stops to rest until his chainmate Alf Wilson finally picked him up and carried him the rest of the way. They were marched about six blocks southeast to the Fulton County Jail, which stood at the northeast corner of Fraser and Fair Streets, known today as Memorial Drive. The two-story prison was yet another brick-walled edifice, but one the raiders found it to be a more pretentious structure than we had yet occupied. Built in 1855, the box-like jail aspired to be a castle, with a cornice and parapet above giving it the appearance of a squatty, squared-off rook tucked in a fenced-off corner of the chessboard. The first floor, which provided accommodations for the jailer and his family, was bisected by an east-west hallway extending through the building with locked doors front and rear. A stairway on the right side of the hall led up to a similar central corridor on the second floor. There, four cells, each about sixteen feet by sixteen feet, were used for confinement, two on each side of the hallway. In two of the cells was a stout iron cage, as Wilson remembered, similar to that which Barnum used to carry the big rhinoceros in. The cell walls were panelled inside with oak planking spiked to the brick beyond, the windows strongly barred with iron, their lintels and sills made of granite from nearby Stone Mountain, the double cell doors, an inner one of riveted iron bars and an outer one of hardwood, hung on massive hinges and sealed by heavy locks. From this imperfect description of our prison, Wilson wrote, the reader will see that the prospect of our breaking out was not the best, though perhaps not impossible, as we shall see. The eight men were placed in the southwest cell, and shortly thereafter were given one welcome accommodation. The authorities, with apparent confidence in the sturdy construction of the jail and the alertness and ability of the guards, removed the handcuffs, collars, and trace chains the Ohioans had worn for more than six weeks. This was a great relief, Wilson recalled. We had worn them so long in couples that we would find ourselves involuntarily at times following each other about as if still compelled to do so by chains. The raiders were housed in the open part of the cell by day and confined to the rhinoceros cage at night. They slept in a tight circle with their heads in the center, resting on a single bed tick of straw. Although it was summer, they lacked blankets, and on some nights found the iron floor of the cage painfully cold. Again their rations were meager and disgusting, spoiled bacon, cornbread often with the cob ground right in, negro peas liberally seasoned with tiny insects, almost enough to convulse the stomach of a hungry dog, Wilson said, but they ate every morsel. Speaking from experience, Wilson later recorded his observation that man— when forced to it, is as ravenous, reckless, unreasonable, and brutish in his appetite as the lowest form of animal creation. Mark Wood, his thin body racked with illness and fever, suffered much in their first days in the jail. Some among the party later admitted to wondering whether it would be a merciful kindness to let him die of disease rather than survive only to suffer a more hideous fate. They tried to rally the poor Englishman by needling him relentlessly, Mark, if I were you, I would not try to get well, they told him. You can, by dying, save the rebels the trouble of hanging you. 
In response, Wood would cackle wildly and say he was determined to recover just to spite them. A few days after Andrews's hanging, the eight soldiers received word that their comrades, who had been sent to Knoxville for trial, had arrived in Atlanta and would soon be joining them. The Knoxville contingent, consisting of the twelve men from Andrews's party and a number of the East Tennessee loyalists, including Captain David Fry, arrived at the car shed on a delightful afternoon and were met by what one historian would describe as a curious, if not hostile, mob, though one among the assembled throng seemed hostile indeed. A man who supposedly identified himself as the mayor of Atlanta, but who they later determined to be Colonel Jones, began to insult Captain Fry, telling him that he knew him well, that he was a great rascal, and that he hoped soon to have the pleasure of hanging him, Pittenger recalled. Then, turning to us, he boasted that he had put the rope around Andrews's neck and was waiting and anxious to do the same for us. After this unsettling welcome, the prisoners left the depot and were marched to the jail. The insulting mob did not follow us, Pittenger recalled, and as we looked upon the beautiful residences which we passed, everything seemed so calm and peaceful that it was difficult to realize our perilous position. The Knoxville dozen— along with David Fry, were placed in the northeast cell, the remainder of the East Tennesseans, including G. W. Barlow and Old Gun Barrel Pierce, were locked up across the hall. The Fulton County jailer was a kindly older gentleman named Turner, who Pittenger recalled as a union man at heart, who sympathized with the northern prisoners. His assistant, in contrast, was an odious old man known to the raiders as Thor or Thower, who saw to it that the Federals were given scanty rations and few privileges. Still, they passed their first week in their new surroundings in comparative ease and with cautious hope for the future. Certainly their day-to-day -day surroundings had improved since Swims's underground dungeon, and the guards were now talking openly of their belief that Andrews was the only one to be executed and that the remainder would be spared and exchanged. There was no word of any further court-martialing, Pittenger later wrote, and those of our number who believed our lives would be spared made converts seemingly of all the rest. This was true with certain exceptions, foremost among them being Marion Ross. The sandy-haired sergeant major exhibited none of the optimism or spirit so prevalent in his companions of late. Instead, he was ever mournful and pessimistic, so much so that his fellow soldiers feared that he had suffered some injury of mind in the course of their recent hardships. Others later surmised that Ross, being a Freemason, may have along the way received some secret intelligence from one of his Masonic brethren, warning him of the trouble ahead. Their new companion, Fry, likewise held no illusions as to what was in store. Al Dorsey, who was always seeking to convince the others that escape was their only hope, seemed to sense this, and he asked the East Tennessee guerrilla what he thought their chances were if they remained in the hands of the rebels. With a broad smile, Dorsey recalled, the captain replied that he thought we would surely be executed unless we could by some means break our confinement and escape. His listeners put a good deal of stock in this answer. Fry was an intelligent man and a southerner himself, after all, and should know his own people. But others, especially George D. Wilson, were absolutely incredulous at the idea that the raiders could possibly face execution for spying. Why, the possibility that we could be treated as spies seemed to him so absurd that he was all out of patience to those who took the opposite view, Dorsey said. Wednesday, June eighteenth, dawned warm and clear in Atlanta, a bright and lovely day, Dorsey recalled. The Andrews Raiders, now twenty in number, with their leader eleven days in the grave and John Wallam either still at large or dead himself, passed the morning hours engaged in their customary entertainments, playing games and arguing over the course of the war and the enemy's intentions. Several among the party had been troubled by bad dreams the night before, especially George Wilson and a few of the others who had been tried at Knoxville. Though no one among the party was particularly superstitious, they related their nightmares to their comrades as they flipped cards from a borrowed dog-eared deck. They had dreamed of being in muddy sloughs in miry places, Dorsey remembered, some had seen great piles of fresh-dug earth, where great trenches had been opened in the ground. It was early afternoon, perhaps two o'clock, when the card-playing and checkers were interrupted by a clatter in the street outside heralding the arrival of a body of cavalry. 
Presently a group of officers clumped up the stairs, sabers clanking, along with the jailers Turner and Thor, and an ominous gaggle of black-gowned ministers hovering behind. Turner unlocked the door of the cell across the way and ushered the group of East Tennessee loyalists held there out into the corridor. Then the Northwest cell was opened, and the names of the seven men tried at Knoxville were called to account. William Campbell, Samuel Robertson, Marion A. Ross, John Scott, Perry G. Shadrach, Samuel Slavens, and George D. Wilson— the six Union soldiers and their giant civilian companion Campbell stepped forward, though Robertson was ill, laid low by a blazing fever, and had to be helped to his feet. The seven were taken to the vacated cell across the hall, and the intervening doors slammed shut. All was silent for a moment, Dorsey said. Then we heard a voice, as if someone were reading in a rather subdued or solemn tone, or perhaps praying. The muffled voice they heard was, of course, the announcement of the judgment of the court-martial and the sentence to be imposed. The order provided that the executions were to take place between the 15th and the 22nd day of June, but the Confederate authorities had apparently learned their lesson from the one-week warning that had been given to Andrews and his subsequent escape. There would be no delays this time, now that the order was received. The provost-marshal had scarcely finished reading the sentence— to be hung by the neck until he is dead, when the arms of the seven men were bound before them. Leading the group of ministers was the Reverend W. J. Scott, who again found himself summoned by the authorities to take part in bearing what he called unwelcome tidings to the unsuspecting condemned. He had brought with him his friend Reverend G. N. MacDonald, the pastor of Trinity Church, who also did not care for executions. He came along on the sole condition— a rather peculiar one for a spiritual counselor to require that Scott would agree to do all the talking. Some accounts suggest that a third minister was also present, though his identity is unknown. The ministers had an initial exchange with the always outspoken George Wilson, who again protested that the raiders should be treated as prisoners of war, and complained of the method of execution. We would not care so much to be shot as soldiers, but to be hanged like a dog is a burning shame, he said. Young gentlemen, Reverend Scott replied, we are not here to discuss the justice or injustice of the court's action. That is a matter over which we have no control. We have visited you as ministers of the gospel for the sole purpose of helping you by our prayers and counsels to prepare for death, and it is my painful duty to tell you that the hour is at hand. The Methodist pastor was impressed with the handsome appearance of the seven, they struck me at once as a body of remarkably fine-looking men, he said, though upon the announcement of their sentence every cheek blanched to the lily's whiteness. His spiritual work was cut out for him that day. None among the doomed men identified themselves as church members, and only one said he prayed, sometimes, but not regularly. Nevertheless, Reverend Scott had reassuring words for all, I then remarked that we were all forgetful of God and duty, but that He was merciful and long-suffering, and while the time for preparation was short, if they were truly penitent, God could save them as well in an hour as in a twelve-month, he remembered. The minister recited a few passages of Scripture applicable to their condition, and then all knelt in prayer. They were returned across the hall to their comrades, already pale as death, as Dorsey recalled, we are to be executed immediately, George Wilson whispered. He took advantage of the few moments he had left to deliver words of warning and hard realization to his friends. He had been completely deceived, he said, utterly mistaken in ever thinking that they would be released or exchanged. The rest of you will go the same way, he said. He also had a word for Pittenger. Like most of the raiders, Wilson was a professed unbeliever and had often debated with his friend the truth of the Christian religion. Pittenger, I believe you are right now, he said. Try to be better prepared when you come to die than I am. God bless you, Pittenger offered. The seven men handed off trinkets and keepsakes to their comrades for safe keeping or promised delivery to loved ones back home. Wilson removed the gold pin he wore and pinned it to the inside of his vest close to his heart. He then gave a copy of his death warrant to William Knight, who folded it in an inside pocket and would later deliver it to a Union officer, from whence it would find its way into the archives in Washington. 
If you took advantage of Reverend Scott's offer to mail any final letters or messages, scratching out a few parting words on scraps of paper, though none of these sentiments were ever received by family or friends, and in fact were never sent in the first place, due to some technical objection from the War Department, Scott later explained. Again, he declined to witness the execution itself, and he took his leave from the unlucky seven. We did what we could for them and saw them start on their last journey, the Reverend wrote. Then came the final choking farewells, Alf Wilson remembered. Though the wrenching scene borders on melodrama in the written recollections of those present, several of the surviving raiders catalogued the reactions of their unfortunate friends. Stout, black-bearded Samuel Slavins's thoughts were of his wife and his three little boys. Wife, children, tell them, he said, but that was as far as he got, his eyes welling and his voice choked with emotion. His April 6th letter would stand as his final goodbye to Rachel. I don't want you to give yourself any uneasiness any more than you can help about me. He had written just before leaving camp in Shelbyville, but if anything happens to me that we never meet again on earth, I hope we will meet in heaven. The once merry and mischievous Perry Shadrach was solemn, despairing that the hour had come. Boys, I'm not prepared to meet my Jesus, he said. His comrades, many of whom were crying by now, tried to reassure him and encouraged him to think of heavenly mercy. I'll try, I'll try, he told them, but I know I'm not prepared. His giant friend William Campbell wore a grim half-smile with no light in it, Bittinger recalled. Yes, boys, this is goddamn hard, he said, adding an eleventh-hour sin just before his final reckoning. John Scott shook hands with his friends in silence, probably thinking of his young wife or his little brother back in the ranks, both of whom would now have to fend for themselves. Sammy Robertson, who had just passed his nineteenth birthday while incarcerated in Swims's jail, wept as he spoke of his mother. He was by then so dazed by the ravaging fever that Dorsey was certain he would have died in a few days in any event. Robert Buffum would later testify that Robertson was literally carried out by the guards to be loaded onto the death cart and taken to the gallows. Marion Ross, above all, seemed to rise to meet his fate head-on. Perhaps he had simply steeled himself for this eventuality more than the others, prepared for the worst. He had his lamps trimmed and burning, as Dorsey put it. The gloom that had hung over him the past few weeks seemed to fall away, and the former flute player from Antioch College, who no one seemed to think was sergeant material, who even the scrawny Pittenger once thought would be of little account on a mission behind enemy lines, showed himself to be a hero that day. Others were bitterly and terribly disappointed. He was not, Pittenger remembered. He was perfectly erect, with easy grace. There was not a sign of dread, while his eye beamed and his whole face became radiant with the martyr's joy. Ross told his comrades in a firm, unwavering voice, Boys, tell them at home, if any of you escape, that I died for my country and did not regret it. Alf Wilson was awed by the quiet courage of his friends, later expressing his proud admiration for their noble, manly fortitude in that trying moment. He wrote, A true man, in the mad excitement of strife on the battlefield, can march with his comrades to meet death without faltering, but for an innocent man to bravely and calmly meet the fate of a murderer on the scaffold is a test of courage for a soldier, which few men can realize until commanded to prepare for the halter. Wilson Brown, too, carried the hard memory of that day for the rest of his life. The boys were brave under this trying ordeal, but that was a time that tried men's souls, he wrote in a letter in 1904. Brave men wept. When I recall this incident, I cannot suppress my feelings, for it was an awful scene. Is it not a wonder that our reason is not dethroned? Who can read a recital of this event from the pen of one of the participants and not have a feeling of sympathy in their hearts? The seven men were led from the cell, down the stairs, and out to the gate onto Fraser Street, their arms nearly pinioned with ropes from hands to elbows. They emerged from the prison yard and climbed onto a sideless, flat-bottomed cart, their feet dangling over the sides like farm boys riding off to town in Daddy's wagon. Accompanied by a cavalry escort, the cart left the prison, 
turned left onto Fair Street and rolled eastward toward a distant grove of trees that marked the city cemetery. In their second-floor cell, their friends strained to watch the procession through the tiny holes in the iron-latticed windows. They were soon out of sight forever, Darcy remembered. Conductor William Fuller walked along behind the wagon, seemingly making good on his promise to follow the raiders all the way to their graves. There had been no public notice of the day's unfolding drama, but word traveled quickly through the bustling streets and store windows were shuttered and offices locked as hundreds of citizens rushed to witness what one would later describe as the biggest execution of white men ever held in Atlanta or perhaps anywhere in the South. It was a hot June afternoon in 1862, Private John W. Woodruff said, recalling the scene years later, Back of us was Atlanta, busy and noisy with her warlike industries. Around us the green trees were vocal with the music of twittering birds, and beneath our feet stretched patches of daisies and other wild flowers. The sun glared like a red ball of fire through the dust which hung over the bustling city, and altogether the scene was a memorable one. Woodruff was a soldier in the 9th Georgia Artillery Battalion, commonly known as Layden's Battery, recently organized there in Atlanta. He served as a courier to Major Layden, and thus was free that day to watch the execution, sitting astride a horse that gave him a capital view of the gallows over the hats and bonnets of the gathering throng of Atlantans. The garden-like city cemetery, known in those days as the Atlanta Graveyard or City Burial Place, had been established by the town fathers in 1850, the resting place was less than a mile from the zero-mile post that marked the city center and was a favorite destination for Atlantans on carriage rides or Sunday picnics. Carpeted with lush grass and wild flowers and dotted with oaks, the well-kept graveyard covered six acres on a gentle rise east of town. The South's heroic fallen sons would soon demand more space, however, and the cemetery would expand to 88 acres by 1872, when it would be renamed Oakland Cemetery. In later years it would become an exclusive final destination reserved for the privileged dead, but in its early days the cemetery gates were open to all comers, welcoming the fortunate and unfortunate alike. The seven doomed men surely found the three-quarter mile ride to the grove of oak trees near the graveyard's southwest corner to be all too brief. The crowd parted and quieted as the prisoners were led from their conveyance and each moved into place on the rickety scaffold. I watched them closely, and not one flickered from first to last, Woodruff said. William Fuller agreed. They were brave, fearless men and met their fate as all true Americans do, he recalled. They stood erect on the rude platform and faced death with apparently no regrets save the manner in which they were to die. The raiders had asked for the generous privilege of being shot, so they could die like soldiers, but this request had of course been denied. The gallows was a rough affair, according to Woodruff, seven nooses strung along a thick crossbar supported by stout uprights. Some witnesses would remember the beam resting in the forks of two trees. The doomed men stood side by side on a thick plank, hinged at each end and sawed through in the middle, where it was supported for the time being by a thick post. Fuller later would describe the scaffold as a hurriedly and horribly constructed death trap. A broad, shallow trench had been dug in the dusty clay just beneath the structure. The spectators looked on with breathless interest, and the Confederate soldiers detailed to conduct the hanging more serious faces, Woodruff observed. It was a terrible piece of work for them to do, to hang seven brave young fellows like dogs, and they hated the job. All was quiet as the nooses were put in place. If any of the Yankees remembered their earlier bluster, that they would sing the star-spangled banner on the scaffold when the end came, no one mentioned it now. The soldiers were informed, however, that they would be permitted to say a few words if they would like. George D. Wilson accepted the opportunity to speak, and he addressed the gathering in ringing tones, like a preacher at a summer revival, seemingly unfazed by the rope around his neck. He did not believe, he said, that he and his comrades should be treated as spies. They were not spies, and all there assembled knew it. They were soldiers doing the duty assigned to them by their officers. 
They had been captured and convicted, having done nothing more than what many Confederates had done themselves, gone into the enemy's country. True, he admitted, we were disguised. So were Confederates who had been captured within the Union lines, but it is now too late to discuss that question. We are here to die as Union soldiers, who undertook to do in one day that which will cost the country millions of dollars and thousands of lives to accomplish in years, he said. He told the crowd that he and his comrades held no grudge or ill will against the people of the South. They were not to blame for this war. Their leaders were responsible. But he predicted that many would yet live to regret this tragedy. Some of you will live to see the American flag flying and waving over the spot where we, as soldiers, are about to offer up our lives, he said in closing. This seems hard, but if it be the will of him who doeth all things well, so mote it be. We are ready. Wilson's eloquent speech entranced and moved many of the assembled witnesses, and it seemed for a moment like his words might sidetrack the entire proceeding. Why don't they stop him? What do they allow such talk for? One Confederate officer reportedly grumbled, and a black man in the crowd later remarked, Massa, if that man had only spoke a few minutes longer, they never could have hung him in the world. But if his patriotic remarks tugged at the hearts of the Southern ladies and gentlemen, it did nothing to dissuade the newly appointed Provost Marshal, Captain G. J. Foraker. He gave the signal with a wave of his sword, and the center post was yanked from beneath the platform. The seven men dropped in unison with a snap of the ropes, and five were left bobbing and dangling, departed souls all, but two of them, the pair on the end, the big men, Campbell and Slavins, proved more weight than the nooses could handle. Amazingly, their ropes broke and both fell heavily to the ground, half strangled, as Woodruff put it. Several guards rushed forward and removed the handkerchiefs from their eyes, finding the two men alive and partly conscious. Each was sat up and given a drink of water, still in the shadow of the swaying corpses of their friends. Perhaps an hour passed as the bodies of the five dead men were cut down and placed in their wooden coffins. Meanwhile, the guards collected two thick ropes from the necks of nearby cavalry horses and fashioned them into nooses. Campbell and Slavins begged for more time to prepare themselves, but their appeals were denied by Captain Foraker, whose orders left no room for such discretion. The prisoners were to be hung by the neck until dead, and if it took two successive hangings to get them there, so be it. William Campbell and Samuel Slavins were placed back up on the plank. Again the signal was given and the support pulled from under the platform. This time the ropes proved sufficient, and it was a good thing, too. Several of the guards, who were more than a little spooked after the bungled execution and the horrible rehanging of Campbell and Slavins, were heard to remark that if the ropes broke a second time they would have nothing more to do with the assignment. In fact, some folks in the crowd had opposed the second attempt entirely, having heard somewhere before that the breaking of a rope on the gallows was evidence that the accused was not guilty. The excitement finally over, the crowd dispersed, most of them walking back westward down Fraser Street toward the slanting late afternoon sun and the spires of the city. The surviving raiders watched as the empty death cart returned to the yard of the jail. Conductor Fuller lingered after the hangings, watching as the coffins were moved to their unmarked grave. He later explained that, as a fellow mason, he had promised Sergeant Major Ross to mark the burial place. He also kept a macabre souvenir of the occasion. Captain Foraker gave him the rope that had hung Samuel Slavins, and Fuller would keep it as a prized possession for the rest of his life. But in later years, Fuller would insist that, though mistakes were made, there was no undue or intentional cruelty in the way the executions were carried out. The poor fellows were decently executed, and by Americans, who had souls and manly principles, he wrote in a letter to his son-in-law, we would not have tolerated any sort of inhumane treatment of the soldiers. For the people of Atlanta, who would see much death and destruction in the months and years to come, the hangings were the first thing that happened in our midst to give us a realization of the sad things of war, Atlanta diarist Sally Clayton wrote in her memoirs. Having turned out in droves to experience the dark thrill of watching other men die, many of the witnesses instead found themselves deeply saddened and disturbed by what they had seen. 
One such person was James Crewe, who worked as a general ticket agent for the Georgia, Atlanta, and LaGrange, and Macon and Western Railroads, who penned a letter to his wife back home in Madison that same afternoon. Seven more of the bridge burners were hung here this evening, he wrote. The rope broke and let two of them to ground, and a new rope procured and again put upon the scaffold. Is this not awful? Men in the prime of life landed into eternity without an hour's warning, and what for? Would to God I was out of this town until this war is over. John Woodruff, too, was profoundly affected by what he had seen that day. It made a boy as I was a deep impression on my mind, and God grant I may never see another such, he later wrote. He turned his horse away from the lingering guards and grave diggers and trotted off to rejoin his battalion. I had seen enough, he recalled, and mounting my horse I rode back to camp with all horrors trooping through my young brains, never to be forgotten. Private Woodruff's was not the only impressionable mind shaken by the day's events. Also present at the hanging that Wednesday afternoon were four young boys, Smith and Tom Clayton of Atlanta, and their cousins, Andrew and Tom Semmes, the twin sons of Confederate Brigadier General Paul J. Semmes, who was then fighting in Virginia, and would later be mortally wounded in the wheat field at Gettysburg. The boys, who ranged in age from eight to ten years, had taken a break from an ingenious summer enterprise, collecting leeches for sale to local physicians, to come out and watch the execution of the hated Yanks. The Clayton boy's older sister Sally tried to dissuade them, warning that the hangings may well create what she called a lasting mental picture that might probably never leave them, but they turned deaf ears to all that was said, and away they went. The two young Toms lost their nerve, turning their backs and covering their eyes and ears as the unlucky seven were led onto the scaffold. But Smith Clayton and Andrew Semmes watched wide-eyed as the trap was sprung and the men hanged. That night about midnight these two young witnesses sent up howls that were loud enough to have brought out the entire police department, Sally Clayton recalled. One poor little fellow insisted that all seven of the men were sitting on the foot of his bed. No one could comfort them, and it was ever so long before they could be sufficiently made to sleep. The boys learned their lesson, according to Sally, for the sight of that hanging caused a complete loss of taste for executions. The summary hangings of their seven comrades shook the surviving raiders to the core. Word of the two botched executions and the suffering of their friends horrified and disgusted the survivors. The thought of being decently executed, if such a thing as decency can be applied to such horrible work, was terrible enough, but the thought of being hanged twice or being strangled to death with our feet on the ground made our pending doom a sickening nightmare, Dorsey remembered. The kindly jailer, Mr. Turner, allowed the five Knoxville survivors to move across the hall to join their eight comrades, reuniting the raiders in the inauspicious number of thirteen, with Wallum still missing. Among the reactions to the death of their friends was a newly kindled interest in religious matters, which did not come easily to the soldiers in the group, poor sinners all, none of whom except John Porter and Bill Pittenger had any established faith to fall back on. Singing resumed in the jail, but now the program was filled with Rock of Ages, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, and other hymns instead of patriotic songs and homesick ballads. Yet even the hymns themselves, which included mournful verses like Plunged in a Gulf of Dark Despair and Hark! From the tombs a doleful sound seemed to reflect a growing hopelessness and despondency among the survivors. Pittenger felt the evil that had befallen their comrades required a certain cleansing, whether to establish themselves as good souls worth sparing or to prepare for heavenly judgment, and he led an almost Puritan revival, declaring that gambling and games of chance should be forbidden, going so far as to throw their borrowed playing cards out the jail window. Those who disliked the nearsighted corporal before truly resented him now that they were reduced in their entertainments to marathon games of checkers on a board scratched on the floor with a nail. For what it was worth, and some thought it wasn't worth much, all among the party devoted time to earnest prayers, beginning with a solemn prayer service held just after the executions under the leadership and guidance of Captain Fry. Alf Wilson bowed his head like all the others, though he wasn't sure it would do any good. 
I believe in the efficacy of earnest Christian prayer, but prayer in a Confederate prison seemed to have less effect than in any place I have ever before or since been, he later wrote. At times he thought that God, in his anger, had stricken that part of rebeldom from heaven's court calendar as unworthy of representation in his kingdom of peace, justice, and goodwill, and only fit for the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. On later occasions they were at times assisted in spiritual matters by local ministers, including Reverend MacDonald, who began by asking the Lord that the poor prisoners' lives be spared, but only if it was in the best interests of the Confederacy. This prayer did not suit us exactly, Wilson remembered. Robert Buffum, too, placed little stock in the power of prayer. Pittenger, say Pittenger, he would tease. Pray in one hand and spit in the other and see which will get full the soonest. But even the irreverent Bay State private had been rattled by the abrupt hangings of his companions, and he prayed as best he could. He knelt with the others, his bony legs crossed behind him at the ankles, and he bowed his dark, heavily bearded head as he prayed. Lord, we are taught to pray for our enemies, he said. Therefore we pray thee to have mercy on these goddamn rebel sons of bitches, for they know not what they do. Dorsey participated in the religious services, though he found them nothing more than a way to pass the time. My heart was not in it, he admitted. The prayers and hymns, in his mind, did nothing more than serve to reconcile the prisoners to their fate, convincing them that a haven of rest, peace, and happiness awaited us, and thereby lessening their resistance and muffling any plans to escape. I believe all men have a religious faith of some kind, a belief as to the life and destiny of mankind, he wrote years later. But soldiers situated as we were had far better have devoted their attention to fighting their way out than to have resorted to any form of religious entertainment or pastime. If they believed in anything at all in those dark days, Al Dorsey and an ever-increasing number of his companions believed in the maxim that God helps those who help themselves. Having taken their appeal to the throne of grace, the desperate prisoners decided they might as well exhaust all possible avenues for relief and seek a pardon from the man many Northerners considered to be the devil himself. Their request would be directed to Confederate President Jefferson Davis, explaining to him the facts of their case and asking for his mercy. The author of the letter, perhaps not surprisingly, was William Pittenger, though he claimed that someone else had suggested it and that he did not like the idea. Al Dorsey would argue that the whole thing was Pittenger's idea, while Alf Wilson merely said that Pittenger acted as scribe. A lengthy and sometimes heated debate erupted over the proposed letter-writing, though most seemed to think that it was worth a try and could hardly make things worse. Pittenger's first draft was discarded as too servile in tone, as Dorsey put it, though Pittenger would claim that others wanted more pleading. Put it on a good deal stronger, Wilson Brown supposedly urged. Get right down and beg to him. Whatever process of joint authorship took place, a second version was generated that was apparently acceptable to all. The letter was dated June 18th, the day of the executions, but was probably written a day or so later. June 18th, 1862, to His Excellency Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States of America. Sir, we are the survivors of the party that took the engine at Big Shanty on the 12th of April last. Our commander, Andrews, and seven of our comrades have been executed. We all, with the exception of Andrews, were regularly detailed from our regiments in perfect ignorance of where we were going and what we were to do. We were ordered to obey Andrews, and everything we did was done by his order, he only telling his plans when he wished us to execute them. In this we are no more to blame than any northern soldiers, for any one of them in our circumstances would have been obliged to do just as we did. For fuller details we refer to the evidence in the cases that have been tried. No real harm was done, and as far as thought and intention is concerned we are perfectly innocent. Oh, it is hard to die a disgraceful and ignominious death, to leave our wives, our children, our brothers and sisters, and our parents without consolation. Give this matter your most kind and merciful consideration. Give us that mercy you yourself hope to receive from the judge of all. We will all take an oath not to fight or do anything against the Confederacy. If this cannot be done, at least spare our lives until the war is closed, if we have to remain in prison until that time. Wilson W. Brown, 
21st O.V. Company F. Wilson W. Brown, 21st O.V. Company F. William Bensinger, ditto, Company G. Elihu H. Mason, ditto, Company K. John A. Wilson, ditto, Company C. John R. Porter, ditto, Company G. Mark Wood, ditto, Company C. Robert Buffum, ditto, Company H. William Knight, ditto, Company E. William Pittenger, 2nd Ohio, Company G. Daniel A. Dorsey, 33rd O.V., Company H. Jacob Parrott, ditto, Company K. William Reddick, ditto, Company B. M. J. Hawkins, ditto, Company A. Robert Buffum, an irrepressible soul even when pleading for his life, wanted to tweak the Confederate chief executive by adding, after the words, We are perfectly innocent, Davis's own famous phrase, All we ask is to be let alone. This proposal was sensibly rejected, and all thirteen soldiers signed below. Dorsey had to sign for the illiterate Jake Parrott, and Wilson Brown was apparently so shaken by recent events that he signed his name twice. It was a remarkable letter indeed. The Andrews Raiders, renowned for their daring, their courage, and their selfless dedication to the Union cause, had reached a point where desperation seemed to eclipse those former virtues entirely. They lied about their knowledge of Andrews's plan and their complicity in the raid. They claimed not only that no harm was done, but that none was intended, and they pitifully invoked the images of mourning wives and inconsolable families in an effort to spark sympathy. Most notably, the letter sought to invoke the protection of their status as United States soldiers, and at the same time offered to compromise their loyalty by going so far as to take an oath not to fight against the Confederacy. If this apparent loss of courage and abdication of duty ever troubled the authors of the letter, none of them said so, then or later. Nothing came of the survivor's letter-writing, at least not at first. As the long, hot summer days passed and the calendar turned from June to July, their terror and grief inevitably subsided, replaced by the drudgery of imprisonment. The raiders found ways to pass the time, thanks in large part to the kindness of Reverend MacDonald, who not only offered them spiritual comfort now and then, but also sent over volumes from his shelves. The loaned books included travel, adventure, history, biography, even theological dissertations, everything but fiction, as reading these books aloud to those interested required some measure of silence. Two hours of comparative quiet were set aside in the morning and two in the afternoon for reading. One of the borrowed books contained a sermon by the famous bishop and orator John Bascom on The Joys of Heaven. Pittenger read the sermon to the group one sultry afternoon, magnificently describing the heavenly rewards and divine peace that awaited each and every one of them. After he finished, the party sat reflecting on the inspirational text when Wilson Brown suddenly proposed a possible alternative— well, boys, that is very good, but I would like to know how many of this party would rather be there now, safe from all harm, or back in Cincinnati, up to heaven or back to Ohio. Now this was an intriguing topic for discussion, indeed, and the prisoners debated it at length, and with great animation. The argument was ultimately resolved by a vote with a clear majority holding for Cincinnati. Just as they had done in Chattanooga, the raiders haggled, pleaded, and improvised to gather small comforts and necessities. At the top of the list of desired goods was tobacco. Most of the prisoners were tobacco chewers or smokers or both, and went to great ends to obtain even the smallest amounts of the leaf, which many said they valued more than their daily bread. They begged for tobacco from just about everyone, from the guards, from the black servants who brought their food, even from the jailer himself, if the right Reverend MacDonald had chewed, they would have pleaded with him too. Often they were successful, touching on that universal and inexplicable spirit of sympathy and sharing which all users of tobacco seem to have for one another. The tobacco thus obtained was then used to its utmost, chewed until all hint of flavor was gone, and then dried and smoked in corncob pipes. The raiders also found that they could barter to improve their situation— Mr. Turner being a much more honest broker than the hated swims, they sold off what they could spare to the guards, handkerchiefs, vests, and other unnecessary articles, and bought food or other goods with the proceeds. Knight, who found himself heir to Andrews's previously fine Prince Albert coat, 
sold it off and invested his returns in apples, onions, and, of course, tobacco. Pittenger sold his vest and empty pocketbook and had Turner purchase for him three additional books, Pilgrim's Progress, Pollock's Course of Time, and Paradise Lost. He spent hours memorizing the latter, and in the months to come would make considerable progress in doing so. In addition to fighting despondency, the raiders battled the oppressive Georgia summer. They spent most days shirtless and sometimes shed their trousers as well, both to cool themselves and to preserve their ragged clothing in case of future escape. William Knight borrowed a pair of shears and one day opened a barber shop of sorts, giving haircuts to all comers in return for trinkets and favors. He soon felt unappreciated for the hot, itchy work. After cutting half of William Reddick's hair close to the scalp, Knight refused to complete the job and went on a strike for higher wages and let poor Bill go for several days in this odd manner. The monotony of incarceration was broken along toward the end of June by a question from the jailer Mr. Turner, who asked the raiders if any of them knew a man by the name of John Wallum. He pronounced it Woolum. The Yankee captives initially demurred, not wanting to compromise a friend if he was still at large or being questioned, when Wallum strode into view and said in a hearty voice, "'Boys, don't go back on me now!' He walked through the open cell door, shaking hands with his friends, an ear-to-ear -ear grin yanked leftward by a fist-sized chaw of tobacco wedged in his jaw. He was quite a spectacle." shirtless in a straw hat, black trousers held up by suspenders running over his bare shoulders, and a heavily abused pair of boots. He was sunburned from nose to waist, his skin as black as his trousers, Knight remembered, and his face as slick as a peeled onion. The wayward private was welcomed by his comrades like the prodigal son returned, and Knight thought that Wallum seemed almost as glad to return to prison with the boys as he would have been to have returned home. Wallum had floated down the Tennessee in his borrowed canoe, and soon was clear of Chattanooga. He made slow progress, hiding himself and his dugout by day and traveling only under dark of night. At one point he passed safety by without knowing it. General Mitchell had converted a captured barge into a gunboat of sorts, and Wallum, assuming it to be a rebel craft, had crept past it carefully, hugging the opposite bank. He traveled this way for days until he was sure he was safely in friendly territory and then abandoned his former precautions, rowing along boldly in broad daylight, hence the sunburn. He was soon confronted by Confederate soldiers and taken to a nearby camp where he had the unbelievably bad fortune of being recognized by one of the same officers who was involved in his original capture back in early April. The raiders were pleased to see their friend, but were terribly disappointed by his recapture, as they had hoped he would reach the Federal lines and save them in some way, inspiring renewed military action, perhaps, or pressing the Union command to arrange for an exchange, but it was not to be. For his part, Wallum wanted to know which one of the boys had turned state's evidence. Someone in the group tried to explain to him what Dorsey called Pittenger's witness business, but he did not seem to credit the information. Yes, but by God, they say outside he turned state's evidence, he said. There was no use to talk to Wallum about good faith, Dorsey later wrote. From what he had heard outside, his mind was made up, and no amount of persuasive eloquence ever changed it. He lived and died believing Pittenger had played false. Another memorable occasion in the hot, dreary weeks of confinement in the Fulton County Jail was Independence Day, recognized even in Southern newspapers as the Glorious Fourth, Dorsey remembered seeing a Confederate flag on that day on a staff to the east of the jail. The day was warm and sultry, he wrote years later, and the rebel flag hung lifelessly down from its perch as if drooping its head in acknowledgment of guilt, as if in fact it were weighed down with the blood of the innocent, and ashamed to flaunt its guilty face before the world. The raiders sang the Star-Spangled Banner with special attention, but the festivities in Atlanta were otherwise sparse and unenthusiastic. The boys cracked torpedoes in the streets, the Southern Confederacy reported, and one of the local fire companies had its annual dinner and parade, but otherwise there was not the slightest indications of its being the anniversary of the birthday of a great nation. The raiders crowded up to the iron-laced windows to watch the meager celebration, Meanwhile, a small party of Confederate officers arrived outside the cell door. Another delegation of curious Southerners who wanted to see the notorious train-stealers, 
William Knight, swept up in a holiday mood, addressed the visitors with a mocking request. Say, mister, he said to one of the officers, a colonel, can't you let me go down the street and see the parade? I'm patriotic and want to help celebrate. Well, hardly, the officer replied, plainly not amused. Knight was undaunted. I intend to celebrate the next Fourth of July at home, he said. You'll celebrate it in hell, the colonel growled, his comment haunting the Yankee engineer for weeks to come. For what it is worth, Knight would look back on this exchange with satisfaction. He would indeed spend July 4th, 1863, on leave at home. The remainder of the summer passed with no further incidents and no response to or acknowledgment of their letter to President Davis. In August, someone conceived of the notion of trying again, this time directing their request through proper military channels in hopes of reaching a humbler person than the Confederate president. Again a heated debate ensued, not only of the efficacy of such a plea, but also as to the wisdom of sending the request at all. Some felt that the Confederate authorities had simply forgotten about them, or perhaps assumed, given the crowds and publicity that had accompanied the earlier executions, that the engine thieves had all been hanged and the matter concluded. Sending a letter now, two months after their seven comrades were killed, may only serve to call unwelcome attention to themselves. Those in favor of a second appeal prevailed in a vote, and a second letter was written by Pittenger and addressed to Confederate Major General Braxton Bragg, an officer who one would hardly call a humbler person, by the way. The letter read, Atlanta Jail, August 17, 1862. Respected Sir, we are United States soldiers, regularly detailed from our command to obey the orders of Andrews. He was a stranger to us, and we ignorant of his design, but of course we obeyed our officers. You are no doubt familiar with all we did, or can find it recorded in the trials of our comrades. Since then Andrews himself and seven of us have been executed, and fourteen survive. Is this not enough for vengeance and a warning to others? Would mercy in our case be misplaced? We have already been closely confined for more than four months. Will you not, sir, display a noble generosity by putting us on the same footing as prisoners of war, and permitting us to be exchanged, and thus show that in this terrible war the South still feels the claim of mercy and humanity? If you will be so good as to grant us this request, we will ever be grateful to you. Please inform us of your decision as soon as convenient. W. W. Brown, William Knight Elihu Mason, John R. Porter, William Bensinger, Robert Buffum, Mark Wood, Alfred Wilson, 21st Ohio Regiment, William Pittenger, 2nd Ohio Regiment, William H. Reddick, John Wallum, D. A. Dorsey, M. J. Hawkins, Jacob Parrott, 33rd Ohio Regiment, all of Sills Brigade, Buell's Division. The Raiders' appeal was handed to the Provost Marshal G. W. Lee, who dutifully sent it on to General Bragg. Knowing nothing at all about the case, Bragg forwarded the petition on to Adjutant General Jasper S. Whiting at Richmond, who endorsed it to G. W. Randolph, Confederate Secretary of War. Randolph, in turn, respectfully submitted it to President Jefferson Davis on September 2nd, along with his recommendation that the surviving raiders be respited until further orders and detained as hostages for our own people in the hands of the enemy. The cold, dyspeptic Davis, apparently not at all feeling the claim of mercy and humanity, ignored Randolph's suggestion and replied, Inquire whether there is anything to justify a discrimination between these and others who were executed for the same offense, J.D. Davis posed a good question, come to think of it. If eight of the Yankee spies had deserved to be executed, if they needed killin', to use the southern phrase, seems like all of them would. The various endorsements to the letter, including the President's comment, were forwarded back down the line to Captain G. W. Lee, the new Provost Marshal in Atlanta charged with guarding the prisoners. He replied that he had inherited the task of holding and punishing the Andrews Raiders when he took over as Provost Marshal in late June, shortly after the seven poor Ohio boys had been hanged. As for the status of the others, he did not know— he supposed that the only reason that the remaining raiders had not been hung was that they had not been tried as yet. He promised to contact his predecessor, Captain G. J. Foraker, and find out why fourteen of the engine thieves were respited while the others were executed, 
and whether or not there was anything to justify a discrimination in their favor. Foraker responded to Lee's inquiry promptly, though not very helpfully. He had received orders back in June that seven men were to be hung, he replied, and he had attended to the executions as ordered. The remaining fourteen, he said, were reported to this office only for safekeeping, some having been tried but not sentenced, and others not tried. The only officer who could answer the provost marshal's question and solve the conundrum was presumably General E. Kirby Smith, who had signed the execution order. Lee chose not to inquire with General Smith, who presumably had bigger problems to contend with those days. Frustrated by now, and perhaps concerned that he not be viewed as failing to effectuate the orders of those above him, Captain Lee went to the jail to ask the raiders firsthand why seven were hanged and fourteen were not. Knight responded by claiming that the prominent members of the party, including the ringleader and the engineer, were chosen for execution, and the court had not considered the surviving fourteen to be as guilty as the rest. Captain Lee seemed unimpressed by this suggestion. Still, he stayed for a spell and talked very pleasantly with the raiders, sharing with them his belief that they would be put on the same footing as other prisoners of war. As he departed, he promised to return with word on how the matter had been decided in Richmond. Some thought we had made a favorable impression on the provost marshal, and that he would use his influence to have us treated as ordinary prisoners of war, Dorsey recalled, but others were not so sanguine. Whatever the views and influence of the new provost marshal, it was clear that Confederate authorities were now asking questions and trying to figure out what to do with them. Sending those letters might have been a mistake, after all. Chapter 14 A Damned Long Ways from Camp Escape from Atlanta It was clear that our only hope was in our own resources. We must escape if we were to live. Corporal Daniel A. Dorsey, 33rd Ohio. Atlanta remained untouched and unthreatened as 1862 wore on, and the city went about its business, prosperous and naive. Despite the lack of any apparent military danger, its citizens soon began to feel the pain and the pinch of the distant conflict. Business still boomed, of course. The town's arsenals and other industries could hardly keep up with the ceaseless demand of the hungry gray armies to the north and west, in a plea that embodied the increasingly desperate need, Captain J. T. Montgomery of the Jeff Davis Flying Artillery signed an advertisement in the Atlanta papers asking local houses of worship to donate their church bells to be melted down for cannon. Apparently, few churches responded to this call for ecumenical ammunition. All manner of goods were manufactured or harvested and shipped to the front, with precious little left for the everyday needs of the locals. Dry goods and foodstuffs grew scarce due to the needs of the army and the tight grip of the Union blockade. Prices swelled and then skyrocketed, first because of merchants who merely reflected the limited supply, and later due to opportunistic speculators who descended on the city like crows to a carcass. The price of flour, sugar, salt, butter, bacon, and other provisions rose sharply and continually from 1861 through 1863, the only inexpensive commodity being cotton, and even then most finished goods, such as a lady's fine calico dress that had run the Union blockade, would sell for five or six times the price of a year ago. The prohibitive cost of living resulted in widespread scarcity and want, and then inspired increasing crime and theft among the city's ever-growing population, which included soldiers, skulkers, slaves, runaways, refugees, and other transients and desperados. Prostitution, disease, robbery, murder, and a persistent, unnerving rowdyism worried Atlantans and added to the disruption and chaos the war brought, one prominent historian wrote of the period. Throughout 1862, Atlanta verged on chaos. All in all, it was enough to make even the wealthy merchants long for simpler times. Our sales continue good and our profits also good, S. P. Richards wrote of his thriving paper store in September 1862, but yet I would willingly go back to old trade and moderate profits if we could only have peace and independence. The railroads too strained to meet expectations, carrying foodstuffs, ordnance, and other supplies as freight and passenger rates doubled and regular schedules were for the most part discarded entirely. At times, 
Northbound trains on the WNA ran so close together that the line of cars on the tracks between Atlanta and Marietta was nearly continuous. Trains carried nervous, grass-green volunteers north as reinforcements, while inbound cars brought the wounded and the sick from the battlefields and bivouacs of Virginia and Tennessee. Refugees, off-duty train crews, and other traveling civilians fought for space in the crowded, often reeking coaches and sometimes wedged themselves in boxcars next to merchandise, sacks of grain, or sides of meat. Occasionally the stiff bodies of dead soldiers were transported here or there for burial, their rough coffins stacked in with the baggage and carried free of charge by the responsible railroad company. It was this commerce, the trade in and transport of what one local historian would call the quick, the dead, and those in between, that began to affect the people of Atlanta most deeply. The papers regularly carried the grim reports of Confederate casualties and long lists of names often simply headlined, The Dead, of the many who had passed away in the city's hospitals. Throughout the summer and fall the war raged on and the list of bloody battles lengthened. Gaines Mill, Fraser's Farm, Malvern Hill, Second Manassas, Ox Hill, and Sharpsburg, which the Yankees called Antietam. For many Georgians, the losses became deeply personal. The city marshal Oliver H. Jones, for example, lost his brother Robert, a chaplain killed in Virginia on June 28. The once faraway war became close and sharp and very real, no longer just something one read about in the newspapers, and the fighting showed no signs of slacking off. In the face of the hardship, and the dying, the previous fascination with the months ago engine heist by a handful of Yankee soldiers, a flamboyant spectacle where no military result of any moment had been achieved and where not a soul had been killed, might have seemed mere folly. The Andrews Raiders appeared to have been forgotten, locked away in the county jail with Confederate deserters, Tennessee loyalists, and accused murderers and thieves. There was no further word of the famous train-stealers in the Atlanta newspapers, whose narrow columns were now crowded with battle news and casualty lists. The constant flow of curious visitors to the jail dwindled to almost nothing. Pittenger recorded one notable visit by Mr. Turner's adult daughter, who brought along her infant son. Sergeant Elihu Mason was permitted to touch the child between the bars of the cell door, and he wept at the thought of his own children as he held and kissed the baby's hand. In the meantime, the Ohio soldiers had no definite news of any further court-martial proceedings, nor of any planned release or prisoner exchange. They had received no response from their appeals to President Davis or General Bragg, and by now did not expect one. Not a positive one, in any event. Back in the Union ranks, the missing raiders were presumed to be long since dead, Most of the unit records merely reflected their absence. Muster rolls of Company H of the 21st Ohio, for example, listed Private Robert Buffum as assigned on special duty and sometimes as on secret service by order of General O. M. Mitchell. Some of their officers, however, had by now assumed the worst. Captain Thaddeus A. Minchel, who was then in command of Company H of the 33rd Ohio and later would become a justice on the Ohio Supreme Court, wrote in the company book next to D. A. Dorsey's name, executed by Confederate authority. The exact date of this execution is not known. Some months later, Dorsey would happily see to the correction of this entry himself. For the long months after they went missing, the raiders' wives and families back home were left to wonder what had happened to their loved ones, why the letters had stopped, why inquiries sent to Washington or to camp were quietly but firmly rebuffed. As August crept into September, the Atlanta captives focused on developing additional diversions to fend off boredom and bouts of melancholy while continuing the ever-present endeavor of planning their escape. They formed a debating society of sorts, with a sharp divergence of views being expressed and argued on a number of topics, except capital punishment, about which there was no chance for argument as we were all opposed to it, Dorsey said. Reading and storytelling continued each day, along with religious services composed of Bible reading, singing, and prayer. While thus feeding their minds and spirits, the soldiers also did their utmost to keep themselves physically fit under the circumstances. They exercised as best they could in the confined space, 
hoping for a chance to put their strength to use in the coming weeks. They drew marks on the floor to measure progress in broad jumping, and the former circus performer Martin Hawkins tutored the others in performing handsprings, tumbling, and other gymnastic feats. Boxing matches were popular as well, with each participant encouraged to imagine that his opponent was a rebel, which at times caused the friendly sparring to deteriorate into serious violence. One of the most feared opponents was Buffum and his little bony arms, which were more like hand spikes than human arms, as Dorsey remembered it. Wallum and Bensinger created their own rough game, a bulldog tussle, whereby each would dig his teeth into the other's shoulder as they fought to determine who could endure the most punishment. These and other sports occupied participants and spectators alike and kept the raiders as fit and strong as their confinement and their short rations would permit. Still, despite the range of activities, Dorsey noticed a slow but unmistakable change in himself and his companions, their voices weaker, their bodies thinner, their eyes glassy and increasingly distracted. We were dying by inches, he said. Over time, the raiders found they had friends and allies in the two black servants, John and Kate, who brought their food and water. Twice a day, the pair also served up, along with their meals, whispered information overheard from guards or masters, and soon were smuggling in newspapers concealed in the bottom of the raiders' food trays. They assisted us by every means in their power, and seemed willing to take any personal risk on our behalf, Pittenger recalled. The two slaves also inspired the captive soldiers with their unshaken optimism and their firm belief in the Union cause. They believed all northern soldiers were unselfish, fighting only for the rights of men, and considered it a privilege to help us in any possible way, Pittenger said. I never talked with a Negro yet who seemed to have the slightest doubt of the victory of the Union troops and in their own freedom as the result of the war. That freedom seemed nearer at hand in late September when word of emancipation reached the Fulton County Jail. On September 22nd, in the wake of the vicious battle on the banks of Antietam Creek in Maryland that forced the withdrawal of Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia, President Lincoln had announced his preliminary emancipation proclamation. On the first day of January 1863, all slaves within any state or district then in rebellion against the United States would be then, thenceforth, and forever free. The raiders heard of the proclamation from new prisoners brought into the jail. The Negroes seemed to take a lively interest in the proclamation and were never so pleased as when they could speak to us on the sly about it, Alf Wilson recalled. But the news caused great commotion among the rebels and brought down bitter maledictions upon the president's head. In fact, the event had kindled widespread controversy in the North and an explosion of fury among many Southerners, including the Confederate government. The raiders may have sensed this new hostility as they continued to wait for word of their own emancipation. All signs, however, suggested that circumstances were shifting the other way. In addition to poring over smuggled newspapers and hearing whispered tidbits from the servants, the raiders gathered intelligence from the prisoners in the adjacent cells. A stovepipe in the corner of their room shared a chimney with a similar stovepipe in the cell next door, and they had discovered that they could remove the pipe elbow and speak through the hole to their neighbors next door. In addition, they passed information to and fro with the inmates held across the hallway, tying a note to a stick on a string, which they would then throw across the hall and through the one-inch gap under the doorway. Our telegraph system they called it. The string allowed them to pull the stick back to receive a reply or to reel in the projectile in the event of a wayward toss. Through these mechanisms, the Ohio soldiers found, as the Indian summer arrived and the leaves began to turn, that the evidence was increasing daily that something was in the wind that boded no good to us. Sometime after Provost Marshal Lee's disturbing mid-September visit to the jail, Two prisoners of war in the next cell overheard him telling the officer of the guard that he expected to receive an order at any time for the execution of those raiders. This was soon corroborated when the message stick arrived under the door with a scrap of paper tied to it bearing disturbing news. It seemed that Mr. Turner, who the raiders thought had been showing an unusual degree of compassion in recent days, had given orders to the guards to keep a closer watch over the train-stealers.
Those Ohio men will be executed in a short time, he had reportedly told the sentries before adding his own personal regrets. There are some fine men in that room, he had said. Just like that, the prisoners' days of idle confinement and uncertainty as to their future and their ultimate fate were over. After sifting and weighing closely all the information we had, it stood in about this way, Wilson said, nothing more than a little formality, Confederate red tape was all that now stood between us and the scaffold. If we had any hope of getting beyond those prison walls, except on a death cart to the gallows, the blow must be struck at once. Dorsey agreed. Our time had come and everything went to prove it, he wrote. There was no longer any doubt of the proper course to pursue. The raiders made hasty preparations for their departure, they used a borrowed needle and lengths of thread liberated from the bed-ticking to mend their clothing, patched and reinforced their tattered shoes from the limited materials at hand, struggled to come up with makeshift weapons, such as a club of sorts fashioned from a piece of wood worked free from the wall near the door-frame. Captain Fry, the highest-ranking man present and undeniably the most physically imposing, now that poor William Campbell was gone, and the one with first-hand experience in taking violent action, was placed in command of the escape attempt. Energized by the consensus appointment, he worked out a detailed plan of attack and gave directions on the role each man would play as they moved on the jailer and the guards. They would attack just after evening mealtime when the jailer and the servants came to remove their empty trays. Fry would subdue the jailer, and Buffum would take his keys and open the other cells, then the group would descend the stairs and divide into two parties to rush from the doors, front and rear, overpower the guards outside, and head for the fence and then for the woods. All the raiders were to participate in the escape attempt, along with Fry and a handful of the other inmates. One of the East Tennesseans, G. W. Barlow, wanted to take the risk and join the effort. He was given permission by the unsuspecting jailer to move across the hall and join his fellow Tennessean Captain Fry. The other East Tennessee Tories, including old gun barrel Peter Pierce, would decide not to make the attempt. Another inmate pleaded to be included in the breakout as well, a Georgia boy in the next cell who faced trial on charges of desertion and probably a firing squad. Yet another cell contained a number of civil prisoners, including a convicted murderer. The Ohioans agreed that they would not unlock that cell at all. The raiders planned to go out that very night, October 15th, but a soft, soaking rain that afternoon gave them pause. Dorsey believed, rightly or wrongly, that the wet leaves and ground would allow dogs to track them more easily, so they postponed until the next evening after supper. The next twenty-four hours was a day of awful suspense, the longest I ever put over in my life, Dorsey remembered. There were no games and few songs that day. Instead, the prisoners passed the daylight hours of October 16th in a self-taught class on escape, evasion, and wilderness survival. They discussed and debated such topics as what direction they should take, how to throw dogs off the scent, how to approach a house in search of food, how to cross rivers and streams, and the likely whereabouts of Union forces. Meanwhile, they kept an eager watch on the barred windows, fearful that the regular guard detail would be increased or the routine changed signaling an imminent court-martial or a hasty execution. They marked the afternoon hours and the approach of evening by watching the shadow of the jail as it lengthened and spread across a knoll just to the east. At last the supper hour arrived, and to their relief the guard had not been reinforced. The usual detail was posted in the yard outside, a sergeant and six men. The prisoners would have the advantage of numbers and hopefully of surprise, but they would face locked doors and armed guards, and all were in an admittedly weakened condition. We felt that it was probably the last day on earth for some of us, Dorsey recalled. Some would surely be killed in the fight with the guards, and who it would be, no one could tell. They shook hands warmly, and traded farewells and best wishes all around. Each man left a message in the hands of a couple of different comrades to be passed along to family and friends if they were killed in the attempt or left behind so that their loved ones might know what had become of them. Captain Fry led the group in a word of prayer, closing the benediction just as Mr. Turner and the two servants came shuffling up the stairs bearing their supper trays. 
The doors were unlocked and the cells served one by one just like always. The raiders divided their small meals, eating a bite or two for strength and pocketing the rest so they would have a morsel to consume later on. After a time, Turner returned to the northeast cell and unlocked the door. The servants, John and Kate, came into the cell to clear out the supper dishes and to give the prisoners fresh water for the night. Just after they passed in, Fry, Knight, Brown, and the others stepped quickly through the door into the narrow hallway, blocking the cell door so it could not be closed. The rest of the party followed, surrounding a confused Turner in the corridor. He was alone. No guards had accompanied him up the stairs, and the old watchman Thower was nowhere in sight. This was lucky for Mr. Thower. One raider later wrote, as he surely would have received a bottle over the head had he been present. Good evening, Mr. Turner, Captain Fry said kindly, a warm smile on his face. Good evening, Turner replied, startled by the quiet but persistent advance through the doorway. A pleasant evening, Fry continued, stalling for time as more men sidled into the hallway around him. Yes, Turner agreed. Mr. Turner, Fry said, we feel like taking a little walk this evening. What? How? Where? Turner said, his surprise giving way to puzzlement. Well, we have been in here long enough, and you know that we will all be hanged soon if we remain, and we are going out. Yes, said Turner, still in disbelief, protesting weakly, but you will have the guards to contend with. A rumble of low, confident voices around him assured the old warden that they would take care of the guards. Then Buffum stepped forward and reached for his keys. Oh, yes, Mr. Turner, let us have those keys. Those boys want to go out, too, the little private said, gesturing toward the northeast cell. This seemed to shake the befuddled jailer out of his initial days and spark a deep-seated sense of responsibility. No, he said. You can go out, but you cannot interfere with the other prisoners. Fry suddenly seized the wiry jailer in an iron grip from behind, clapping a hand over his mouth to muffle his cries. Pittenger would later assert that it was he who had hushed the struggling Turner, receiving from him a bitten finger in return. Buffum snatched the ring of keys and moved to open the other cells even as the rest of the party skittered quietly down the stairs. Buffum stayed like a man and unlocked our doors, one prisoner said admiringly years later, Pittenger would remember that their sometime allies, the two black servants, John and Kate, kept perfectly silent as they watched the Federal prisoners wrestle the jailer and then flee for the exits, only beginning to scream when the noise outside convinced them that they might as well contribute their share. A number of the raiders would later describe in great detail the exciting jailbreak and the melee in the prison yard that followed, perhaps not surprisingly... No two of these accounts are alike, and no amount of comparison could possibly reconcile them. It all happened in a twinkling, Dorsey said. The fourteen surviving Andrews raiders, along with Captain Fry, the desperate rebel deserter, and perhaps a handful of others, descended the stairs and burst out of the building and into the yard. One party of guards had been passing the late afternoon engaged in a card game, their muskets leaning against the building nearby. Night got between them and their weapons, and they scrambled away in a flutter of diamonds and spades. William Bensinger, still powerful even after months of captivity, subdued another guard, seizing him by the throat as John Porter wrested away his musket. Alf Wilson recalled the jail yard skirmishes as a free-for-all scrap wherein several guards were knocked down and roughly handled. None of them seemed to be able to get a shot off in the confusion. Wilson, Wallum, and Hawkins grabbed bricks and bottles from a trash pile and hurled them toward the sentries as they ran for the gate, screaming, Murder! and hollering for the captain of the guard. Sensing that their opportunity was slipping away as the alarm was spread, Knight told the others, Boys, if we want to get away, we've got to get out of this. The soldiers cast aside their makeshift weapons and ran for the perimeter. The fence was high and topped with pickets, but three horizontal stringers nailed inside were as good as a stepladder. The men scrambled over and scattered into the unfamiliar streets of the city, heading for the woods about a mile away in any direction. They ran pell-mell through yards and gardens, tearing through brush and hurtling pickets as the ruckus faded behind them, and cool evening air burned at the back of their throats. That was the hardest race I ever ran, Dorsey recalled. As he passed one house, a lady emerged and asked what was the matter. "'Oh, nothing,' one of the escapees replied. "'Just some prisoners escaped.' 
Still no shots were fired until the fugitives were nearly to the tree line and those fell short or whizzed by harmlessly in the failing light. Alf Wilson would later claim he was hit while going over the fence, though the wound must have been superficial as it seemed to give him little trouble during the hundreds of miles he traveled thereafter. Back at the jail, those who failed to make it out of the yard in the first chaotic seconds soon found themselves trapped by the guards and a number of arriving reinforcements. Jacob Parrott and William Reddick were slow out of the blocks and were nabbed before they got to the fence. Robert Buffum made it out to the streets, but he had lingered too long opening the other cells. He had fled just a few hundred yards when a fleet-footed rebel ran him down. Bill Pittenger bounced from point to point around the prison yard, squinting through his spectacles at the chaos and searching in vain for an opening. At no time in all my southern experience did I find my defective vision to be such a misfortune as just now, he recalled sadly. It soon was obvious, even to Pittenger's weak eyes, that the initial panic had dissipated and that any chance for surprise and escape was gone. He returned to the building of his own accord and made his way up the stairs to watch the pursuit out one of the second-floor windows. It was a wild and exciting spectacle, he remembered. Company after company of soldiers came up. The bells of the city were ringing and shots were being fired rapidly while loud commands and screams were mingled. I feared that many of our number were or would soon be killed. Pittenger soon found that his fears in this regard were happily unfounded, Ten of the fourteen surviving Andrews raiders made it out of the city and off into the shadows of the forest. Bill Bensinger, Wilson Brown, D. A. Dorsey, Martin Hawkins, William Knight, Elihu Mason, John Reed Porter, Alf Wilson, Mark Wood, and John Wallum. Two of these, Mason and Bensinger, were rounded up within forty-eight hours, the former weakened by illness and the latter exhausted by pursuing men with bloodhounds and then caught by a local planter as he tried to approach his slave quarters in search of sanctuary. The desperate Confederate deserter got away as well and soon separated from the rest. The raiders later heard that the young man was eventually recaptured and hanged. David Fry also made good his escape, eventually returning to his hometown of Greenville, Tennessee, before returning to active service. His fellow East Tennessean, G. W. Barlow, was not so lucky. He heard his leg going over the fence and was quickly collared and dragged back to the jail. All in all, ten men had escaped, eight raiders, Fry, and the Confederate deserter. The only known casualty was the injury to the limping young Barlow. In the minds of a number of the raiders, this was an excellent showing for an escape attempt many had regarded as all but suicidal. Back in the jail... The recaptured raiders were locked in their cells, fearing for the retribution they were sure would come. They spent the remainder of the doleful night pondering their fate as they listened to the bragging of the guards outside. Generally they lauded their own bravery to the skies, telling how they had served the prisoners who had broken out upon them, Pittenger recalled. Occasionally, one who had not been present then would suggest that it did not show a great deal of bravery to let unarmed men snatch their guns from them, but such hinted slanders were always received with the contempt they deserved, and the work of self-praise went on. Provost Marshal G. W. Lee was in a towering passion at the breakout, riding to and fro on his horse as he directed a widespread and merciless search for the fugitives. He ordered nearby river ferries and key crossroads picketed, railroad lines guarded, and he showed no sign of the cordiality he had exhibited in earlier visits to the jail. Don't take one of the villains alive, Pittenger heard him say. Shoot them down and let them lie in the woods. His anger and embarrassment were certainly understandable, as it would be his unfortunate duty to explain the escape to the War Department and the Adjutant General in Charleston. In his report of the incident, which he would somehow manage to delay until mid-November, he complained of the inadequate force at his disposal and the carelessness of the elderly jailer, who had acted contrary to his instructions in opening the cell while alone and unarmed. Interestingly, Lee would attribute the escape to outside influences and his failure to recapture the fugitives to the great number of sympathizers found outside the jail. There were indeed Yankee sympathizers in the city, some of whom had extended small kindnesses to the Federal prisoners during their stay, but there is no evidence that any Atlantans were complicit in planning or aiding the dramatic escape. The morning after the jailbreak, 
an angry gaggle of local authorities arrived at the jail to interrogate the remaining inmates, roughly demanding that they reveal the course their comrades planned to take. The Ohio soldiers replied that the escapees had said only that Atlanta was in the middle of what was left of the Confederacy and that they planned to travel toward the outside. The Southern Confederacy reported the startling Escape of the Bridge Burners in its second edition the next day, though the story focused not on the engine thieves, but instead on the actions of Captain David Fry, the notorious and daring leader of the Tory band in the bridge-burning enterprise. Still, the raiders' return to the news columns was no small accomplishment, as the papers these days were largely preoccupied with reports of the ongoing campaign in Kentucky, an atrocious murder in Marietta, and the arrival of five northern locomotives recently captured at Warrenton and Manassas, including an engine named Old Abe, which the Southern Confederacy observed was pretty well battered up and has about as ill-favored a look as the arch-traitor after whom it was named. As for the escape, the papers blamed the guards, who have so long stood and lain around there night and day that they had ceased to be on the alert, but initially expressed confidence that the escapees would be quickly recaptured. Final escape we should consider impossible, the story concluded, but a week later, with the majority of the band still at large, the local editors would pronounce themselves entirely mystified at the unaccountable disappearance of the fugitives. The escape of these men is the most mysterious thing in the history of this section, the Confederacy wrote on October 25th. Their escape from the jail was known, and men were after them in less than half an hour. Mounted men were quickly beyond any point they could have reached and the most ceaseless activity and vigilance has been displayed by Colonel Lee. Men have been out constantly, night and day, scouring the country and watching in every direction, and no trace whatever of them has been found. The escaped prisoners scattered and scurried into the countryside like hares flushed from a thicket, each man striking out into the Georgia wilderness, for most of the state was still wilderness in those times, with a prearranged partner, Despite their jailhouse consultations on which course to pursue, each duo had a different view of the best way to go about reaching the Union lines. It was just as well that they did not know just how far they would have to travel to reach the safety of the Blue Armies, for Federal troops were no longer at the gates of Chattanooga, or holding Huntsville, or even garrisoned in Nashville. After the fall of Corinth, Mississippi, General Don Carlos Buell had been given instructions in early June to move eastward through northern Alabama along the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, finally coming to the aid of Old Stars, who had been pleading for meaningful support since his initial conquest in April. Much to the delight of President Lincoln, Buell moved his column, three divisions totaling 35,000 men, east to Huntsville, poised to join up with Mitchell's 10,000-man division near Bridgeport, along with Morgan's 9,000 at Cumberland Gap. The Army of the Ohio was on the move and would soon be united. They could capture Chattanooga and then make a prompt left-hand turn to Knoxville or a right toward Atlanta. The railroad was open, the troops in good spirits, Chattanooga still thinly defended, the weather perfect for campaigning. It seemed that the end of the war was in sight. Buell, however, saw nothing but problems. His supply lines were plagued by cavalry raids and sniper fire. Rolling stock for the railroad was scarce, resulting in interruptions in supply and ordnance and short rations for the men. Up ahead there was rugged terrain, swollen rivers, burned bridges, guerrilla activity. As a result, the initial march to Huntsville was followed by a month of idleness and fretting as Buell wrestled with difficulties both real and imagined. In Washington, Lincoln's delight again soured to disappointment. The President telegraphs that your progress is not satisfactory and that you should move more rapidly, General Halleck wrote to Buell on July 8th. Don Carlos was so stunned by this rebuke that he made no reply for three days. In the meantime, even Buell's own officers and men became increasingly frustrated with their cautious commander, as they marked time in the summer heat, transformed, as Shelby Foote put it, from happy-go-lucky soldiers into ill-fed railroad workers. Buell, one subordinate wrote in disgust, was an amiable idiot governed by the deliberate, cordial military policy of a dancing master, 
By your leave, my dear sir, we will have a fight, that is, if you are sufficiently fortified. No hurry, take your time. An Indiana soldier writing in his diary had a starker and more pessimistic view of the situation. This war will last four hundred years, he wrote. In early August, Buell sent a wire to Washington with a litany of excuses for the delay. I know I have not been idle or indifferent, he insisted. He promised that he would march upon Chattanooga at the earliest possible day, though he added a qualifier, unless I ascertain certainly that the enemy's strength renders it imprudent. Twelve days later, with Buell still immobile, a substantial Confederate column under the command of General Braxton Bragg was reported crossing the river in force at Chattanooga, in what would come to be recognized as the largest Confederate railroad movement of the war, Bragg had moved his 30,000-man force via a 776-mile circuitous route from central Mississippi through Mobile and Atlanta before appearing in Chattanooga. Buell's predictable reaction to the news of this threat was initially to pull back northwest up the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad to Detchard, Tennessee, and four days later to order an all-out withdrawal. His entire army, Mitchell's men included, retreated back to Nashville, firing the newly rebuilt railroad bridges in their wake. By mid-September, he was all the way up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, 150 crow flight miles from Chattanooga and 250 from Atlanta, thanks to a forward push by the harsh, irascible Bragg, whose rebel force was about half the size of Buell's reinforced army, and to an appalling lack of nerve by Buell himself, the Confederates had driven the Union Army from its hard-won positions in North Alabama and East Tennessee without firing a shot. Whatever the eventual strategic implications of these moves and counter-moves in the summer and fall of 1862, the practical result for the escaped Andrews Raiders was a drastic lengthening of the road to safety. Rather than facing a hundred or so mile trek to their comrades in North Alabama, the raiders would have to go north all the way to Kentucky, or west to Mississippi, scrounging for food and avoiding pursuers, rebel soldiers, and unfriendly civilians every step of the way. This they would have to accomplish, though all were weakened by six months of imprisonment with ragged clothes, tattered shoes, no provisions, no maps, no weapons, no transportation, and no friends. Incredibly, all eight would rise to meet the challenge. John Reed Porter paired up for the journey from Atlanta with John Wallum, who was assembling considerable experience by now in the business of breaking out of prison and running for his life. Everybody was wild with excitement, Porter said of the escape. Women screaming, men running, bells ringing, drums beating, dogs barking, in fact a regular stampede. The pair stopped running early on and covered themselves with leaves and brush to wait for full darkness. They were still close enough to hear the city's church and courthouse bells tolling the news of their escape. Because Wallum had come so close to reaching the Federal lines the last time he had fled, he saw little reason to change from his previous route. He and Porter struck out to the northwest, hoping to find their way to the winding avenue of the Tennessee River. The morsels they had saved from their last few meals would be their only food for the first twelve days out from Atlanta. As the country grew rugged and homesteads few and far between, they began to cautiously approach cottages and cabins from time to time in search of supplies. On two occasions they broke into homes where the families were absent, finding cornbread and meat for their trouble. They slept by day in caves or thickets, huddling together to keep warm as November arrived. After twenty-two days of sneaking and scrounging, they reached the Tennessee River, perhaps thirty miles below Bridgeport. They had no way of knowing it, of course, but the Federal Army was no longer occupying the majority of the hills and towns of northern Alabama. The two men found a canoe and soon were floating westward toward freedom. They traveled for three nights without food before securing a meat and cornbread dinner fried up by a kind woman supplemented by pots of delicious honey collected from some beehives near the river bank. The river was low this time of year, and they eventually had to abandon their canoe and travel on foot for nearly forty miles. They finally were able to return to the river and secure an abandoned skiff, which they floated until they were less than twenty miles from Corinth. On November 18, 1862, 
A month and two days after the jailbreak in Atlanta, Porter and Wallum spotted several wagons and teams driven by soldiers in blue coats. They emerged from the woods just four miles now from Corinth and identified themselves to the Federal soldiers. We were soon in the midst of a squad of the Ninth Iowa, but we still bore the resemblance of dilapidated rebels, Porter recalled. The pair was taken to an officer, who accused the Union infiltrators of being Confederate spies. From there they appeared before a lieutenant of the 20th Ohio, who seemed less skeptical, and then the provost marshal in Corinth, who remained unconvinced by their wild story, but directed that they be sent to the headquarters of Brigadier General Grenville Dodge. Only thirty-one years old, General Dodge was an officer of growing promise and reputation and a favorite of Sherman and Grant, who had just three days before appointed him to command the newly established Department of Corinth. A native of Massachusetts and now the pride of his adopted hometown, Council Bluffs, Iowa, Dodge had proven himself back in March at the Battle of Pea Ridge, Arkansas, where he had three horses shot from under him and was wounded in the right side. As the new commander of Union forces in the area, he was charged with guarding, repairing, and improving a 150-mile stretch of the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. In post-war years, Dodge would secure enduring fame as the chief engineer of the Union Pacific and a central designer and financier of the Transcontinental Railroad. He also happened to be an opportunistic and clever spymaster who employed slaves, freemen, and Union-loyal white Southerners to gather intelligence for his superior, General Grant. If any commander in the Union Army was likely to believe the far-fetched tale of espionage and escape spun by Wallam and Porter, it was Dodge. After a short interview, he recognized our true character and received a full detail of our adventures, Porter recalled. Not only did Dodge believe the two strangers, he had deep respect for their courage and demonstrated immediate concern for their well-being. Dodge ordered his quartermaster to furnish the escaped heroes with a full complement of clothing and blankets. He then gave them orders for transportation to their regiments along with a personal gift of five dollars apiece. We went to the quartermaster's department, drew our clothing, took a general clean-up, robed ourselves in army blue, Porter wrote. We felt that we were no longer fugitives and wanderers, but free men. Daniel Allen Dorsey and Martin Hawkins, too, would reach safety that same November 18th, though their route, their experiences, and their end point were entirely different. Instead of heading west toward Mississippi, Dorsey and Hawkins struck out to the northeast, hoping to reach Union-loyal East Tennessee and then Kentucky. In many respects, their story is like that of Porter and Wallum, five weeks of toil through forest and brush, marked by desperate close calls and debilitating hunger. But Dorsey and Hawkins would benefit. In fact, their lives were probably saved by a veritable underground railroad of slaves and loyalists who helped them on their way. The pair's first such encounter came eight days out, when they cautiously approached a pair of black men with hunting dogs, who promptly agreed to ferry them across the Chattahoochee River. One of the men went for provisions and returned with a feast of boiled pork, beans, Irish and sweet potatoes and cornbread. Dorsey remembered the generous offering as the first food worthy of the name we had eaten for six long months. This was a rugged region of caves and abandoned mines, their Samaritans told them, and they offered to hide the fugitives nearby. Hawkins and Dorsey declined. They wanted to keep moving. The two men gave them a broken-off butcher's knife to use on their journey, along with directions to the Hiawassee River and the name of a slave there who would ferry them across. They resumed their northward flight, traveling at night and resting by day, finally reaching the Hiawassee, where they hailed the dark-skinned ferryman and found him to be the same man who had been recommended to them. The young man persuaded them to hide with him for a couple of days until he could help them along downriver to the junction of the Hiawassee and the Tennessee. He treated us royally, sharing his scanty allowance of food with us, for he had only a slave's rations, doctored my ankle, kept us in his best bed, a feather one, and, on starting, gave us a bottle of molasses and a piece of pork, Dorsey said. Their host then found them a dugout canoe and sent them off down river to the Tennessee, though the Ohioans would decline to follow the great river west for the dangerous run past Chattanooga. 
Instead, they steered to the north bank and then struck out on foot north into the Cumberland Mountains. At times they almost enjoyed the peaceful solitude. The lofty peaks, the wide landscape, the rising and setting sun were doubly solemn in the profound silence, and amid the mighty forest of that region, Dorsey recalled, I can never forget the beauty of nature associated with so much peril. But for every such moment the pair spent miserable hours, days, and nights in what Dorsey would describe as very prosaic toil, struggling on hands and knees through a quarter-mile-wide mass of vicious briars, or stumbling from weakness and lack of sleep, or finding themselves so hungry that they dropped to the ground and felt in the darkness for fallen persimmons to eat. They forded the Sequatchie River, and for two days thereafter traveled and rested alternately in the mountains, hungry, wet with the rain that now began to fall, and as solitary as if we were the only inhabitants of the globe. Desperate for food, and so weak they repeatedly fell as they made their way along the rocky ground, Dorsey and Hawkins descended a steep slope and approached a group of men chopping wood to beg for something to eat. They told the woodsmen they were Confederate soldiers who had taken sick and been left behind in a hospital, and now were trying to return to their regiments. They found their story coolly received, and their request for assistance firmly rejected. Further conversation revealed that they were now in a so-called Lincoln District. It was said that only two votes in the entire county had been cast in favor of secession. At this, Dorsey and Hawkins revealed their true identities, and to their relief, the hospitality which had been denied before was now readily extended. The two soldiers soon found themselves not only fed, but again aided by a secret network of federal sympathizers who passed them safely along from one Lincolnite household to the next as they continued northward. In one such home they met an old gentleman, ninety years old, an enthusiastic Union man, who declared his intention to use his old rifle if the rebels ever bothered him or his neighbors, Dorsey fondly recalled. The old gentleman literally forced upon us a dollar, the last one he had. That same day marked the first time in seven months they had eaten three straight meals in succession. The pair made their way northward through Jamestown, Tennessee, and resuming travel on their own, crossed into Kentucky, arriving in Monticello in mid-November. There, a Union-friendly host gave them the name of his son-in-law, a Dr. McKinney in Somerset, who would find them transportation. The next day, the good doctor obtained passage for the two men on wagons that were going to Lebanon for salt, and Dorsey and Hawkins found their journey afoot, suddenly and very happily ended. I would like to tell how the old star-spangled banner looked to me as we saw it floating grandly in the evening breeze at Lebanon on that day, the 18th of November, 1862. But language fails me, Dorsey wrote. Their initial reception was similar to that experienced by Porter and Wallum. We were not very cordially received by the officers in charge as we bore a very striking resemblance to the paroled Confederates, Dorsey recalled. Though the commanders doubted their story, they were sent on to the local barracks, where they soon met soldiers from their own company. "'Dorsey, is that you?' one soldier cried out in amazement. From these friends we learned all about our comrades in arms, who had fallen in battle, who had been wounded, who discharged, something about friends at home, Dorsey recalled. He would later rejoin his full regiment at Murfreesboro, Tennessee, just thirty miles from Shelbyville, and just in time for the bloody year-end battle that would take place there. Just as they had been the first men to climb aboard the General on that gray April morning, the two engineers, William Knight and Wilson Brown, were the first to rush from the county jail and attack the guards and the first to reach the shelter of the woods. They made slow progress the first four days, however, as they half carried along with them Sergeant Elihu Mason, the latest of the raiders, to be crippled by illness. Brown and Knight ignored the sergeant's pleas that they leave him to die in the woods and save themselves, instead seeking help at a farmhouse just a few miles from Atlanta. There they were given food and a night's rest, but their breakfast the next morning was interrupted by three men searching for the Yankee fugitives. Brown and Knight had no choice but to abandon their sick friend and make a run for it. One of the pursuers turned his hounds loose after the fleeing pair, who fended the dogs off with rocks at close range and 
then again took to the woods. As the Southerners used to say after a battle, Knight recalled, we won the victory, but we evacuated the ground. From there, the two engineers began an incredible odyssey. The basic facts of their escape are simple to establish. They traveled more than three hundred grueling miles through the Blue Ridge and Great Smoky Mountains, probably following a route some distance east of that traveled by Dorsey and Hawkins, arriving at the Federal lines near Somerset, Kentucky in late November. Wilson Brown summarized the ordeal in a letter. How we subsisted forty-seven days and nights on chestnuts, roots, and green corn. How we traveled by the North Star as a guide. How we waded swamps, swam rivers, climbed mountains, and how we were pursued by bloodhounds and bloodthirsty rebels. How we were secreted in a cave by East Tennessee patriots. How we finally reached the Union lines in a rude condition. Every word true, but it reads like a romance. The story read like a romance indeed when Brown wrote his tale for a public audience nearly thirty years later. In 1890, no doubt aware of the numerous successful books published by his comrades William Pittenger and Alf Wilson, and openly jealous of the fame enjoyed by his former friend Will Knight, who Brown felt unfairly took all the credit as the engineer of the raid, Wilson Brown undertook to write his own version of their escape, Mitchell Raiders, Thrilling Incidents Never Before Published, he called his story, which ran as a series of articles in the North Baltimore, Ohio Weekly Beacon. His latter-day narrative of their adventure is one so plainly and heavily embroidered and embellished that it is difficult to discern truth from fiction. To hear Brown tell it, not only did he and Knight travel hundreds of miles and escape from many close scrapes with wild animals, gray soldiers, and local vigilantes, but they also were a formidable military force in their own right along the way. Using knives, clubs, and stolen or borrowed muskets, they killed numerous rebel bushwhackers outright, one they merely frightened to death and took down a number of bloodthirsty southern hounds. On one occasion, Brown asserted, they encountered an almost mythical monster of a brown snake six inches through the middle that Brown believed to be twenty feet long, Knight, he said, thought it was only eighteen. At another point, Knight was supposedly recaptured and taken to a Confederate encampment, where he was to be burned at the stake, no less. Brown, of course, claimed that he rescued his helpless friend just in the nick of time. Knight fails to corroborate any of these wild encounters, and a number of the Andrews raiders would later cast aspersions on their comrade Brown's credibility as well. Indeed, just as he made an uncorroborated claim that he had a personal interview with General Mitchell in Shelbyville back in April, Wilson Brown would also make an unverified claim that he was the first to receive a personal audience with Abraham Lincoln. Although it is impossible to either confirm or entirely discredit Brown's story, it is not difficult to appreciate just how outlandish his tale is. One simply has to read the entire ten-month weekly newspaper serial to Dis, believe it. One historian of the Andrews raid dismisses Brown's narrative entirely, calling it the wildest damn thing you ever read. Not surprisingly, William Knight's many public lectures, written accounts, and letters made no mention of these adventures. On the contrary, Knight's account is much more consistent with Brown's unpublished and presumably unembellished letter, How We Subsisted Forty-Seven Days and Nights, described previously, Leaving Atlanta behind them, the two soldiers struck out to the northeast through the rough terrain of North Georgia, reaching the Chattahoochee River after ten days of hard travel, without a bite to eat save what the woods furnished, such as nuts, bark, buds, etc. According to Knight, apart from the rock-throwing duel with the dogs when they left their friend Mason, the only violence committed by the two Ohioans was when they captured a defenseless wild goose and, some days later, a wild pig— which provided rations all the way to the Hiawassee River in North Carolina. The country was high, the air thin, and the terrain imposing. Mountains it took two men and a boy to see to the top of, Knight recalled. Contrary to Brown's rip-roaring tale of bloody battles in the woods with gray marauders, they met no Confederate soldiers at all. And the only armed encounter, according to Knight, was anticlimactic and thankfully resulted in no violence at all. In a deep mountain valley beside a river we met two men armed to the teeth, he said. 
We all stopped as if we had been shot, but quickly moved on again. We simply spoke when we met, and all seemed glad to get by without anything more to do with each other. Passing through the northeast corner of Tennessee, they came upon a riverside cabin, and after a cautious exchange with two men sitting on the porch, found that the family were friends of the Union. One of the men said that, for his part, he was opposed to the war. Knight recalled, We were too. He and Brown revealed themselves as Union soldiers and engine thieves, and their hosts, who had heard of their exploits in Georgia, gave them dinner, along with soap and water for a good wash, and offered to hide them for several days. That afternoon, the father led them to a nearby cave and supplied them with torches, quilts, and enough food to last them nearly a week. There was a good-sized room in the cave, Knight recalled, and he said we could have all the fire we wanted and halloo as loud as we pleased without danger. Knight and Brown ate and rested for five days in the relative comfort and safety of their mountain retreat. A guide then took them upriver to another old house in the woods, where another group of Union-friendly East Tennesseans provided them with another guide, ten dollars apiece to help along the way, and, for the first time in a year, a complete suit of fresh clothes. From there they were taken across the Tennessee River and passed along from house to house as they moved northward. This was comparatively easy traveling, and we passed rapidly and safely on till we reached our own lines, Knight remembered. We had spent forty-seven days and nights passing over some of the roughest country that ever laid out of doors. The story of Alf Wilson and Mark Wood's journey to safety was even more remarkable, and unlike Brown's odyssey, it also happened to be, at least mostly, true. Wilson was nothing if not creative, and his plan to reach the protection of the United States military was so counterintuitive as to be brilliant. Alf proposed that, rather than striking out northward or westward toward the Federal lines, he and Wood should escape Dixie by heading almost due south. They would make for the nearby Chattahoochee River, he told his English-born friend, and then find a boat and float down to the Gulf of Mexico. This would be easier than traveling by land and trying to keep their bearings at night in unfamiliar country, and it would also be exactly the opposite direction from the expected route where the rebels would be searching for them. The plan seemed then, and seems now, to be more than a little crazy, though in the end Wilson and Wood not only would make it, but would reach safety more than a week earlier than their north and westbound overland comrades. The two men spent a harrowing first night dodging rebel cavalry on the roads and then concealing themselves in thick brush as search parties were formed to scour the woods on foot. At one point, they crawled on their bellies to slip through a line of sentries posted no more than thirty paces apart. They pressed on through the night until they collapsed from exhaustion, unable to proceed a single step further. Despite their fatigue, both experienced a wild, almost childish joy at being free from the gloom of prison, with the bright, though still distant, prospect ahead of seeing family, friends, and home. But they had a long way to go and many trials ahead. What was more, they had little hope of encountering anyone without raising immediate suspicion due to their ragged clothes and their unmistakable jailbird look. Wilson realized this that first morning out, as he looked over his friend Wood as they rested under a great tree and ate their last crumbs of bread left over from the jail. The miserable garments he wore did not cover his nakedness. His face was begrimed with dirt almost set in the skin. He had become thin and emaciated with fever and had a ravenous appetite. His eyes were sunken in his head and seemed to have the wild, unnatural glare of a madman which, at times, almost made me shudder, Wilson recalled, and I suppose my own appearance was no more prepossessing than his. The pair concluded from this self-inspection that it would be unsafe to approach any house, and agreed that they would do the best they could to avoid being seen by any human being. Wilson's plan first required that they locate the Chattahoochee River, by no means a foregone conclusion, since neither man knew the country or the location of the river and had no map, compass, or other means of finding it. Wilson knew only that the river flowed by west of Atlanta and eventually reached the waters of the Gulf. He presumably obtained this paltry information through the lengthy jailhouse consultations about potential escape routes, as his own knowledge of southern maps and terrain, as he later admitted, was limited to a slight general idea I had of it from the school geographies. 
from its trickling headwaters in the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Chattahoochee follows a diagonal northeast to southwest course as it slashes through north-central Georgia, passing at one point within ten miles of the jail. But Wilson and Wood, navigating by the stars, set out on a course slightly south of west, perhaps even running parallel to the river for a time, and therefore lengthened the distance and the time to reach the river. Passing through rough, heavily forested country, they soon came upon the northeast to southwest running line of the Atlanta and West Point Railroad and felt reassured that their course was about right. Their confidence soon faltered, however, as they traveled for four days and nights without finding the river they had thought to be nearby. Along the way, they ate nothing but raw ears of corn and soon found themselves so weak from hunger and their feet so bruised and sore they could hardly continue. At one point, Mark Wood crawled along on his hands and knees for a considerable distance in order to spare his blistered feet. Alf, he said to his friend, what's a fellow's life but a curse to him when he has to drag it out in this way? I would rather be dead and be done with it. Wilson felt much the same way. I sometimes wondered, like Job of old, why my afflictions were so great, he later wrote. After several more hours of this creeping progress, they heard off to the right the welcome sound of rushing water and soon found themselves standing on the banks of the Chattahoochee. Here was hope and inspiration to continue. De Soto did not feel more joy when he first discovered the Mississippi, Wilson recalled. They waded out into the water, cooling their blistered feet and drinking their fill. A short distance downstream they located a skiff and in minutes were gliding quietly down the green-brown current. I doubt if two more joyful mortals ever navigated a canoe than we two with that stolen little craft, Wilson remembered. Alf Wilson and Mark Wood spent the next three weeks traveling down the Chattahoochee, paddling for hours each night and resting during the day, though sleep was hard to come by thanks to their gnawing hunger and swarms of gnawing mosquitoes. Their hunger even haunted them as they slept. I could, while sleeping, see in my dreams tables spread and groaning with loads of good things to eat. Bread, meat, cheese, coffee, biscuit and butter were all within my reach, Wilson recalled. But the waking reality was all too different. Nothing but the ears of hard corn they found almost indigestible. They soon broke their initial pledge to avoid other people at all costs, and made their way from the river to the isolated home of a couple of quite intelligent but unsophisticated old people in comfortable circumstances, where they claimed to be hungry soldiers in search of the nearby ferry and, if possible, something to eat. I had been in Dixie so long that I had acquired from the guards and citizens their vernacular of speech quite perfectly, Wilson said. Besides this, we had learned the names of officers and the number of different regiments, such as the 8th Georgia Cavalry, 5th Tennessee Infantry, etc., until we were able to tell quite a plausible story, if not too closely questioned, Wilson recalled. The couple invited them in and told them they were welcome to such food as they had as they devoured everything the woman put before them, the man told them the latest news from Atlanta. A number of the Yankee raiders had overpowered the guards and escaped from jail, he said, and had not yet been caught. We expressed great surprise that such a piece of audacity could be made successful in Atlanta, Wilson said. Reinvigorated by the meal, Wilson and Wood returned to their little boat and resumed their southward cruise, though they soon discovered that river travel was not always quiet paddling on glassy water. On one occasion, Wilson suddenly found himself flat on his back in the cold river, frightened by the shock and suddenness of the blow. What on earth had happened? I did not know the accident had been so sudden, he recalled. I thought of earthquakes, whales, sharks, torpedoes, and many other things. Wood fished him out of the water, and they found the cause to be much less dramatic. He had been knocked back by a ferryboat wire stretched across the river, just low enough to catch him as he sat high in the stern of the boat. Another night, as they made their way further south, the river sped faster with ledges, rocks, and rapids to contend with, and later a mill dam which they ran past with the velocity of an express train. The churning river soon grew so rough that they had no choice but to abandon their craft and take up again on foot. For three more nights, 
the two privates hobbled through the rocky terrain. The next morning, dawn revealed the spires and smokestacks of the city of Columbus, the head of commercial navigation for the Chattahoochee, still almost two hundred winding river miles north of the Gulf of Mexico. With much of the cotton trade choked off by the blockade, Columbus had been transformed from a cotton port to a manufacturing center, arsenal, and shipyard, working in support of the Confederate Army and Navy. Wilson and Wood kept to the tree line as they circled wide around the town, hearing all the while a constant clattering sound as of a hundred workmen with hammers. As they drew back close to the river early the next morning, they saw the cause of the ruckus. Construction was proceeding on a powerful gunboat, its decks and its sloping hull swarming with workmen sheathing it with iron. Wilson would later come to believe that the ship was the fearsome rebel ironclad Chattahoochee, which was being outfitted at Columbus to pose single-handedly a deadly threat to the Union blockade in the Gulf. Nothing would come of this plan. The Chattahoochee would explode and sink near the mouth of the Flint River in May 1863. Wilson and Wood stayed hidden in the piney woods outside Columbus for two additional days and nights, as the still ailing Wood nursed his sore feet and Wilson prowled up and down the riverbank in search of another boat. They eventually discovered one, a leaky old concern that required constant bailing as well as paddling, and later swapped it out for a flat boat farther downstream. Thus we progressed, traveling by boat at night and laying by in the daytime, Wilson wrote, they crept in the darkness past upbound steamboats and tiny riverbank settlements with names like Egypt and Fowlstown and Argyle. They floated by countless creeks, runs, inlets, and tributaries as the Chattahoochee wound its way southward and eventually joined with the Flint to form the Apalachicola River. The river scenery became particularly monotonous as the landscape flattened and mountains and rocks gave way to fields and marshes. Hunger remained their principal enemy, and they subsisted for nearly two weeks on nothing more than corn, roots, raw pumpkins, and pumpkin seeds. When I look back and think of those long, painful, hungry nights and days, I wonder how it was possible that we kept up, Wilson later wrote. I do not think I could withstand the same deprivation again, although a man does not know what he can endure until he tries it. As they moved from woodland to swamp, Mother Nature threw additional terrors and torments at the two desperate fugitives. First, there were the omnipresent, bloodthirsty mosquitoes, which swarmed over the wide patches of skin left bare by their torn clothing. Wilson and Wood covered themselves with mud and great skeins of moss from the marshy banks, worsening their already grimy appearance, though amazingly, the moss seemed effective in fending off the skeeters and protecting them from the sun. They also saw large numbers of moccasin snakes, coiled on the banks or swimming in the brown river. But their greatest terror was the alligators, a strange and fearsome species Wilson would remember as a ferocious, hungry, dangerous-looking beast. They would wake from a daytime nap only to find every hammock and log around them covered with gators watching them listlessly and lazily with eyes almost shut, looking hungrily and quizzically out of one corner of their wicked peepers. The superstitious Englishman Wood worried that these creatures posed not only a great physical danger but were also a bad omen, like the sharks he had heard in seafaring legend would follow in the wake of a doomed ship. Their prospects improved considerably when, while out scrounging for food, Wilson found some lines and fish hooks in a vacant cabin near the river. They soon enjoyed a dinner of raw catfish, which seemed at the time a great improvement over raw corn. What was more, the widening river and other signs indicated that they were nearing the gulf. Inquiring in a nearby cabin, Alf learned that they were just five miles from Apalachicola and that the Federal blockading squadron held the bay beyond the town. Meanwhile, Wood had collected an armload of sweet potatoes, Stopping in a cane break, the two men cooked up their first decent meal in weeks. Here we secreted ourselves and built a little fire, roasted fish and potatoes, parched corn, and dined in right royal style, although we felt the need of a little salt, Wilson remembered. 
After another night's travel, they awoke to find themselves on a sandy shore lined with orange, lemon, and palm trees. Knowing nothing of the rising and falling of tide water, Wilson was dumbfounded to see their boat high and dry, two hundred yards from the edge of the water where they had left it. After an hour of sweating and tugging to drag their little craft back to the water's edge, the two men paddled out toward an island with a smattering of dead trees, at one point stopping alongside a bar where wood reached down and appeared to crack open a muddy stone and eat from it. Wilson thought his hungry comrade had finally lost his mind completely. "'Taste this,' Wood said to his land-loving friend Alf, who lapped up from the shell the sweet, plump flesh of an oyster. "'I think I never tasted anything so delicious,' he later said. Their feast on raw oysters was cut short, however, as slow realization dawned that the dead trees they had seen were not trees at all, but instead were the spindly masts of a number of ships anchored in the sound just beyond the island. They rowed back out into the bay at a lively rate, and Wilson would later describe their approach to the flotilla. We were now nearing the ships very fast, and were a little anxious to see their colors, as we had become so suspicious of everybody and everything that we half feared running into the clutches of our enemies. But we were not long in suspense, for suddenly a little breeze sprang up, and I shall never, no, never forget my joy on seeing the old flag, the glorious old stars and stripes as they unfolded to the ocean breeze and seemed to extend their beneficent protection over us. After nearly eight months of terrible bondage, we could see the field of blue studded with golden stars and the stripes of white and red. Yes, it was our flag, old E. Pluribus Unum. We threw down our paddles in the boat and stood up and yelled and screamed and cried like a couple of foolish boys lost in the woods. We could not restrain ourselves. They manned their paddles with newfound strength and steered a course for the nearest of the three ships visible. As they drew closer, they could see the portholes, the muzzles of the cannons, officers and men crowded near the deck rail in clean blue uniforms. The ship was the USS Somerset, a 521-ton side-wheel steamer with 110 souls and six guns aboard. The converted ferry boat was one of dozens of ships belonging to the U.S. Navy's East Gulf Blockading Squadron, assigned to seal off the Florida coast from Cape Canaveral all the way around to Pensacola. Her skipper was Lieutenant Commander Alexander F. Crossman, a St. Louis-born, Pennsylvania-raised graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, who, though only 24 years old, somehow managed not only the demeanor, but also the appearance of a crusty old sea dog. Crossman regarded his present orders, guarding St. George's Sound and Apalachicola Bay, as particularly important to the Union cause. Not only was it necessary to choke off river access up to Columbus, which he described as one of the grand depots and sources of strength of the Confederacy, but also the city of Apalachicola itself was in his eyes an important strategic point inasmuch as its possession ensures a base for any operations upon the interior of Georgia and Alabama. Now here were Wilson and Wood, paddling up like a pair of forlorn Crusoes, castaways from a faraway and very landlocked Atlanta jail, as if to give dramatic proof to Crossman's point about the accessibility of the interior of Georgia. "'Come to there,' Crossman barked. "'Who in hell are you, and what are you paddling under my guns in this manner for?' Wilson, taken aback by this angry interrogation, stood and meekly replied that they were two men trying to get back to God's country among friends. It was only then that he again became conscious of his strange appearance." We had been so overjoyed and excited that we had forgotten to pull off the old moss, which covered our nakedness and protected us from the sun, from our backs, and we must have looked like scarecrows or swamp dragons. Crossman demanded additional explanation, whereupon Wilson told him that he and Wood were enlisted Federal soldiers from the command of General O. M. Mitchell in Tennessee. "'You're a damn long ways from camp,' Crossman growled, an accurate observation indeed." They had traveled more than four hundred miles from Atlanta, most of that distance on the winding river, and they were more than six hundred miles from the present encampment of the 3rd Division. Wilson explained that they were fugitives from a Confederate prison 
that they were famished and that they had traveled through mountains and forest and then down the river to seek protection under the old flag. At this, the young, old sea dog seemed to soften and reached out a hand to help the two men up the ladder and over the rail himself. The sailors aboard were horrified at the appearance of the two castaways, and their commander's sympathy for them soon gave way to sulfurous anger at the damned Confederates who would do such a thing to good Union men. He raved and swore as he paced up and down and stamped the deck until the air seemed fairly blue with brimstone, Wilson recalled. I think if he could have gotten hold of old Jefferson Davis or some other first-class rebel about that time, he would have hung him and then tried him afterwards. Wilson and Wood were taken to Crossman's cabin, where they were first fortified with a few swallows of brandy before being sent aft for their first wash with soap in more than seven months. They were, Wilson said, shown the utmost kindness, their wounds and sores treated and dressed. They were given sailors' clothes and then returned to the commander's quarters for dinner. As they ate, Crossman told them they were welcome to stay and recuperate as long as they wanted, but both soldiers expressed a desire to get back to some part of the Federal lines where they could report and hopefully do something to save their imprisoned comrades in Atlanta. Arrangements were made for the men to be transferred to a nearby cruiser bound for the blockading squadron's base at Key West, Florida. As they prepared to depart, Crossman handed them letters of introduction he had written to the commandant at Key West, along with a generous supply of his best tobacco. He saw them off with a hearty farewell handshake and wishes for a safe voyage and better fortune in the future. Wilson and Wood climbed down into a boat to be rowed across to the steamer anchored nearby. They took note of her name stenciled on the dark wood of her hull, Stars and Stripes. A short time later the ship weighed anchor and was underway for the four-day journey to Key West. Alf Wilson climbed up to the upper deck and stood alone at the rail. He was clean, well-fed, wearing fresh clothes, and most of all safe from any danger. His mind was filled with gratitude and amazement at the change in his present condition and his future prospects. Tears welled up in the young Ohio soldier's eyes as, for the first time in his life, he gazed out on the ocean. Part 4 Valor Chapter 15 The Medal of Honor The War Department and the White House. The expedition itself, in the daring of its conception, had the wildness of a romance, while in the gigantic and overwhelming results which it sought and was likely to accomplish, it was absolutely sublime. Joseph Holt, Judge Advocate General, U.S. Army, report to Honorable Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War, March 27, 1863. The United States of America had no military medals at the outset of the Civil War. Some eighty years before, the young nation's revolutionary leaders, hoping to shore up morale as the struggle for independence ground to a close and unreliable funding left many soldiers unpaid, had sown the seeds of such awards, but none of these early efforts had taken root. In 1782, General George Washington issued from his headquarters at Newburgh, New York, a field order establishing a decoration known as the Badge of Military Merit to recognize those members of the Continental Army who performed any singular meritorious action. The author of such an action, Washington's order said, shall be permitted to wear on his facings over his left breast the figure of a heart in purple cloth or silk edged with narrow lace or binding. Only three of these citations are known to have ever been awarded, however, and the badge quickly fell into disuse. In 1932, this oldest of American decorations would be revived by the War Department and reconstituted as the Purple Heart, honoring the sacrifice of soldiers and sailors who literally shed blood in service of their country. But in the mid-nineteenth century, with the exception of a Certificate of Merit briefly awarded during the Mexican War, the United States military had no means for recognizing gallantry or valor by the soldiers in its ranks. Perhaps there was little perceived need for such an award in those days, as the scattered, undersized, and largely unappreciated U.S. Army manned far-flung forts and outposts and skirmished now and then with Indian tribes. 
The epic scale and the high stakes of the Civil War would change the reputation of the American military and engender newfound esteem and national affection for the men who marched in its ranks. In the weeks and months after Fort Sumter, not only the nation's professional soldiers, but men and boys from all walks of life, farmers and mill workers, lawyers and university professors, shopkeepers and longshoremen, neighbors and family members, would be fighting for the Union, carrying with them the hopes and pride of their communities. What was more, many of these volunteers would prove themselves to be not only local but actual heroes, committing acts of bravery and self-sacrifice on battlefields across the land. The idea for creating a medal to recognize and reward the extraordinary courage often demonstrated by American soldiers originated with 44-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Edward Davis Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General in the War Department. Born to a prominent Boston family, Townsend was a graduate of Harvard and West Point and a brave and brilliant man in his own right. He had served in the Army since his graduation from the Academy at the age of 20 and was a third-generation American soldier. His grandfather was an Army surgeon during the Revolution, and his father lost a leg at the Battle of Chrysler's Farm in the War of 1812. He had risen through the ranks steadily but slowly over the course of his 24-year Army career, and after Fort Sumter was posted in Washington as Chief of Staff to the legendary General-in-Chief of the Army, Lieutenant General Winfield Scott. His interests and his talents extended far beyond the realm of military administration, however, and he spent his spare hours as a respected biblical scholar, publishing catechisms on the Pentateuch and the Old Testament books of Judges and Kings. Though he did most of his soldiering behind a desk, Townsend's energy and imagination would leave an enduring mark on the nation's history. Not only was he instrumental in creating the Medal of Honor, but would also help to establish a permanent and soon-to-be-famous military prison at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. In the fall of 1861, as the early months of the war passed by without a substantial victory or even a meaningful advance by Union forces, Townsend, like many other rear echelon planners in Washington, found himself searching for methods, great and small, to inspire the troops and the nation. As he walked along the wooden sidewalks near the War Department and Willard's Hotel, he was struck by the gaudy, proliferate ribbons and medals worn by European soldiers of fortune and foreign military delegates to the city. He also noted the awe and respect that the decorations seemed to engender among those who saw them. Military medals were a well-established tradition in Europe by that time. Napoleon established the Légion d'Honneur, a chivalric order, in 1802, King Frederick Wilhelm III of Prussia introduced the Iron Cross in 1813, and Britain began awarding the Victoria Cross in 1856, honoring redcoat heroes from the thin red line in the Crimean War. As a student of military history, Townsend was well aware of these decorations, and it troubled him that the United States had nothing even remotely comparable. Commissioned officers in the Union Army who demonstrated particular merit could be rewarded by brevet promotions, an honorary increase in rank with no commensurate adjustment in pay, and if these brevets were often tainted by politics, conniving, and favoritism, they were nonetheless desired and respected in the officer corps. Yet no similar reward, however imperfect, was available to the vast numbers of enlisted men then fighting for flag and country. Townsend believed that a new battlefield decoration, one that could be awarded to soldiers of all ranks and would become widely known and highly regarded, would serve to encourage the common soldiers of the army and inspire them to great and gallant conduct. Accordingly, he penned a memorandum in the fall of 1861, suggesting that the United States Army follow the example of the nations of Europe and establish a medal for valor. General Scott firmly rejected this suggestion condemning not only the specific proposal but the general concept of such an award as being contrary to the spirit of American institutions. The United States was a republic, after all, decidedly and deliberately lacking in aristocracy and blue-blood orders, knighthoods, and the like. Scott not only believed that the idea smacked of old-world vanity, elitism, and snobbery, he also thought that such an award was entirely unnecessary— 
Surely volunteer soldiers fighting for the Union could be counted on to do their duty without such incentives. In General Scott's defense, Queen Victoria had much the same reaction with regard to the cross that bore her name. The medal had originally been inscribed, For Bravery, but the Queen thought that implied that only recipients of the Victoria Cross were brave. She had the legend changed to read, For Valor. There was some irony and no little hypocrisy in General Scott's position. The elderly commander was famously known as Old Fuss and Feathers, fond of all manner of affected glory and military foppery. Antebellum photographs of the great general show his stern visage scowling above a huge neck and shoulders adorned with epaulettes and tassels and a massive chest fairly rampaging with buttons, medals, ribbons, tassels, and gold embroidery. The seventy-five-year-old Scott was well past his prime, and soon to be supplanted as general-in-chief, and due to his departure in the first act of the unfolding drama, his role in the Civil War is often minimized today, but at the time he was an American icon, a great hero of a fifty-year career that spanned the War of 1812, the Black Hawk War, the Second Seminole War, the Mexican War, and the Civil War, so much so that the astounded interjection, Great Scott, appears to have been inspired by the legendary general. He had served every president from Thomas Jefferson to Abraham Lincoln, and his views were given considerable weight at the time. There would be no Medal of Honor so long as General Scott had anything to say about it. Soon, however, two events would clear the way for the creation of what would come to be the Army Medal of Honor. First was Scott's retirement in October 1861, and second was the United States Navy's adoption of its own Medal of Honor in December. General Scott may have had his entrenched ideas about the broad social implications of military decorations, but Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells held no such qualms. What was more, Wells was continually in search of ways to encourage young men to sign on or re-enlist for the hard, solitary, and too often short life of a sailor in the U.S. Navy. Having heard of Townsend's proposal, either from seeing his memorandum or through hallway conversations at the White House or the Navy Department, he adopted the idea of establishing a decoration to recognize and honor distinguished service in the seafaring ranks. On December 21, 1861, President Lincoln signed into law an otherwise unremarkable bill to promote the efficiency of the Navy, which included within it a provision for a Navy Medal of Valor, to be bestowed upon such petty officers, seamen, landsmen, and marines as shall most distinguish themselves by their gallantry and other seamen-like qualities during the present war, not to be left behind and freed of the formidable obstacle of General Scott, the army soon followed suit. In July 1862, Lincoln signed a bill creating the Army Medal of Honor, which would similarly be awarded to such non-commissioned officers and privates as shall most distinguish themselves by their gallantry in action and other soldier-like qualities during the present insurrection. In early 1863, Congress amended the original legislation in a number of respects. First, it dropped the limitation to the present insurrection, making the Medal of Honor a permanent decoration that could be awarded beyond the Civil War. Second, it clarified that the medal could be awarded retroactively for acts dating back to the start of the war, and third, it broadened eligibility to include commissioned officers as potential recipients as well. The medal was originally designed by Christian Schussel and its prototype created by assistant engraver Anthony C. Peckett at the United States Mint in Philadelphia. The Medal of Honor is bronze, of neat device, and is highly prized by those on whom it has been bestowed, Townsend wrote in an 1864 report. Its original design, embodied first in the Navy Medal, was an inverted five-pointed star, each point containing leaves of oak, representing strength, and laurel, representing achievement, faced with a circle of thirty-four stars, one for each of the United States. Within the circle is the figure of Minerva, the Roman goddess of civic strength and wisdom, her left hand holding an axe bound with fasces, and her right holding a shield emblazoned with the arms of the United States. The goddess stands triumphant, firmly repulsing a cowering, serpent-entwined figure representing discord, or, as one Unionist said, 
the foul spirit of secession and rebellion. The Navy Medal was suspended from a flag-like ribbon with a field of blue above and thirteen red and white stripes below with an anchor at the lower clasp. The Army Medal would have a similar ribbon and pendant, but substituted an eagle and crossed cannons for the Navy's anchor. Notwithstanding the provision in the legislation that allowed the medal to be bestowed retroactively, and despite the bloody struggles and acts of personal gallantry on dozens of fields, from Manassas to Shiloh to Antietam to Stones River, as of March 1863, the War Department had not awarded a single Medal of Honor. Congress had passed legislation appropriating funds for the medals to be purchased from the manufacturer William Wilson and Sons of Philadelphia at a cost of two dollars each. The Navy Department initially ordered just two hundred medals, the Army, apparently having a different view of how lavishly the decoration was to be awarded, ordered 2,000. Shortly thereafter, the War Department had received its first shipment of medals, stacked in silk-lined wooden cases in the office of Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton. The Secretary had his medals. Now all he needed was a soldier, or soldiers, worthy of the award. Back in Atlanta, the Andrews Raiders, once twenty-four in number as they met under the gathering storm outside Shelbyville, had been reduced to a mere half-dozen by their comrades' successive departures to the gallows and then to the woods. The eight escapees all returned promptly to active duty, Brown, Knight, Porter, Wilson, and Wood to the 21st Ohio Regiment, and Dorsey, Hawkins and Wallum to the 33rd, which was then recovering from hard knocks suffered at the Battle of Perryville. Both Buckeye regiments would in the months to come be exposed to vicious fighting on fields from Murfreesboro to Missionary Ridge to Chickamauga. Our old comrades received us almost as two who had come to them from the dead, Alf Wilson remembered. Considering their lengthy confinement in southern prisons and their respective treks to freedom, the returned soldiers showed remarkable resiliency in their eagerness to return to their companies and share the hardship of the winter and early spring campaigns. After a few days' rest, I was again ready for duty, Porter said simply. The six Yankee soldiers left behind in the Fulton County Jail, William Bensinger, Robert Buffum, Elihu Mason, Jacob Parrott, William Pittenger, and William Reddick, spent the days just after the jailbreak in fearful apprehension of being tried and executed themselves, or at least of suffering retaliatory treatment and new humiliations in the name of Titan's security. On the contrary, however, after the Provost Marshal Colonel Lee's initial irritation at the escape wore off, they enjoyed what one described as the mildest and most humane treatment we received during our whole sojourn in the Confederacy— Colonel Lee, understandably disappointed in the lackadaisical security provided by the civilian county jail, had the prisoners moved to a rebel barracks two blocks from the depot, where they would be kept under constant watch by a company of gray soldiers. Along with a handful of prisoners of war and ten of the East Tennesseans, they were placed in a large upstairs room with tall windows, an open fireplace, and a gas burner that was kept lighted all night. Their diet also improved considerably." Meals of bread and meat sometimes served at a rude wooden table in an adjacent common mess room. The food was still doled out in modest quantities, to be sure, but was supplemented with soup and an occasional treat, sweet potatoes, which the inmates roasted in the ashes of the open fire. They were also granted the luxury of a daily opportunity to wash themselves, which improved not only the appearance and the odor, but also the morale of the entire party. After suffering through the pit in Chattanooga, the iron cages and hard confinement of the county jail and the ever-present specter of the gallows, the prisoners found these new quarters to be a blessed relief, a place where we could rest for a little time from the storms that had swept over us. The raiders' previous interest in religious matters admittedly waned as comforts increased and peril receded. Reverend MacDonald made no more visits to the jail— and the soldiers' hymns and religious services became more infrequent. A few of our numbers seemed to think that now that we were not in a dark cell and were treated more as regular prisoners, there was no need of so much prayer, Pittenger observed, but the majority clung to the good resolutions made in dark hours. 
The burden of Pittenger's own confinement was further lightened when the commander of the barracks, Major Jack Wells, spotted him making shorthand notes in the margin of a book. What kind of crow tracks are you making there? the officer asked as he stood peering over Pittenger's shoulder. The young corporal replied that he was only writing to pass the time, and he did his best to explain the method behind his seemingly mad penmanship. Suitably impressed by this, Wells soon had him working in his office as a clerk, filling out requisitions and writing daily reports. Pittenger felt that no harm could come to the United States by his assisting a Southern officer in such menial tasks, and he drew a careful though illusory distinction between working for Major Wells as requested and working for the benefit of the Confederacy, which he steadfastly refused to do. He also justified his new trusty position as a means to observe the workings of the rebel post and gather intelligence for his comrades. Apart from that, there is little to tell of the remaining weeks the remnant of Andrews's party spent languishing in Atlanta. The excitement and danger of the summer and early fall gave way to a dull, repetitive daily haze of claustrophobia and mind-numbing ennui. Raiders who would later fill volumes recording their adventures on the raid and the ordeal of the first months spent in Chattanooga and Atlanta jails would make little comment on and describe but few anecdotes as the year 1862 neared its end. Few things occurred worthy of note, Pittenger wrote, adding, the same monotony which makes prison life so dreadful robs it of interest when recorded. All this would change at the beginning of December. Without warning, a delegation of Confederate officers arrived at the barracks, called the prisoners into line, with great manifestations of friendliness, and announced, you have all been exchanged, and all that now remains is for us to send you out of our territory. It was not quite as simple as that, as the raiders would learn. They would first be sent to Richmond for further processing before the final exchange. Major Wells directed his clerk, Pittenger, to write out a requisition for rations for them to take along on their trip northward, but the Ohio corporal's hands were shaking so badly that he had to pass the task along to someone else. They were to depart that same evening, and they spent the afternoon preparing for the trip, though they found they had little to pack. The order that would enable and accompany their transfer enclosed a list of the six raiders plus fourteen other prisoners slated for eventual exchange, and warned the brigadier general commanding in Richmond that the transferred prisoners have been confined here some time, and are many of them a desperate, bad set of men. They were marched to the depot in the sharp chill of the December evening, accompanied by Major Wells, who was drunker than usual, Pittenger recalled, and a ten-man escort that would see them to Virginia. Wells hiccuped an affectionate farewell, and the prisoners took their last look at Atlanta, though some among them would return to the city two years later in the company of General Sherman. Prisoner exchanges in the Civil War were intermittent, inconsistent, and often arbitrary. At the start of the war, the United States had refused to consider a system of exchange at all, fearing that such formal arrangements with the enemy would lend an air of legitimacy or even sovereignty to the newly established Confederate government. This prohibition of exchanges was soon to be honored more in the breach than the observance, however, as front-line commanders, both blue and gray, negotiated unofficial exchanges on the battlefield due to practical necessity or the dictates of humanity. What was more, by late 1861, the unkind fortunes of war and the reality of the relative numbers of captured men weighed heavily on Washington to establish an exchange, as the jails and camps of the undersized Confederacy held far more federal prisoners than the Union held rebels. After months of negotiations, limited exchanges, and official reluctance, a cartel was finally reached in July 1862, the months that followed were plagued with problems on both sides and accusations of dishonesty, unfair treatment, and fraud. Still, thousands of prisoners were exchanged under the cartel, facilitated by an agreed-upon system of military mathematics that held all men far from equal. One brigadier general, for example, could be exchanged for twenty privates. The precarious system of exchange was threatened again in the fall, Jefferson Davis retaliated against Lincoln's preliminary Emancipation Proclamation by issuing a proclamation of his own. Any white Union officer captured while leading black soldiers in battle 
would be charged with leading a slave insurrection and would be subject to the penalty of death. Union Secretary of War Stanton responded by immediately suspending the exchange of all commissioned officers, though to the ultimate good fortune of the surviving Andrews Raiders, the exchange of enlisted men unto the cartel would continue through the spring of 1863. The six raiders arrived in Richmond after a frigid, halting three-day boxcar trip by way of Dalton, Cleveland, Knoxville, and Lynchburg. Richmond is a beautiful city, but we saw little of its attractions on this first visit, Pittenger wrote. They were marched from the station and first taken to Libby Prison, a three-story brick warehouse confiscated from and named for its former owner, Luther Libby. This initial billet was, the raiders thought, an encouraging sign. They had heard that Libby Prison was the place where prisoners were taken on their way to City Point, where exchanges were completed. They took further comfort in their fellow inmates at Libby, which included a large number of prisoners of war. For the first time in months, the raiders saw men in dark blue United States uniforms. Their hopes were dashed again next morning, however, when they were called out of line and marched down the street to more fearsome and seemingly more permanent quarters, Castle Thunder, the Bastille of the South, Richmond's most notorious wartime prison. Castle Thunder was a three-building complex anchored by the former Gleaner Tobacco Factory, a large brick building at the corner of Cary and 18th Streets that had been opened and christened the previous summer. The Richmond Daily Inquirer had pronounced the new prison's name as good as any other that could be chosen, believing it appropriately indicative of Olympian vengeance upon offenders against her laws. The brutality of the prison was none too mythical, with widespread cruelty practiced both upon and among the prison's 1,400 inmates, a criminal menagerie that included every kind of offender, as one Virginia historian noted, with little segregation between a soldier and a sociopath. The commandant of the prison was Georgia-born Captain George W. Alexander, a 32-year-old hard case who had been captured by federal authorities in Maryland and sentenced to death for treason, whereupon he escaped from Fort McHenry and made his way to Richmond. He had been given command of Castle Thunder in November, and he ruled his grim domain like a dastardly storybook villain. Dressed in black from head to boots, he clattered about prison grounds and city streets on a great black horse, his long black beard flowing behind him. His constant companion was the prison's most famous and most feared guard, a vicious Bavarian boarhound named Nero. The dog was legendary. It was said that he had fought three battles with full-grown wild bears and won each time, and that he was trained to attack anyone wearing blue. As a jailer, Alexander was a far cry from the cruel drunken bumbler Swims in Chattanooga, and the well-meaning but inept warden Turner in Atlanta. He imposed rigorous, heartless security, his sentries always watchful for a chance to shoot any inmate who moved too close to one of the building's windows. The Richmond papers praised Alexander for the faultless system he employed at the prison. Everything was in apple pie order, the inquirer said, its editors fond of referring to new inmates at the jail as being thunderstruck. The Richmond Whig noted in December, a man who once gets in there has little disposition to try it a second time, for, however much care may be bestowed upon its management, no human effort could make a paradise of such a place as that. The raiders, huddling for warmth and wary of their new cellmates, found Castle Thunder far from a paradise indeed. Gaslights were used for illumination, and water was generally available, but the rooms were frigid, the floors filthy, the latrines open and putrid, and the enclosed yard used not for exercise but for executions by firing squad. In this cheerless place our party, six in number and the nine remaining Tennesseans, fifteen in all, were confined during the months of December and January, Pittenger recorded. We did not suffer from crowding or lack of air as in the swims dungeon, but other evils endured, especially cold and hunger, were scarcely less tormenting than the inflictions of that vilest of all dens. 
In early February, the raiders were moved from their initial cell into a large upper floor with the general population, one so spacious that for a time it seemed like freedom by comparison. What was more, the great room had a stove, and the constant torture of cold could now be held at bay. They spent another six weeks in this confinement, their only pleasures being a daily opportunity to read the Richmond newspapers, followed in the evening by a gathering around the stove of a gang of unpredictable ruffians by day who turned to enthralling storytellers after dark. I would sometimes join them and listen for a great part of the night to some of the finest fairy tales and most romantic legends it has ever been my fortune to hear, Pittenger remembered. In these last weeks of imprisonment, the six raiders survived an outbreak of smallpox, continued deprivation and despondency, hours of menial labor, devised more for pain and demoralization than for any actual result, as well as nightly robberies and fistfights among their less reputable peers. Finally, on March 17, 1863, as the many Irish-born prisoners at Castle Thunder marked St. Patrick's Day, an officer abruptly entered and barked an unusual order. All who want to go to the United States fall into line and come into the office. It occurred to some of the raiders that, in their view, they were already in the United States, but now was certainly not the time to raise such trifling political distinctions. There was a rush and a scramble to the middle of the floor, and no line was ever formed more promptly, Pittenger recalled. Names were taken, lists checked and rechecked, individual paroles signed, and arrangements made for the prisoner's departure the next morning. After a night of fitful sleep and fearful suspense, the Andrews Raiders, along with more than three hundred other prisoners, were marched from the yard of Castle Thunder and taken by train to City Point for exchange. The Richmond Dispatch made note of their departure. Included in the group of exchanged prisoners, the paper reported were a number of renegades from Tennessee and Kentucky, some of whom were arrested for bridge-burning, engine-stealing, and similar crimes in the states named. The departure of these prisoners will relieve the Confederate government of a considerable item of expense. The bulk of the exchanged prisoners were taken to Annapolis, Maryland, to complete processing for their parole and release, but the raiders convinced the Federal authorities that they had been detailed on a special mission, that lives were still in danger, and that they must proceed directly to Washington to report to the War Department. The liberated Yankees arrived in Washington on Thursday, March 19th, where they were given shelter and, much to their chagrin, were initially placed under guard. William Reddick suggested that, as we looked like poor people from the country, they had only employed these guards to protect us from city sharpers. They were given ample blankets for the night and were fed generous quantities of soft bread, boiled beef, and strong hot coffee. The raider's East Tennessee companion, Peter Gunbarrel Pierce, who had taken particular offense at the presence of the guards, grumbled appreciatively, Well, if Uncle Sam does shut a fellow up, he feeds well, which is more than Jeff does. An influential friend, the Honorable J. C. Wetmore of the Ohio Military Agency, intervened to procure a small allowance of funds for the soldiers and obtain lodging with a wealthy and patriotic woman named Mrs. Fales. Restrictions on their movements were soon lifted, and they spent the next few days in leisure and comfort, eating, resting, attending church services, and walking the muddy streets of the young capital city. On one of these perambulations the raiders visited the Smithsonian Museum, where they noticed a tall, striking bearded gentlemen near the prehistoric skeletons who exchanged words with them in a kind, sad way. Pittenger insisted that the man was none other than Abraham Lincoln. Buffum and the others disagreed. We'll go and see him at the White House soon, Pittenger replied, and then you can judge. In the meantime, the raiders still had some official business to take care of during their visit to the Capitol. Upon hearing of their arrival in Washington, Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton directed the Judge Advocate General of the Army, Joseph M. Holt, to investigate this curious matter of the failed railroad raid in Georgia and prepare a comprehensive report. After a fairly informal initial meeting with Judge Holt, Bensinger, Buffum, Parrott, Pittenger, and Reddick returned the next day and found a justice of the peace there to swear them in, and a phonographer prepared to take down their testimony— Mason, perhaps suffering a recurrence of whatever ailment had struck him back in October, 
had fallen ill and was unable to give a deposition, thus leaving no first-hand account whatsoever of his participation in and impressions of the raid. After being sworn, each man gave a deposition summarizing the raid, though, unfortunately for historians seeking different points of view, Pittenger went first and the others merely confirmed much of what he had said, adding only a few brief anecdotes of their own. The exception was Jacob Parrott, who described in detail his lashing at the hands of his Confederate captors. Judge Holt was well impressed by the six soldiers and their story, and his report reflected both his admiration and his conclusion that the failure of the mission had been unavoidable. The expedition thus failed from causes which reflected neither upon the genius by which it was planned, nor upon the intrepidity and discretion of those who had engaged in conducting it, he concluded, but for the accident of meeting the extra trains which could not have been anticipated, the movement would have been a complete success, and the whole aspect of the war in the South and Southwest would have been at once changed. Holt also praised Jacob Parrott for his firm refusal to betray his country or his comrades despite the horrible flogging he endured. His subdued and modest manner, while narrating the part he had borne in the expedition, showed him to be wholly unconscious of having done anything more than perform his simple duty as a soldier. Such Spartan fortitude, and such fidelity to the trusts of friendship and to the inspirations of patriotism, deserve an enduring record in the archives of the government, and will find it, I am sure, in the hearts of a loyal people. Parrott's bravery was also noted in an unofficial visit to the Union League Club, where four of the raiders appeared at a meeting of the pro-Republican organization on the evening, March 23rd. A reporter present at the occasion pronounced the raiders' description of their adventure very interesting, though he misstated the end, the means, the route, and even the direction of the raid, an effort to run a train down the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad into Georgia, he incorrectly wrote, becoming one of the first of many to misreport the circumstances of the Andrews raid. Yet here, too, the young private was singled out for a special word of admiration. One of them, Parrot, bears on his back the scars of one hundred lashes, inflected by these scions of chivalry, and his denunciations of those in the North who are apologists and friends of a system and a cause which has such a savage and brutal spirit as he saw in Secessia were truly forcible and eloquent, the reporter wrote. Two days later, Having completed their testimony before the judge advocate, and with Mason now on the mend, the six raiders reported to the War Department for an audience with the Secretary of War. The headquarters of the War Department stood at the corner of 17th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue, just west of the White House. A department clerk described the grim, unimpressive edifice as a dingy, old-fashioned brick building with dimensions and interior finish reflecting the severe and economical tastes of federal officials half a century or more ago. Originally built as a two-story structure, a third floor had been hastily added in the early days of the war, its flues and chimneys so poorly constructed that incessant care was necessary to prevent the department from being burned out. From the halls of this rickety building, described by the same clerk as a hive of industry day and night, the War Department directed the operations of the Union armies and navies. In a rear corner of the second story, its windows facing the executive mansion next door, was the office of the Secretary of War. Abraham Lincoln sometimes referred to his Secretary of War, Edwin McMaster Stanton, as Old Mars, and if his powers were something less than godlike, he was without question the second most powerful man in the Union. Stanton had served on Lincoln's cabinet for more than a year now, having succeeded the ineffectual and corrupt, or at least corruptible, Simon Cameron in January 1862. Like most of the Andrews raiders, Stanton was a native Ohioan, hailing from the same hometown as William Pittenger and Perry Shadrach, the Ohio Valley hamlet of Steubenville. Balding and nearsighted, with tiny oval spectacles and a broad black beard riven by a streak of silver gray, Stanton was soft and thick in form, but hard-edged and hard-driving in philosophy and in presentation. A reporter meeting with him shortly after his appointment had been impressed with his energy, noting that force, undaunted force, Stanton's indisputable characteristic, streamed from the eye, hair, whiskers, and very garments of the new Secretary of War. 
This native fierceness was the product of his successful pre-war career as a prosecutor and corporate lawyer, or perhaps it was the successful career that had resulted from the ferocity. Described by the Atlantic Monthly as a man of intense patriotism, sleepless vigilance, and tireless activity, Stanton's seriousness and drive often manifested itself as rudeness, disdain, or even anger to whatever unfortunate subordinate, colleague, or visitor might find himself in the secretary's field of fire. Notwithstanding his tendency to render harsh judgments and his unwillingness to suffer fools, Stanton nonetheless was accessible not only to the army and its commanders but to the public, devoting at least an hour each morning to general business, come what may, in an effort to keep his later hours free from interruption. A great mass of visitors regularly took advantage of this opportunity to speak directly with Stanton each day, all of whom he disposed of quickly and decisively, and sometimes harshly. Contractors, claimants, sick, wounded, cranks, chaplains, crooks, kickers, spies, politicians, constitution savers, office seekers, Cyprians after passes, sorrowing widows, broken-hearted fathers, convicts, deserters, dismissed or suspended officers, everybody came cocked and primed for a bout with the secretary and got it, an early biographer wrote. Charles F. Benjamin, a War Department subordinate who witnessed a number of these public audiences, described the secretary at work. The glittering of the eyes through the polished glasses, the breadth and quivering of the nostrils, the projecting, compressed lips, the icy, deliberate voice, the slow movement of the body, and the steady, seemingly defiant gaze gave to the secretary an air of reserve and haughtiness which made the first approach to him embarrassing. Benjamin wrote, Nothing was more common or more amusing than to see some pompous or arrogant personage ushered into his presence, only to emerge from the room in a state of collapse, crushed by the manner rather than by the words of the lion at bay within. The Andrews Raiders could certainly expect a more kindly reception from the secretary than many of the others who would call on him at the war office on that early spring day. This was because of their status as heroes, of course, but also because of the boldness and initiative they had displayed. Above all, Secretary Stanton valued action. He had spent much of his time over the past fifteen months dealing with a stagnant army led by recalcitrant generals who seemed far more adept at making excuses than making war. With the background of this experience, he was certainly predisposed to admire and applaud daring efforts like the one undertaken by the Andrews Raiders the previous April. Indeed, his appreciation of their exploit may well have been magnified by looking back at his own struggles at the time. In the spring of 1862, he had spent months arguing with and prodding the then-General-in-Chief George McClellan to move his army forward against the main Confederate army near Richmond. At the time, he had famously said of McClellan and his idle force of 100,000 men, "'This army has got to fight or run away.' and while we are striving nobly in the West, the champagne and oysters on the Potomac must be stopped. Meanwhile, in pleasant contrast, he had watched with approval as Ormsby Mitchell drove his men southward toward and into Alabama. Now here to see him were six soldiers from Mitchell's own 3rd Division, all of whom had not only strived nobly, but had volunteered for a dauntless behind-enemy-lines strike at the heart of the Confederate war machine, and had heroically endured great hardships since that time. The six raiders were ushered through an anteroom and passed a number of other waiting callers, including two Union major generals, and into Stanton's office. A sun-soaked room with tall windows and a large high table, heaped with books, maps, letters, and other papers. Stanton rose and skirted the table to greet them, shaking the hand of each man and asking them to sit. His guests would see no sign that day of the rudeness or irascibility he was famous for. Instead, the six soldiers enjoyed a very delightful interview. We talked for a considerable time, Pittenger remembered, not so much on the subject of our expedition, for I took it for granted that, lawyer-like, he had looked over the evidence in the case and made up his mind about it, as upon general topics, such as our impressions of the South and the Union men in it, and of our hope and feeling about the war. Stanton told his visitors that he had been aware of their mission at the time, 
but had received no accurate reports as to the fate of those involved. He had assumed for some time that all involved had perished in the effort. Upon learning in October that some among the party still survived, he said, he had threatened retaliation if any more men were hanged and had since done all within his power to secure their safe exchange. You will find yourselves great heroes when you get home, Stanton told the raiders warmly, adding many kind words about the high appreciation of our services by the government. Pittenger noted that the offering of these thanks and compliments, coming from the Secretary of War of a great nation to private soldiers, was most flattering. Stanton seemed especially pleased with Jacob Parrott, by far the youngest man present. The former farm boy was comparatively reserved during the interview with the secretary, humble and, as Pittenger would put it, of very quiet and simple manners. Stanton offered him a complete education. Pittenger interpreted this to mean an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point, but Parrott, still unable to read or write, politely declined. As long as the war lasted, he said, he did not wish to go to school, but would rather go back and fight the rebels who had used him so badly. At this, Stanton broke into a broad, approving smile, a fairly infrequent occurrence for the intense cabinet secretary, and told the young private, If you want a friend at any time, be sure to apply to me. Stanton then excused himself for a moment and stepped out of the office to retrieve half a dozen of the newly minted medals of honor, it is unclear whether he had intended all along to award these decorations to the Andrews Raiders, or whether the thought only occurred to him as he sat and talked with the six men of their adventures. Returning to the office, he presented the first of the medals to Private Jacob Parrott. Congress has by a recent law ordered medals to be prepared on this model, and your party shall have the first, Stanton said. They will be the first that have been given to private soldiers in this war. The other five then received their medals, Sergeant Elihu Mason, Corporal William Pittenger, Corporal William Reddick, Private William Bensinger, and Private Robert Buffum. Stanton also gave each man a present of one hundred dollars, appropriated from the Secret Service Fund for pocket money, Pittenger said, and ordered that they be reimbursed for all expenditures and compensated for the value of any arms and property taken from them by the Confederates. With the medal ceremony, such as it was, now complete, the secretary inquired of the party about their future plans. All six expressed their desire to return as soon as possible to the ranks of the army. Stanton voiced his approval of this sentiment, but thought that, at a minimum, promotions were in order. He offered each of the raiders a commission as a lieutenant in the regular army. Grateful for the commission, the raiders nonetheless expressed their preference for a comparable appointment in the volunteer service of their home state, as none were career soldiers, and all hoped to leave the army and return to peacetime pursuits once the war was over, Stanton promised that he would request of Governor Todd of Ohio equivalent commissions in their own regiments. We left his presence profoundly convinced that republics are not always ungrateful, Pittenger wrote. Closing the interview, the secretary bid a hearty goodbye to his six visitors and sent them next door to the White House, where they had been invited to meet with the President of the United States. March 25, 1863, a Wednesday, was a busy day for Abraham Lincoln. As always, he consulted with Stanton and Halleck and anxiously awaited news from the Federal armies east and west, especially any update on the progress of the determined but painfully slow campaign by General Grant, directed toward cracking the Confederates' Mississippi River stronghold at Vicksburg. But the commander-in-chief also devoted attention to other matters, from military to political to mundane. He spent a good part of the day in correspondence, among other things responding to a request from General William S. Rosecrans that he renominate Brigadier General Robert B. Mitchell for the rank of Major General, commuting the death sentence of James S. Pleasance of Montgomery County, Maryland, who had been convicted of feeding and harboring the enemy, and forwarding a donation from a British subject to the United States Christian Commission for the Purchase of Bibles. With these and other tasks disposed of in the morning, the crowded waiting room outside his office promised a busy afternoon of conferences with and personal requests from a variety of military and civilian callers. Lincoln was no doubt looking forward to later that evening when he planned to attend a performance of Hamlet starring Edward Loomis Davenport at Grover's Theatre, a rival of nearby Ford's. 
One among his visitors that afternoon was his friend, the reporter Noah Brooks. Lincoln asked him to tarry for a while, as a party of Ohio soldiers who had lately been exchanged were coming to see him. The raiders took their leave from Secretary Stanton and walked the short distance east amid the late March blooms to the White House. There they ascended to the second floor and passed through a vestibule and waiting room where they bypassed an impatient throng of callers waiting their turn for an audience and entered the President's office. As they were ushered in, they were struck by the plain furnishings of the long rectangular room, scarcely more than a broad oak table stacked with books and papers and an unpretentious smattering of sofas and comfortable chairs. The upholstery and the drapes echoed a sweet whisper of tobacco from pipes and cigars smoked by predecessors or subordinates of the current president. A number of maps were tacked side by side along the left-hand wall, directly opposite a portrait of Andrew Jackson that frowned down upon them from over the marble fireplace. They had only an instant to take in this background as the imposing figure of Abraham Lincoln strode forward to receive them with great warmth of feeling, reported the next day's Washington Chronicle as they entered the room. William Bensinger, Robert Buffum, Elihu Mason, Jacob Parrott, William Pittenger, and William Reddick were introduced to Lincoln by their escort, Major General Ethan Allen Hitchcock, then serving as the lead commissioner for prisoner of war exchange. Their names were given to the president, and, without missing the identity of a single man, he shook hands all around with an unaffected cordiality and good fellowship difficult to describe, the reporter Brooks wrote of the meeting. He had heard their story in all its details, and as he talked with each, asking questions and making his shrewd comments on all they had to say, it was evident that for the moment this interesting interview was to him of supreme importance. This deep personal engagement with the common soldier was customary and heartfelt for President Lincoln, as Brooks also noted. Mr. Lincoln's manner toward enlisted men, with whom he occasionally met and talked, was always delightful in its bonhomie and its absolute freedom from anything like condescension, he observed. The raiders found his manner just so, as they engaged in lively and familiar conversation with the chief executive. I remember telling him that we were very glad to see him, though we had been hearing a great many things not complimentary about him for the past year, Pittenger recalled. He smiled, saying, Indeed, there are a good many people up here that say about as bad things of me. All remained standing for the brief visit, the president circulating easily from one man to the next, addressing each with warmth and courtesy, he finally came to rest with an elbow propped against the mantel, his long frame folded like a black umbrella leaning in a stand, his creased face animated as he spoke. He has a face like a Hoosier Michelangelo, Walt Whitman famously wrote of the President in a letter to a friend just a week before, so awful ugly it becomes beautiful, with its strange mouth, its deep-cut criss-cross lines, and its doughnut complexion. The poet had also spoken approvingly of Lincoln's idiomatic Western genius, careless of court dress or court decorums. It was this casual frankness and familiarity that came to the fore as the president talked with sergeants, corporals, and privates about their adventures, as well as the military situation and the political winds of the day. He asked them many questions and treated them with great cordiality, Brooks recorded, Pittenger remembered one of Lincoln's comments in particular, brought about when one among the party expressed satisfaction at the recent promise of Union advances after the setbacks of the year before. Yes, President Lincoln responded, if we could only have a little luck with the battles now, all would soon be right and the war be over. The meeting ended shortly thereafter, and Lincoln grasped the hand of each man in both his own as they departed, telling each how thankful he was that their lives had been spared. We left him exceedingly proud of the honor the greatest man in the nation or the world had conferred upon us, Pittenger wrote. The stories of these long-suffering men and the cheerful lightness with which they narrated their courageous and hazardous deeds impressed Mr. Lincoln very deeply, Brooks wrote of the meeting. Speaking of the men afterward, he said, with much feeling, that their bearing and their apparent unconsciousness of having taken their lives in their hands, with the chances of death all against them, presented an example of the apparent disregard of the tremendous issues of life and death, which was so strong a characteristic of the American soldier. 
although they certainly enjoyed and appreciated the medals and the money and the officers' commissions and the official thanks of their government, the Ohio soldiers were also given a much more welcome gift, practically speaking, a sixty-day furlough and an order for government transportation to their homes. With no further business to bind them to Washington, the six men returned to their quarters and began packing their few belongings and preparing to depart for Ohio. In the meantime, they received a welcome visitor themselves. Some weeks before, hearing word that his son may be alive and in Richmond, William Henry Harrison Reddick's father, George Washington Reddick, had boarded a train for parts east. He arrived in Washington just before the six raiders left for Ohio, and his surprise and joy in finding his boy free and safe were indescribable, though it was said that Mr. Reddick hardly recognized his own son due to the lad's pitiful physical condition. He and young Reddick traveled for a time with the others, who were finding joy of their own each day in the small freedoms of life, sleeping in a bed, ordering a restaurant meal, taking a leisurely walk down the street, making a purchase with their own money. The freshness of liberty had by no means worn off, and each change was a delight in itself, yet the hours that intervened between us and home seemed all too long, Pittenger recalled. Mr. Reddick insisted on buying for the whole party everything we could possibly eat along the way, and in the delight he took in the presence of his son we could see reflected what was in store for the rest of us. And so the Andrews Raiders boarded another train, this time on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad headed west. They had been gone for well more than a year now, their lives in peril for much of that time. They had never fought a battle of any kind, yet they could claim a daring adventure that they would remember for the rest of their lives, one that would remember them to the world long after they were gone. They had endured eleven months of incarceration and deprivation in southern jails in Chattanooga, Knoxville, Atlanta, Madison, and Richmond. They had seen eight comrades and friends marched away to be executed, and had watched and prayed as eight others pulled off a daring escape. They had pleaded with Jefferson Davis to spare their lives, and nine months later accepted the congratulations and thanks of Abraham Lincoln, and they had become the first men in American history to be awarded the Medal of Honor, which would later become the most highly respected and perhaps the most rarely awarded military decoration in the world. Now, at least for a while, they were going home. The eight escaped raiders would get their medals too, though geographic dispersion and bureaucratic snarls would delay the awards for several months. The largest batch of medals was doled out to the five members of the 21st Ohio, thanks to the efforts of their commander, Colonel J. M. Niebling. Within three weeks of the War Department medal ceremony in late March, he forwarded up the chain of command the story of the men in his command and noted the awards, promotions, and furloughs given to their comrades. Along the way, Niebling's report received the endorsements of Major Generals George S. Thomas and William S. Rosecrans before crossing Edward Davis Townsend's desk on its way to Stanton's office. The Secretary of War ordered that the five members be placed upon the same footing as the other members of their party. Accordingly, in September 1863, Wilson Brown, William Knight, John Reed Porter, Alf Wilson, and Mark Wood were awarded the Medal of Honor, along with Daniel Dorsey and Martin Hawkins of the 33rd. It appears that no one pointed out to the War Department the embarrassing fact that Hawkins and Porter had overslept and missed the morning train and the ensuing heroics that day. For some reason, or perhaps for no reason at all, one escapee, the indomitable John Wallum, was left off the list, but the oversight was remedied and his medal appropriately bestowed the following July. The War Department, which by the summer of 1863 was handing out medals of honor by the dozen, was not as generous in bestowing the award on the honored dead of the Andrews raid. In the end, only one half of the eight men who had forfeited their lives in the aftermath of the Andrews raid would be awarded the Medal of Honor. The families of Marion Ross and Samuel Robertson were presented with posthumous awards in September 1863, apparently the result of the same process that had given medals to their surviving comrades. John Scott was awarded the medal in 1866, and his father wrote a letter to Washington acknowledging receipt. 
Samuel Slavens was overlooked for nearly twenty years. In 1883, the Medal of Honor was delivered to his wife, Rachel, the recipient of his foreboding letter from Shelbyville twenty-one years before. But the names of the other four men would never be listed on the roll of Medal of Honor recipients. James Andrews and William Campbell, both being civilians, were simply not eligible for the award. George Wilson and Perry Shadrach, for whatever reason, would never receive the Medal of Honor, and in fact it appears that they were never seriously considered. Perhaps it was that no one ever requested the medal on their behalf. Indeed, poor Shadrach was treated just the opposite. Back home in Steubenville, Ohio, the fallen private's name was omitted from being inscribed on a courthouse square monument to the town's war dead. Apparently, some folks figured he did not deserve to be there, listed among the fallen blue-uniformed heroes. After all, Shadrach had been hanged as a spy. No honor in that. Chapter 16 The General Rides Again When the actors in the bloody drama of the rebellion shall all have passed away, and personal jealousies and sectional animosities have died out, then will history make an impartial award of merits to the actors in that great struggle. Much that was real and dreadful will then read like fiction and romance, as if it had occurred in the days of miracles and wonders. Introduction, The Adventures of Alf Wilson, 1880 The tide of the war began to turn in the summer of 1863, and President Lincoln finally got, as he wished, a little luck with the battles. On the 4th of July, Union forces under Major General Ulysses S. Grant captured the Mississippi River stronghold of Vicksburg, while in Pennsylvania the day before, the Army of the Potomac shattered a desperate attack by Confederate forces on the rock-strewn hills just south of a little college town called Gettysburg. Of course, the war was far from over, and over the next twenty months it would take a great deal of blood and courage and far more than a little luck to turn things for the Union, superior resources and manpower, economic strength, and the emergence of capable, relentless commanders, Ulysses S. Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, Winfield Scott Hancock, Philip Sheridan, George H. Thomas, ultimately positioned the Union for victory. Railroads continued to play a pivotal role in the war, and Federal commanders planned strategic advances in the east and west with railroad routes in mind, as raiders in blue and gray directed considerable efforts toward breaking up railroad lines, bridges, and depots. The Western and Atlantic Railroad in Georgia was targeted again by Union soldiers in the spring of 1863, this time in a raid so poorly conceived and thoroughly botched that it would make Andrews's effort seem all the more dashing and brilliant by comparison. In April, just days after the six raiders received their medals in Washington, Colonel Abel D. Strait led an Indiana regiment of 1,600 mounted infantrymen, mounted on mules, that is, as there were too few horses available, with orders to break up the W&A and destroy the foundries and mills on the banks of the Coosa River at Rome. The unlucky Strait's plodding, braying column drew the attention of Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, already famous as the Wizard of the Saddle, whose cavalry fretted the sluggish Federals in a series of running battles across North Alabama, from Day's Gap to Bluntsville to Gadsden to Turkeytown to Galesville. For the slow-moving bluecoats, it was the military equivalent of being repeatedly struck by lightning. Surrounding the frazzled Union riders just west of Rome, the heavily outnumbered forest met with Strait under a flag of truce and convinced the northern commander that his mule-mounted cavaliers were hopelessly overmatched. The down-home Georgia columnist Bill Arp described Forrest's bluff as a high-stakes game of poker played under a cedar tree. The Yankees had a Strait, which would have took Forrest and raked down the pile, but he looked on right in the eye and said he would see him, and four thousand better, he wrote. The raid looked at him, and he looked at the raid, and never blinked. On May 3, 1863, Strait surrendered his 1,466 remaining men, along with their mules, arms, and equipment, to Forrest's 400 troopers. The citizens of Rome happily delivered from the Yankee hordes 
expressed their gratitude by throwing a festive Saturday afternoon picnic for the Confederate cavalrymen, though the Romans magnanimously fed the prisoners as well, then begun the ovation of fair women and brave men to General Forrest and his gallant boys, Arp wrote of the occasion. Bouquets and tears were all mixed up promiscuous, and big chunks of cake and gratitude were distributed generally and frequent. Strait's raid had been foiled, just as the Andrews raid had, with no harm to the railroad and no loss to the Confederates. The W and A would remain secure for another year. How some ever, Arp warned his readers, I supposed that Mr. Linkhorn will keep pegging away. The Union Army would indeed keep pegging away at North Georgia, and the third and final threat to the state road could not be avoided. In the spring of 1864, Major General William T. Sherman's 100,000-man army descended into Georgia like a great blue spider clinging to the iron thread of the w and A. Chattanooga had been occupied at last by Union troops in the fall of 1863, and a breakout victory over the Confederate Army of Tennessee at Missionary Ridge in late November opened the door for invasion. Locations made famous two years before by the Andrews Raid, Ringgold, Tunnel Hill, Dalton, Alatoona, Big Shanty, Kennesaw Mountain, would soon have their pictures in Harper's Weekly and Leslie's Illustrated, and their names in the newspapers once again as Sherman moved steadily southward through the North Georgia mountains toward Atlanta. Sherman's army marched into the railroad yard at Kingston on May 19, 1864, and set up its headquarters at a supply depot at Big Shanty just over three weeks later. On July 3rd, General Sherman briefly established his headquarters in Fletcher House, the Marietta Hotel overlooking the railroad tracks, where the majority of the Andrews Raiders had slept for a few fitful hours twenty-seven months before. Atlanta would fall in early September, and first the retreating Confederates and then Sherman's own columns ravaged the city and the railroad as they embarked on their march to the sea. Along the way, the southbound Yankees tore up heated and twisted hundreds of rails into useless iron curlicues known to the troops as Sherman's neckties. The car shed, the depots, machine shops, foundries, rolling mills, merchant mills, arsenals, laboratory, armory, etc. were all burned. An officer of the Georgia State Militia reported to Governor Joseph E. Brown, noting further that every species of machinery that was not destroyed by fire was most ingeniously broken and made worthless in its original form. The large steam boilers, the switches, the frogs, etc., nothing has escaped. On November 14th, back up the road a ways at Big Shanty, departing Union cavalrymen burned to the ground, Mr. and Mrs. Lacey's Pretty White Trackside Hotel. Sherman's Atlanta campaign and his subsequent march to the sea was, in a very real sense, the greatest railroad raid of them all, but the havoc and devastation wrought by Sherman's army, though crippling to the state of Georgia and to the Confederate cause, would in the end be a temporary setback for the resurgent city of Atlanta. Within three months of Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox, the Western and Atlantic was back in service, with the city's other radiating lines, the Georgia Railroad, the Macon and Western, the Atlanta and West Point, fully operational as well, soon to be followed by a new railroad between Atlanta and Charlotte, under construction by 1869. This renewed transportation and commerce picked up Atlanta's growth and economic fortune right where it had left off, and the 1870 census would show a population of 21,789, nearly three times the city's pre-war total. Atlanta was not only born of, but was in the end resurrected by the railroad. As for Sherman, he would in post-war years acknowledge the critical role of the W&A in his historic march through Georgia. The Atlanta campaign of 1864 would have been impossible without this road, he wrote in an 1886 letter to former W&A executive and future governor of Georgia, Joseph M. Brown, and the Western and Atlantic Railroad of Georgia should be the pride of every true American, because by reason of its existence the Union was saved. Other northern generals did not fare so well. 
fading into the footnotes of history at the same time Grant and Sherman were writing their names in bold. Don Carlos Buell, perhaps not surprisingly, dragged his feet one too many times and lost his command and his military career as a result. So recently the savior of the Union Army at Shiloh, at least in his own mind, and thereafter firmly ensconced with his blue force as far south as Alabama, Buell had been forced to fall back northward all the way to the Ohio River to respond to Confederate General Braxton Bragg's autumn counteroffensive into Kentucky. On October 8th, the two armies clashed amid the Chaplin Hills in the sanguinary but indecisive Battle of Perryville, with Buell holding the field but suffering more than 4,000 dead, wounded or missing. Bragg's Confederates then slipped away and Buell was slow to get after them, offering a litany of excuses, that the bluegrass countryside ahead was almost a desert, that there is but one road and that a bad one, and that while his adversary was moving back on his supplies, we must bring ours forward. Over the next two weeks, General-in-Chief Halleck and President Lincoln repeatedly prodded Buell to abandon his customary hesitation and pursue the retreating rebels into the Tennessee hills. The capture of East Tennessee should be the main object of your campaign, Halleck wrote, stating plainly that the president does not understand why we cannot march as the enemy marches, live as he lives, and fight as he fights, unless we admit the inferiority of our troops and of our generals. But Buell did nothing more than begin an erratic crab walk, not to the southeast after Bragg, but to the southwest, abandoning the pursuit entirely. Lincoln had had enough. On October 24th, sixteen days after Perryville, he relieved Buell from command. Buell spent most of the next year in Indianapolis, awaiting the outcome of a court of inquiry looking into whether he had been unduly dilatory and hoping to obtain another assignment. He had some prominent supporters, including U.S. Grant, who urged that Don Carlos be given another chance. General Buell was a brave, intelligent officer with as much professional pride and ambition of a commendable sort as I ever knew, Grant wrote in his memoirs. No one who knew him ever believed him capable of a dishonorable act, he continued, noting that Buell commanded the confidence and respect of all who knew him, but many who had been along with him during the recurring frustrations of the 1862 campaign would have disagreed with General Grant. No words were too harsh to apply to Buell, an Ohio war correspondent wrote the day after the general was relieved. None differed in the general opinion about him. Major generals and privates talked alike. Whichever of these opinions about him was correct, and despite Grant's plea to restore him to duty, Buell was finished. New orders never came, and on June 1, 1864, he resigned his commission and left the army for good. Buell's ambitious and flamboyant subordinate, Ormsby McKnight Mitchell, saw his fortunes turn sour as well in the months following the Andrews raid. His drive into Alabama had given him national fame and applause from Washington, and as the early summer campaign against Chattanooga stalled under Buell and Halleck, he pleaded with the War Department to be assigned to more active duty. For a time, Lincoln strongly considered him for more active duty, indeed, as Mitchell's friends Stanton and Chase urged the president to place old stars in command of the Army of the Potomac or of the expedition down the Mississippi River against Vicksburg, an assignment that would later propel U.S. Grant into military and political immortality. It would also gratify me very much to have your eminent military genius employed actively in the East, Stanton wrote to old stars in late June, but the President regards the advance on East Tennessee as only second in importance to Richmond, and that you cannot be safely withdrawn from that field, so that at present the Department cannot gratify your wishes. So Mitchell remained stuck in northern Alabama, and it was all downhill for him from there. As the summer wore on, he was increasingly plagued by scandal, including allegations of profiteering from cotton speculation and criticism for the depredations committed by soldiers in his command. In the meantime, he continued to butt heads not only with General Buell, but also with the ascendant and often conniving General Halleck, who regarded Mitchell as a loose cannon and a possible rival to his own plans for power. On July 2nd, 
no longer able to stomach Buell's refusal to support his plans for a drive in force to the east and south, Mitchell resigned his command and asked to be reassigned. He passed the next several weeks in Washington under consideration for more important work, but also under attack by newspapers and politicians for his alleged inattention and malfeasance in Alabama. In mid-September, Mitchell was reassigned to command of the Department of the South, headquartered at Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. Here, Old Stars again displayed his imagination and his thirst for action, devising within days of his arrival a thrust against the Charleston and Savannah Railroad some 25 miles west of Hilton Head at Pocatalago and Kusawachi. The expedition was foiled in dramatic fashion by a small Confederate force under General P.G.T. Beauregard, the supposed beneficiary of Andrews's fictional ammunition train, who reported dramatically to Richmond, Charleston Railroad uninjured, abolitionists left dead and wounded on the field. But General Mitchell would leave a deeper mark on South Carolina history than the memory of yet another failed attempt to sever a southern railroad artery. Following his arrival at Hilton Head, Mitchell, perhaps thinking of the thousands of cheering slaves who had lined the dirt roads in Alabama to welcome his triumphant third division back in the first glad days of April, was disgusted by the treatment and the living conditions of local black residents, many of them former slaves left behind when whites abandoned the island to the Federal Navy in 1861. The Cincinnati general ordered that a Negro village be established for their benefit in a cotton field on the former Drayton Plantation, close by the Federal encampment. The result, in distinct contrast to slave quarters or a contraband shantytown, was a source of pride and a model for future communities. The town featured orderly streets lined with single-family homes on quarter-acre lots, each built on a pier foundation with wood floors, shingled roofs, stoves or chimneys, and glass-paned windows. The residents elected their own government, the first black city councilman in America, established churches, passed laws, collected taxes, and required that all children between the ages of 6 and 15 attend school, the first compulsory education law in South Carolina. Mitchell gathered together the heads of 70 former slave families and advised them that they had the right to have not only a first name but also a family name, and suggested that they adopt the surnames of their former owners, whereby the Sea Islands were soon filled with freedmen bearing distinguished names of the landed Carolina gentry, Trenholms, Retts, Barnwells, Beauregards, and Ravenels. According to African-American historian Benjamin Quarles, some among the freed slaves preferred to go without a family name than take the name of their former master. I's had enough a old massa, one said. The following spring... The townsfolk would honor their founder by naming their little village Mitchellville, which by 1865 would be home to 1,500 self-sufficient, self-governing blacks. The town would endure for decades, but would vanish in the 1930s, its population dwindling and its land ultimately carved up in estate disputes and sold off to northern investors, though efforts are underway to preserve the barren acreage where it once stood. Mitchellville is now lost to history and to Hilton Head, most of its vacationers and residents unaware that their million-dollar homes and resort hotels surround the site of the nation's first town established for and governed by freed slaves. Although the community he founded would endure for generations, Mitchell's stay at Hilton Head, and his life, as it turned out, would come to an end in a matter of weeks. When the chaplain of a New York regiment asked what had brought him to the Carolina Low Country, General Mitchell, disconsolate over what he regarded as being relegated to a backwater of the war, answered grimly, I came to be buried. About this he turned out to be right. On September 20th, 1862, three days after the bloodbath at Antietam, Old Stars reported to Washington a small outbreak of yellow fever among his new command near Hilton Head, but there was no cause for alarm. The medical director does not anticipate at present that the disease will spread, Mitchell assured the War Department. The following week he despaired in a letter to a friend. I am doing nothing here and shall die. Yes, die is the word of inaction. 
Five weeks later, Old Stars died of yellow fever. His death was mourned throughout the North as the loss of what the New York Evening Post called one of its truest and noblest citizens, one of its ablest and most brilliant defenders. Cincinnati journalist Whitelaw Reed eulogized the astronomer general and his truncated career. Amid the stumblings of those earlier years, his was a clear and vigorous tread. While the struggling nation blindly sought for leaders, his was a brilliant promise. But he never fought a battle, never confronted a respectable antagonist, and never commanded a considerable army. Yet what he did had so won the confidence of his troops and the admiration of the country that his death was deplored as a public calamity, and he was mourned as a great general. Mitchell's body was carried north for burial, but not before a reunion of sorts by remarkable coincidence with two of the volunteers he had sent behind enemy lines. Alf Wilson and Mark Wood, taken by the Somerset from Apalachicola Bay to Key West in early November, soon made their way up the coast to Port Royal and then Hilton Head, South Carolina. There they boarded another steamer, the 208-foot transport Star of the South, departing for New York. The two soldiers were shocked and saddened to learn that a coffin containing the body of their former commander, General Mitchell, had been taken aboard for the trip northward to his final resting place, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. I believe he died in the thought that our lives had all been sacrificed, Wilson later wrote, and if he did die, so believing, it was a cause of pain and sorrow to him, for his was a noble, humane, and sensitive nature, a soul of honor. Remarkably, every one of the Ohio volunteers who survived the ill-fated Andrews raid also survived the Civil War. All would return to the Union ranks, at least for a time, and most would see combat before the war's end. Their regiments, the 2nd, 21st, and 33rd Ohio Infantry, reorganized in the course of their long absence and folded into the newly formed Army of the Cumberland in the wake of Buell's departure, would participate in some of the hardest fighting of the Western theater. More than half of the surviving raiders were engaged in the federal defeat at Chickamauga in September 1863, where their new commander, Major General William S. Rosecrans, believed he was pursuing the fleeing rebels, but instead found his army the victim of a mugging on a creek bank in northwest Georgia. Timely reinforcements and stalwart leadership by Major General George H. Thomas thereafter known as the Rock of Chickamauga, saved the Blue Army from disaster, but not from defeat and retreat, and not before it suffered galling casualties and an unusually high number of soldiers captured, nearly 5,000, as entire regiments were cut off or left behind in the frantic withdrawal. Foremost among these units was the valiant 21st Ohio, which ran out of ammunition and saw 116 men captured, including... Wilson Brown, Elihu Mason, John Porter, and Mark Wood. John Wallum of the 33rd Ohio was rounded up in the course of the route as well. Brown, who gave a false name for fear he would be tried on the old spying charge, and Wood, both wounded in the battle, were released in an exchange of the injured a few days later. Their comrades, however, would not be so fortunate. Elihu Mason, who had been shot in the hip as the 21st made its courageous stand, would hobble through another fourteen painful months of imprisonment before being exchanged in December 1864. Porter and Wallum, too, seemed destined for another long stay behind bars, but the two would instead prove their talent as escape artists once again. Wallum was identified as one of the Andrews Raiders and returned to prison in Atlanta, where he was forced to wear a ball and chain throughout the ensuing winter. His stoic endurance of the trying circumstances drew the admiration of his fellow inmates. Comrade Wallum was a man of few words, but a braver or more patriotic soldier never enlisted in the cause of humanity and country, a prisoner of war from the 3rd Ohio Cavalry later wrote. In late February, Wallum managed to work his way out of his irons and again escaped from Atlanta. He rejoined his regiment in Chattanooga in April and in the months to come returned to Atlanta yet again, this time in the company of General Sherman. Though it would take him a little longer, Wallum's friend John Porter, still thin as a rifle barrel, would also make it back to his regiment, and he would along the way demonstrate a knack for getting out of whatever enclosure the rebels chose to put him in. 
Porter was taken east from Chickamauga and held over the winter in a prison in Danville, Virginia, where he survived a smallpox epidemic and participated in efforts to escape by tunneling. In May 1864, while en route to the notorious southern prison at Andersonville, Georgia, Porter managed to escape from a train of cars at Blackstock Station, South Carolina. Three days later, he was recaptured and imprisoned at Columbia, where he again tried tunneling out. At the end of June, he and a number of other prisoners were again entrained for Andersonville. Shortly after passing through Augusta, Porter and his companions cut their way out by sawing a board in the bottom of the locked boxcar using a table knife they had filed down to make a saw. Porter headed west, making for the advancing Yankee army in North Georgia. After twenty-six days on the run, he struck the Western and Atlantic Railroad near Big Shanty, where he jumped aboard a southbound train for General Thomas's headquarters near Marietta. He was soon safe with his old regiment at the gates of Atlanta after a ten-month absence. Following a brief furlough, Porter again joined the 21st, just in time to take part in the March to the Sea, where he was placed in charge of a foraging party. Having survived without a scratch the Andrews raid, months of hard imprisonment, the harrowing battle at Chickamauga, and the desperate life of a fugitive, Porter finally suffered his first war wound near Bentonville, North Carolina, when he was thrown from a mule. He mustered out of the service ten days before the surrender at Appomattox. Other veterans of the Andrews raid would travel their own separate military roads, missing Chickamauga and the Atlanta campaign for various reasons, as they compiled service records that ran the gamut from distinguished to disgraceful. William Bensinger was promoted to captain and assigned to command of Company C of the 13th United States Colored Volunteers, where he would serve with distinction. His commanding officer recorded in his official report of action near Nashville in December 1864 that Captain Bensinger had led his company of black soldiers in battle in the most gallant manner, noting that the enlisted men of his command had exhibited great bravery as well. Ironically, Bensinger's new regiment was detailed shortly thereafter for service as railroad guards in Tennessee. While posted there, he met and married 17-year-old Sarah Harris of Charlotte, Tennessee, a pretty and headstrong girl who had held true to the Union despite the two brothers she had serving in the Confederate ranks. In marked contrast to Captain Bensinger, Robert Buffum's military career following the raid was far from commendable and his life would become increasingly unraveled after the war's end. After obtaining his commission as a second lieutenant, as directed by Secretary Stanton, Buffum returned to the ranks after his furlough, and then immediately sought a medical leave of absence. The regimental surgeon of the 21st Ohio recommended that Buffum be permitted more time to convalesce, first at home in Salem, Massachusetts, and thereafter in camp at Murfreesboro, finding that he is suffering from chronic gastritis, the result of long captivity and starvation of the rebels. After repeated extensions of this leave, Buffum disappeared for a time, reportedly in the company of another officer of doubtful character, and drew the ire of the post commander at Murfreesboro. The within named Lieutenant Buffum has not been at his post since I came here, Colonel John Coburn reported on November 21st. In a word, he has left in bad odor with all my military predecessors who are here and should be closely watched hereafter if he ever turns up. He did turn up eventually, a bad penny indeed, as company returns showed him present in January and February 1864, but in arrest awaiting charges by early March. On several occasions, said Lieutenant Buffum has been intoxicated and is now absent from his command without authority, Captain S. F. Cheney reported from Chattanooga on March 9th. He did not report with the regiment at this post, and has not been seen or heard from since its arrival here. His actions cannot longer be tolerated, being such a disgrace to the name and bearing of a soldier. Colonel James M. Niebling, the regimental commander of the 21st Ohio, agreed and recommended that Buffum be dismissed from the service for conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman. Buffum's infractions were repeated and well documented, yet his military superiors struggled with what to do with him. The recommendation that he be brought up on charges and dismissed was referred all the way up the chain of command to General Thomas, with a copy sent to John Bruff, the newly elected governor of Ohio. 
Bruff called the matter to the attention of General-in-Chief Halleck in Washington, noting pointedly that the allegations against Buffum were counterbalanced by other facts known at this department, presumably referring to the fact that Buffum was a well-regarded hero of the Secret Service, meddled and commissioned an officer who had only recently returned from a debilitating illness brought on by his long imprisonment, in the end, largely to spare his family any embarrassment or disgrace, Buffum was permitted to resign quietly, for the good of the service, his superiors noting that his resignation will rid the service of a miscreant and a bother. The army soon lost Lieutenant William Pittenger as well, on account of poor health rather than poor conduct. On August 14, 1863, just four months after receiving the Medal of Honor, and less than sixty days after returning from his furlough, and five weeks before the scrap at Chickamauga, Pittenger received a medical discharge and left the army. I was unable to endure the hardships of the campaign, he said. Two months later, in October, William Pittenger published his first book on the Andrews Raid. The rival engines of the great locomotive chase also saw active service, along with their share of violence before the war's end, and some of the iron horses involved that day would inevitably fare better than others. Though she managed to survive the destruction of the Cooper Iron Works in the spring of 1864, the little switch engine Yona was headed for a mundane existence and an inglorious end. She was modified and used as a stationary engine in the Atlanta shops for a brief period after the war. From there she went the way of most broken-down locomotives of the era, disappearing into obscurity. No photograph was ever made of the little yard engine and the eventual terminus of the scrapyard. The Texas was the beneficiary of a fortuitous transfer loaned for use on the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad in early 1863, which removed her from the path of General Sherman and saved her from suffering any serious damage in the war. Wiley Harbin's Rome Railroad engine, William R. Smith, too, was moved from North Georgia, but the result was far less fortunate. Her lease to the Muscogee Railroad running from Columbus to Macon placed her in harm's way. On Easter Sunday, April 16, 1865, one week after Lee's surrender at Appomattox and one day after the death of Abraham Lincoln, Federal cavalry raiders under General James H. Wilson captured Columbus and destroyed the city's naval works. Bridges, railroad shops, and fifteen locomotives, including the Smith. The general would nearly suffer the same fate. Despite the recklessness of her April 12, 1862 adventure, the engine came through the chase without a scratch and was within days back in service on the state road. The general would log thousands of miles on the W&A in 1863 and 1864, used primarily to move supply trains in support of the increasingly threatened rebel forces in North Georgia and Tennessee. On June 27, 1864, the general ran ammunition to the Confederate lines during the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, carrying the butternut wounded from the field down to hospitals in Atlanta later that afternoon. At the end of August 1864, with the Battle of Atlanta lost and the surrender of the city seemingly inevitable, the general and a sister engine, the Etowah, made a desperate attempt to escape the Federal vice by running south out of the city along the Macon and Western Railroad with a train of guns and ammunition. But Union forces had blocked the road south of town at a station called Rough and Ready, and the two locomotives with their trains were forced back to the yard of the Georgia Railroad near Oakland Cemetery. Confederate General John Bell Hood ordered his army to evacuate the city and to destroy military installations, public stores, and railroad stock. On the night of September 1st, the departing rebels set ablaze 81 railroad cars, many of them loaded with supplies and ordnance, and then set to work wrecking the five locomotives in the yard by the light of the flames. The general was run backward and smashed into the locomotive Missouri and her train of cars set afire. General Sherman, unable to sleep at his headquarters twenty miles away at Jonesboro, stood with a local farmer and listened to the distant rumble of the exploding ammunition trains. The next morning, September 2nd, 1864, just as George D. Wilson had defiantly predicted as he stood on the gallows, the Stars and Stripes was raised over the city of Atlanta. 
The sad state of the fallen general was recorded a few days after the fall of Atlanta by northern photographer George N. Barnard. His image showed the wrecked engine's light, bell, sand dome, and the entire cab gone, and two ragged holes in the balloon stack. Barnard described his subject as the hero of the Andrews raid, which led to the picture being incorrectly captioned as an image of the Confederate locomotive Hero, the U.S. Military Railroad Service, apparently considering the battered engine not worth fixing, returned the general to the WNA after the close of the war. In October 1865, the roads master mechanic listed the general on his report to the superintendent with the notation, Needing General Repairs. On April 9, 1865, three days shy of the third anniversary of the Andrews Raid and the fourth anniversary of Fort Sumter, General Robert E. Lee and the proud remnant of the Army of Northern Virginia surrendered near Appomattox Courthouse, and the Civil War, for all practical purposes, came to an end. The Ohio veterans, like hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors around the broken country, returned to peacetime endeavors and scattered to the four winds, though the strongest gust would blow toward a handful of counties in northwestern Ohio, where most of the men were born and where most would die. There they focused on building careers and families and new lives for themselves until, in September 1888, ten of the eleven raiders then remaining gathered for a reunion right in their respective backyards at the national encampment of the Grand Army of the Republic in Columbus, Ohio. More than a quarter century had passed since the Andrews raiders had last been together as a group in the Fulton County Jail on October 16, 1862, the night that eight had made their escape to freedom. The 1888 GAR reunion was a massive spectacle that threatened to overwhelm the city of Columbus. Seventy thousand veterans marched in the Grand Parade, and an estimated 250,000 visitors, dignitaries, and other spectators attended the festivities, including General Sherman and former President Rutherford B. Hayes. Ten out of the original two dozen men who constituted the Andrews Raiders were present for the festivities. William Bensinger, Wilson Brown, Daniel Dorsey, William Knight, Elihu Mason, Jacob Parrott, William Pittenger, William Reddick, Alf Wilson, and John Wallum. Although they had once shared a common mission, a defining adventure, and a great and noble cause, they found that they had traveled widely divergent roads thereafter. Most had simply returned home to Ohio and picked up their lives more or less where they had left off. Bill Bensinger worked for a time as a railroad employee at Lima and St. Mary's before settling down to a quiet life of farming near Deweyville. Wilson Brown and Elihu Mason were businessmen in Dowling and Pemberville, respectively. Jacob Parrott had overcome his limited education and was a successful contractor and gravel quarry operator in Kenton. Alf Wilson had opened a grocery store in Perrysburg. A few, in addition to the absent porter, had strayed from the Buckeye State. Al Dorsey, for example, had moved to Illinois and thence to Kearney, Nebraska, where he settled down for good. He farmed a while and later passed the bar, focusing his frontier practice on the booming real estate business. William Knight lived for a time in California and then in Indiana before returning to Ohio and his former occupation as an engineer, though he traded locomotives for stationary engines and ran a wood processing plant in Stryker, Ohio. Bill Reddick had moved to Iowa, where he displayed little direction or ambition. I have since the war fished a little in all kinds of labor, from farming to chopping cordwood, making railroad ties, peddling notions, book agencies and township clerk back to honest clod hopping, which latter I hope will furnish me my daily bread for the remainder of my life, he wrote to his friend Pittenger shortly before the reunion. I am a living encyclopedia to all the aches and pains that flesh is heir to, a used-up man from the treatment received in that abominable hole of swims in Chattanooga. None among the reunited raiders had to ask what Bill Pittenger had been up to. They had read about it. For one thing, it was Reverend Pittenger now. Citing a promise he had made to God in his hour of trouble, Pittenger was admitted to the ministry in March 1864. Over the next two decades, he built a successful career as a pastor in the Methodist Church in Pennsylvania, 
Ohio, and New Jersey. Always a good talker, he joined the faculty at the National School of Elocution and Oratory in Philadelphia and published a number of successful volumes on extemporaneous speaking. All the while he kept up investigatory correspondence with former friends and foes alike and turned out new and longer accounts of his adventures, spreading the gospel of the Andrews Raid. In 1887, just a few months before the reunion, Pittenger's new account of the raid was published, Daring and Suffering, it was called, and though it corrected earlier errors and in many respects shared the glory all around, it also continued to gloss over certain aspects of the story. As one historian noted, the most careful reader would still have had difficulty learning that Pittenger had appeared as a witness against eight of his fellow raiders, and Pittenger's role as a leader in plans for resistance and eventual escape had been magnified rather than increased. The book sold well, however, and was widely praised in the northern press, a romance as thrilling as any exploit in the days of chivalry, the Cleveland leader gushed, reminds us of Tolstoy, the Brooklyn Eagle wrote, while the Philadelphia Times predicted that Pittenger's book will have as lasting qualities as Uncle Tom's Cabin. Two years later, the Chillicothe leader would note that daring and suffering was in half the old soldier households in the country. Even as they renewed old friendships at the Grand Reunion, the ten Third Division veterans also no doubt reflected on those who by then had been lost. One surviving raider had apparently missed the Columbus gathering by choice. The perpetual wanderer John Porter was tumbling around the American West at the time and lacked either the means or the inclination to attend. But other absences were more solemn and more permanent. Mark Wood's jailhouse illnesses were compounded by the wounds he received in battle, first at Chickamauga and later in a mountain pass near Dalton called Buzzard's Roost. He was discharged on grounds of disability in late 1864. The Englishman returned to his adopted home of Toledo, Ohio, and died of pneumonia in July 1866, an illness some attributed to the persistent fever that struck him during his long imprisonment and his flight through the swamps of Georgia and Florida. Robert Buffum, too, was gone by then. Following his ignoble resignation, Buffum had returned to his family and seemed for a time to settle down. But he continued a losing battle with his demons, spiraling down into alcoholism and apparent mental illness. Always volatile, he turned increasingly violent. In Minerva, Ohio, he shot a man in the face who had dared to insult Abraham Lincoln, the victim miraculously survived, and in 1870 he shot and killed 52-year-old John S. Severns in the town of Newburgh, Orange County, New York. Buffum and his wife and son were house guests of the Severns, and Buffum apparently believed that Severns had abused his wife the night before. He walked up behind Severns as he sat in his parlor drinking tea and shot him in the back of the head with a double-barreled pistol. The notorious cold-blooded crime, the Newburgh murder, was a local sensation, and the ensuing trial was covered in detail in the New York Times. A great throng of spectators turned out for the proceedings. The sheriff provided extra security at the Orange County Courthouse, as folks there had talked openly of lynching the accused for what many believed had been a premeditated act. The slate of trial witnesses was a diverse cast of characters worthy of a mystery novel. The chief of police, a gunsmith and locksmith, a carpenter, a barber, two doctors, and the star witness, a servant girl named Kate Kelly, who had served poor Mr. Severns his steaming cup of tea just moments before he was shot. A physician named Dr. Lee had examined the defendant and found him sluggish and indolent, but concluded that he could not pronounce Buffum insane. His eyes indicated more of the result of debauchery than anything else, the doctor said. The Times reporter, watching the proceedings and the accused from a seat in the crowded gallery, seemed to detect something more sinister. Buffum did not speak and only nodded his head, but exhibited ill-concealed but intense emotion. His villainous expression of countenance was generally remarked, the paper said. The jury returned that same afternoon with a verdict of guilty, and the defendant was sentenced to life imprisonment. Robert Buffum would spend only six days in the state prison at Sing Sing before being consigned to an insane asylum in Auburn, New York. 
There he committed suicide, cutting his own throat on June 20, 1871. Though his tale was not as dramatic and his end far less ghastly, bad luck had continued for Martin Hawkins, the experienced engineer who had overslept and missed the April 12th adventure. Once physically agile and mechanically adept, he had suffered mightily from the ugly head wound he received at Chickamauga. Although he bravely continued in Army service through the balance of the war, he was in many ways never the same again. After the war he moved to Illinois and, when able, found work as an engineer until his death in 1886. The last two volunteers missing from the 1888 reunion had missed the raid in the first place. These were the two wayward would-be raiders, James Ovid Welford Smith and Samuel Llewellyn, who had enlisted in the Confederate Army to avoid suspicion near Jasper and did not participate in the theft of the general at all. This inconvenient fact did nothing to deter one of the two from seeking to share in the resulting honors. Seemingly untroubled by his son's lack of involvement in the operation, Smith's father had actively lobbied the War Department for his son to receive the Medal of Honor. In June 1864, Brigadier General Edward Canby, at the direction of Secretary Stanton, directed that Private Smith be placed on the same footing as the other men of his party as regards compensation and medal. Presumably, the Secretary of War received information that Smith was a member of the by now renowned party of volunteers, without realizing that the young private had not actually taken part in the raid itself. Young Smith was understandably delighted with the award and even wrote a giddy letter acknowledging receipt. E. D. Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General, Washington, D.C., Parkersburg, October 15, 1864. Sir, I was made happy yesterday by the receipt of the medal which the Secretary of War was pleased to award to me for services rendered and which I hope to wear long and honorably. I am doubly happy to have received this mark of distinguished appreciation during the administration of that gentleman, scholar, and patriot, A. Lincoln. Long may he wave. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, James Smith. Smith would wear his Medal of Honor honorably enough, but he would not do so for long. He died of pneumonia in 1868 at the age of 23. Smith's companion in early capture, Samuel Llewellyn, returned to the 33rd Ohio after his unwilling stint as a rebel artilleryman and was wounded in the chin and captured at Chickamauga in September 1863. He was paroled the following May and discharged from the service at Villeneuve, Georgia, in October. In the years to come, he would serve two terms in the Ohio General Assembly and lived a long life in Sandusky, Ohio, where he died at the Ohio Soldiers and Sailors' Home in 1915. But even though he had served honorably in the Blue Ranks and was a wounded veteran with a long and distinguished public life ahead, Sam Llewellyn did not attend any of the reunions of the Andrews Raiders, apparently because he did not consider himself to be a member of the party, and he was never awarded the Medal of Honor for the refreshingly honest and humble reason that he did not believe he deserved it. The various allies and antagonists of the Ohio Volunteers had each come to the end of their own personal lines by that time as well. Marietta Hotelier and Union spy Henry Green Cole continued his intelligence gathering and espionage as the war proceeded. In the fall of 1863, he learned that a large Confederate force under General Longstreet was moving to reinforce Bragg near Chickamauga and had the news sent to Union Major General George Thomas. The general always gave me a great deal of credit for that act, he wrote after the war, and said that what was saved at Chickamauga was saved by that means. Cole was eventually found out and arrested by Confederate authorities in the spring of 1864 charged with attempting to pass to advancing Federal forces a plan of Snake Creek Gap near Dalton. They always had suspected me, Cole said. He was held in Atlanta for several weeks before being moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where he was imprisoned on Sullivan's Island for eight months before being released. In the meantime, Cole's elegant hotel, which he took pride in as the finest house in Georgia, was used by Union commanders as a headquarters as they directed the final stages of the campaign against Atlanta. On July 31, 1866, in exchange for a nominal payment of five dollars, 
Cole transferred to the United States government twenty acres on a hill just east of the town square in Marietta to be used as a cemetery for fallen Federal and Confederate troops. Cole's idealistic attempt to effect an eternal reconciliation of sorts between North and South was rejected, as local citizens were outraged at the idea of burying Dixie's heroes side by side with Yankee invaders. Accordingly, a burial place for rebel dead was established nearby, making Marietta one of the few towns in America with both a Union and a Confederate cemetery. Cole died on April 18, 1875, and was buried in a plot set aside for his family in the National Cemetery. His large estate, which included property he owned in twelve Georgia counties, was not finally settled by the Cobb Probate Court until January 1941, sixty-six years after his death. Captain David Fry, the notorious ringleader of the East Tennessee Bridge Burners, made good his escape from Atlanta and returned to the Tennessee Hills, where he continued in active service fighting the rebels through raids, sabotage, and violent intimidation of pro-Confederate citizens. Alf Wilson, by chance, ran into Fry shortly after returning to his regiment near Nashville. He was not only surprised to find the dauntless Tennessean alive, Wilson thought that Fry had been shot down and killed during the hectic skedaddle from the Atlanta jail, but also was amazed by the transformation in his appearance. Once bareheaded, starved, ragged, and bony, after months of imprisonment, within weeks of his return to the Blue Ranks, Fry was a robust, well-fed, soldierly, noble-looking man, but in heart, courage, manliness, and nobility of character, the same man who had been our faithful comrade in prison. Fry was wounded several times in the war, and in time was promoted to colonel in recognition of his leadership and his exploits. After the war, David Fry returned to a quiet life at home in Greenville, Tennessee. On August 21, 1872, he was struck by a train and died a few days later. As a soldier, possessing great rugged qualities of mind and heart, he would have been a fit associate for Frederick the Great, Alf Wilson wrote. I know a few men for whom I entertain greater respect than Captain David Fry. Confederate Brigadier General Danville Ledbetter's success in securing East Tennessee and his proven skill and experience as an engineer led to important assignments as the war continued. He served for a time as chief engineer of the Army of Tennessee, worked on Longstreet's Siege of Knoxville, laid out Bragg's lines at Chattanooga, and eventually returned to his adopted hometown of Mobile, Alabama, to design the city and bay defenses there. He vanished for a time at the close of the war. Official biographies indicate that no record of his final capture or parole was found. He fled for a time to Mexico and thence to Canada, where he died in the town of Clifton on September 26, 1866. He was laid to rest in the Magnolia Cemetery in Mobile. Despite his eventual tenure in Chattanooga, his service as an engineer under Longstreet, Johnston, and other Confederate heroes, and his enduring legacy of antebellum work on the U.S. Coast Survey, Ledbetter Point and Ledbetter State Park in the state of Washington are named in his honor, for example. The Maine-born Confederate officer remains a little-known figure of the Civil War. The newspapers in East Tennessee reported a few weeks later the news that the villain Ledbetter had died reportedly, leaving a considerable sum of money and valuable effects. One editor no doubt expressed the views of many Tennesseans on the passing and the final judgment of their former oppressor. If Ledbetter has not received his due compensation of reward within the confines of the lost, then we infer there is no hell, and the word of God is a cunningly devised fable, he wrote. The purest blood of East Tennessee's loyal sons cries from the ground against this foul murderer who has gone to his final account. Though the raiders devoutly wished for him a miserable end, their jailer Old Swims survived the war, fleeing south in the fall of 1863 as Federal armies at last occupied the mountain city. The jail at Fifth and Lookout Streets was torn apart by Union soldiers who had heard of the suffering of their comrades there, its lumber burned in Federal campfires, and its bricks used to construct fireplaces and chimneys for the Bluecoats' tents. The old jailer returned to Chattanooga shortly thereafter. Dorsey claimed to have found him there in the spring of 1864, a feeble old man tottering on the verge of the grave. 
Swims died of smallpox three years later. His remains rest in the Citizens' Cemetery, a local reporter wrote in 1898, marked with a discolored headstone which time will soon blot beyond recognition. The reunited raiders no doubt spoke of old Swims and General Ledbetter and Captain Fry as they gathered for the reunion, and they took a careful accounting of the fates of each of their absent comrades. Yet those who later wrote of the 1888 reunion recalled little in the way of melancholy reminiscence there at Columbus. Instead, the ten veterans spent time posing for photographs, sharing proud reflections on their expedition, and engaging in warm conversation, catching up on the post-war exploits of the still living. They also welcomed two honored guests from down south, William A. Fuller, who was reportedly well-received and kindly treated, and the majestic flag-draped general, which had made the trip up to Ohio under her own steam. The Confederate government had awarded no official decoration or other honors to William Fuller or to any of the pursuing party, for that matter, first of all because they were civilians, and second because the Confederate States of America never had military medals in any event. For a time it looked as though the state of Georgia, no doubt grateful for the heroic protection of the state railroad, would bestow public honors on the pursuers. On November 6, 1862, Georgia Governor Joseph Brown, addressing the state legislature at Milledgeville, declared that the conduct of Mr. Fuller, the conductor, and some others, deserves the highest commendation, and recommended that medals or other public acknowledgment be awarded. Nothing ever came of the governor's suggestion, as the state legislature found itself swamped with wartime business and crises. Fuller's family would finally obtain a specially designed commemorative medal from the state of Georgia in 1950, thanks to the efforts of his son-in-law, Wilbur Kurtz. On February 23, 1864, Governor Brown bestowed what honor he could on his own, commissioning William A. Fuller as a captain in what he called the Independent State Railroad Guards in the Regiment of Infantry of the Volunteers for the State of Georgia. Fuller continued to work in service on the state road through and beyond the end of the war, held in high regard in Atlanta as nothing less than a war hero, widely referred and deferred to as Captain Fuller. In fact, a number of accounts of the Andrews raid would identify Fuller throughout as Captain Fuller, though he held no such rank at the time of the chase. According to the Atlanta Constitution, the former conductor, who in the late 1870s had left the railroad and entered the mercantile business, was one of the prominent citizens of Atlanta and was identified with the upbuilding of the place as much almost as any man.